गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन प्रियंका आर यू देर यस मैम यस मैम गुड मॉर्निंग मैम सो यू आर टेकिंग अप द फर्स्ट नाइन टू ट्वेल्व यस मैम यस मैम and after that dr bhavani is taking yes ma'am yes ma'am dr so bhavani and dr mikki ha uh-huh. and evening mein kon lega uh, dr asmita acha so i will initiate in the morning just start okay. off okay at dr morning madam good morning good morning madam good morning madam Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, Priyanka. Am I audible, Priyanka? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Hi, Doctor Khadija. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. Are you ready with your cases? I hope you are yes, ready ma'am. with your case. Yes, yes, ma'am. Chalo, good, 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 good. Ah, uh, Doctor Aruna, you have joined. Can you rename yourself? Because okay, the faculty mm-hmm. are there, na. Sab ko acha lagega aap aapka naam agar dikhega. Kaise karna hai? Ah, uh, IT people, please gu- guide. डॉक्टर अरुणा, आई थिंक उसमें ऑप्शन आता है शायद हाँ कुछ आता तो है भूल गई एक्चुअली बिटिया का लिया हुआ है ना एक मिनट उसी से पूछ कर दो मेरा रीनेम हाँ हो गया आपका रीनेम आई हैव चेंज द नेम मैम ओके ओके थैंक यू ग्रेट ग्रेट सो वी स्टार्ट ऑफ बाय शुड बी वेस्ट इवन वन मिनट गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन दिस इज and i hope all our students are enjoying and learning lot of a uh, lot of content and all those students who are ready for the final exam i'm sure they are benefiting from this deliberation and we are very thankful to all the faculty members who have joined from delhi as well as from the all over india and we are our students are really benefiting from their guidance from their inputs and today morning we again have a very dedicated teacher with us dr aruna nigam who is going to teach us on abnormal presentation forceps and vacuum over to you dr aruna we know you are a dedicated teacher professor and unit head hamdard institute of medical sciences and research established endoscopy unit in hamdard institute you have more than 200 publications more than site 1500 citation editor in chief pan asia journal of obs and gynae national corresponding editor and you have so many okay, ma'am. reviews <laughs> for the benefit of the pg students and i must tell all the pg students to benefit from your teaching videos that is one announcement that i would like to make because you have n number of teaching videos and these videos are really very informative and very useful for all our pg students over to you Thank you, madam. Ah, uh, can I share my screen? Yes, ma'am. Please. So what? Uh, so a very good morning to all of you and thank you dr mala and hul gangaram ji giving me this opportunity to uh, teach regarding the forceps and the vacuum uh, okay so it is very foggy right now in delhi and uh, many of you if are from delhi must be inside your uh, those kambals and blankets and in front of the heater so let me generate the heat by this lecture so that you will uh, become active and start preparing or continue preparing for your exams right so as dr mala has already told uh, about me so you can go to my website and learn there are definite uh, 
video uh, modules for exam also so instrumental delivery a very important part of your curriculum of your day to day practice but it is decreasing for last 20 or 30 years and we all are converting towards the cesarean section but we should not be doing because many of the instances are there when you have to do the instrumental delivery to save the baby as well as to decrease the morbidity among the mothers right so uh, how i am going to take this lecture so i will be discussing the latest guidelines will tell you because these are and i'll simultaneously go on telling you what questions can be asked in your exams right so latest guidelines i am going to take in the start as well as at the end and i am going to tell you regarding the forceps and the vacuum which has been allotted to you but these are not only these two instruments because now again the question can be asked or the photo can be shown to you in oski that what are the other instruments which are in pipeline so besides forceps and vacuum you should be knowing regarding the odon device so we um, only few of us have seen because it is a who trial which has gone and still is not for the general practice the so odon device can come as a picture and you can be asked that what is odon device right now and in the vacuum we are going to tell only regarding the cellastic and the metal cup but there is a omni cup kiwi cup available for with all of us so that question can also be asked in your exams so let me take it to you just to introduce the uh, topic which i had already told to you that the operative vaginal deliveries have decreased significantly united states in because we don't have any incidence from the india so in us incidence decreased from 9% to 3.3% and you know cesarean section rate has increased to 14% for the second stage and the operative vaginal delivery rates in lmic decreased from 1.6 to 0.3% while cesarean delivery increased from 6.4 to 14.4% see uh, i have just read the article from a kashmir paper just which has been sent to me and it has been shown that even again a government hospital the cesarean section rate is 60 to 70% and in a private it is 90 to 95% that means only those patients are delivering who where the baby is coming out just otherwise every patient is being section there so this should not be scenario in our setup right so another question which can be asked what is the who recommended rate of cesarean section this is very important point how you should be classifying the cesarean deliveries another question which you should be knowing you should be knowing the practical implications of the robson criteria okay so in between i am just telling you the question so these are the two guidelines which i have uh, followed in this lecture and i am going to tell you what practical also we are following so uh, this is a rcog guidelines came in april 2020 and then these are the guidelines the acog guidelines which have replaced the november 2015 guideline and this have also come in 2020 so the important change in the acog the is that they said you should not be terming this as a delivery it should be termed as a birth right so it should not be operative vaginal delivery it should be operative vaginal birth let me take the highlighter just a minute yeah so it should be termed as operative vaginal birth now coming to uh, classification of now assisted vaginal birth because you are using some instrument so it becomes a assisted vaginal birth as you see in the breech delivery if you assist if you touch the baby before the uh, head delivery you are going to call it as a assisted breech delivery so as same you are using the some instrument for the delivery of the head so it becomes a assisted vaginal birth now this has been classified as a mid 
yeah as a mid low and outlet what practically we are following we are using only low and outlet and in most of the setting it is the outlet bit which is used in outlet we are applying the forceps and in the low we can apply a vacuum but this is the classification which is following maybe in south or uh, in the uh, kolkata side few people might be using mid i don't know but mid is generally not in use so if uh, something being asked to you it will be mainly related with the outlet and the low forceps now important point in the classification is there are two things which you need to remember whenever we are doing a classification so number one thing is you have to see the sagittal suture right and other thing is you have to see the position of the vertex this tells you the rotation and this tells you regarding the descent okay so how we are going to divide this okay so how we are going to divide this when you call it at outlet forceps outlet forceps is when the head is visible without separating the labia and it has reached the perineum so you can easily see you are just assisting to take out but maybe because of maternal exhaustion or something and rotation is not exceeding the 45 degree that means how you are assessing the rotation either by the palpation of the posterior fontanelle or the sagittal suture so sagittal suture are less than 45 degree deviated now the low forceps again the fetal station skull is at the station plus 2 but not on the perineum so it is not visible without separating the labia maybe few hairs you can see and it has been divided into two rotation more than 45 degree rotation less than 45 degree this point is very important fetal head is no more than one fifth palpable per abdomen but remember that whenever you are applying a low forceps or outlet forceps the fetal head should not be palpable remember this is a very important point that fetal head should not be palpable if you are applying a low or the outlet forceps now the other question which can be asked to you how you assess the head palpation on the abdomen that means you have to tell regarding the christian method regarding the finger fifth method you have to and the notolovis method that is very important to tell how you are assessing the descent of head per abdominally how you are charting the descent of head in your partogram or your lcg okay so now <clears throat> the third thing which has come the third classification is that it is a mid cavity application and here the leading point of the skull is at 0 to plus 1 cm and again there are two subdivision non rotational and rotational a very important thing so i hope it is clear this is the position of the vertex and the sagittal suture uh, position which will tell you what type of forceps or a vacuum application you are going to do so this is common whether you are going for a uh, vacuum or a forceps application and in general practice we are doing only outlet and low forceps coming to the indication of the assisted vaginal birth so whenever indications are being asked to you you have to tell that there are a maternal indication and a fetal indication right so fetal indication it comes cardito abnormal ctg in second stage so you need to identify how you have to identify the abnormal or a pathological ctg it is not only the absence of the acceleration or you are showing the absence of the acceleration in the second stage of labor so remember that what you call as a pathological ctg in the second stage is a very important component abnormal fetal blood sampling although nowadays uh, as per guidelines we are not using it is not recommended to do fetal blood sampling and thick meconium these are the few indications of the fetal indications now coming to the maternal indications always remember whenever we want to cut short the second stage of labor so when you want to cut short the second stage of labor that means 
where you want to avoid the valsalva manure and these indications are being asked to you so it is cardiac disease uh, severe anemia vih so these are the places where the heart is already on the stress so you want to cut short the second stage of labor now there can be a maternal exhaustion or distress right or there is a delay in the progress of second stage of labor so now it will be asked that what when will you call the delay in the second stage of labor so then you have to see whether this patient is nulliparous or it is a paris woman and whether the epidural anesthesia has been given or not given because whatever criteria is there you have to add plus 1 hours if this is a epidural anesthesia okay so nulliparous woman if delay in progress of labor without epidural analgesia is 3 hours you remember that here it is like uh, written 3 uh, and 2 hours but these guidelines have come in april 2020 and in the same year the who lcg has come okay so the recommendation has changed the duration has changed but still we don't take 4 hours so long um, period for a second stage uh, for all practical purposes but this criteria as per lcg again you have to add 1 hour okay so in nali paris not in an uh, regional analgesia it is 3 hours and if it is uh, uh, epidural anesthesia it is 4 hours now for porous women it is 3 hours and if it is on epidural 2 uh, hours and if it is an epidural it is it will be 3 hours so you need to know what should be the duration of the second stage of labor and you need to know uh, how you divide the second stage of labor that is again very important coming to the safe criteria for assisted vaginal birth very important so whenever you are doing this you have to divide it into three parts number one you have to do the examination you have to prepare your mother and you need to have a preparation of the staff right so i told you in every guideline it is taken like head less than 1/5 palpable but in exam when you are telling you need to tell not palpable because we are not applying a mid cavity forceps this is a very important point which will be asked to you in the exams now cervix should be uh, fully dilated station below the ischial spine that means the type of application which you are doing and caput and molding how much so caput molding should not be more than plus 2 remember then if you are even seeing the um, head without separating the labia the head can be seen it could be only the caput that is why before application of the instrument you need to palpate the head per abdominally this is a dictum remember that practically also and for the exams also this is a very favorite question of all the examiners and that is the way you are going to uh, uh, um, going to define the obstructed labor in these conditions like and pelvis should be adequate i am going to come prerequisite after some time so now the preparation of the mother very important uh, informed consent in these patients you see the concept of respectful maternity care has come there should be a shared decision proper analgesia should be there maternal bladder has to be at when uh, has been emptied and if patient has been catheterized maybe she is a patient of abh so always remember catheter has to be removed and all aseptic precaution to be taken preparation you should be having a good assisting as a staff adequate facilities this is very important backup plan should be there ot should be ready the pediatrician should be there and you should be anticipating all complications when you think that the your instrument can be failed so it could be maternal bmi whenever the patient is very obese short maternal stature baby weight more than 4 kg head circumference more than 95th centile and mid pelvic application which we are not doing these days 
coming to the forceps. A very important instrument being kept and you are being asked right, left blade, how will apply. So let's take up the forceps first. So this are the routine forceps which we are using is generally Wrigley forceps, Das forceps or a Simpson forceps if there is somewhat high application. <laughs> The parts of the forceps, very important. So whenever we are talking of any forceps, remember that this is a handle, this is a shank, and this is a plate. Okay. So now this blade has not three parts. It has a toe, it has a shaft, um, uh, this uh, blades, and this has a heel where it is joined to the shank. Right now, shank. This is why this is important because the shank is the only part which is being elongated whenever you want to increase the length of your forceps. Neither handle is being increased in size, neither the blade are being increased in size. This is a shank which is size is being increased. Okay, now there is a lock in between the shank and the handle for a proper application, and there are different types of locks which I'll tell you later on, handle and there is a thumb guard where you keep your thumb while holding the forceps, okay? Now the length is still very important. The distance after locking, the distance between the tip of the toe is 2.5 centimeter and distance between these two blades is 9.5 centimeter. The length of hole, this is 37.5 centimeter and this is allowed only blade is around 16 to 17 centimeter okay now coming to a very important point there which is being asked there are three curves in this forceps catholic curve you have heard pelvic curve you have heard which i have labeled so this is a this you can see this is a pelvic curve and this gap towards the concavity and the convexity inside the blade is a catholic curve and you need to know what scientists if you can go to my this lectures complete details who has invented why it is, has been given has been given in those lectures on mechanism of labor now i told you regarding the catholic curve regarding the pelvic curve. Now, another curve is there, which you can see in this forceps is a perennial curve. And which forceps is having a perennial curve? Anyone? Which forceps uh, is there in the, that is in the Piper's forceps, because whenever it is a bleach application, it is slight curve, which you need at the level of the perineum. So this is a Piper's forceps, which is having a perennial curve. Okay, so I'm not going into the details of the excess direction device. Please go through because we are not actually um, doing a mid cavity forceps. So I told you, not just in my previous slide, regarding the lock, very important. So you can have any lock, maybe you are having an exam in the Kolkata, Odisha, or Bombay. So you should be knowing about these locks. So there are three, four types of lock which are there in the various forceps. One is a sliding lock, which you can see, which can be shifted anywhere up and down over the forceps shank, right? Then there is a English lock, which is usually in our uh, forceps. And then there is a nut screw type of lock, which is called as French lock, right? And there is a mixed lock, which is a German lock. Right, so four types of lock is there and once you apply the forceps, lock should be in place. That is one of the indications of the application, right application of the forceps. Now, the identification. Acha, somebody has asked me, please repeat the capet point. Okay, Piper is right answer, beta. So, uh, pipe, uh, capet point, that means if you are going to apply the forceps or a vacuum, you are able to see that thing. It is a caput. See, you can apply as per these indications, you can apply in plus two, okay? Bar, plus two caput, plus two molding, you can apply. But 
remember in your practical practice if it is a caput you need to palpate the head or abdominally it should not be palpable for a low and the outlet forceps this is the point which i want to tell you right so now coming to the right and the left blade of the forceps this is a very common question being asked to you which is the right blade and which is the left blade okay so the blade which you are holding in your left hand and which you are going to the maternal left side is a left blade okay the blade which you are holding in your right hand going to the right side is a right blade ab aap galat pakad lo to baat alag hai but if you keep the forceps blade on the table it should be stable like here you can see it is stable so this in this picture which is the right blade which is the left blade so once the right and the left blade is separated i am going to hold this in my left hand this will go to maternal left side so this is a left blade this one i'm going to hold in my right hand it will go to maternal right side so it will be a right blade so that for that matter you have to keep over the table in front of you always remember whenever you are going for a application you have to do a phantom application this is just a small video showing what you do in general and how you have to keep your uh, blade so you see the forceps will the cuff should be inside it should be stable it you cannot keep it like this and don't do these things everybody will understand that you don't know anything ठीक सो यू हैव टू गिव सो यू सी आई एम होल्डिंग इट ऑन माय लेफ्ट हैंड इट विल गो ऑन द लेफ्ट साइड सो दिस इज अ हैंडल सो दैट्स व्हाट आई एम टेलिंग व्हाइल टीचिंग नाउ दिस इज द राइट ब्लेड इट विल गो लाइक दिस एंड देन यू डू अ लॉकिंग सो दिस इज अ सिम्पसन्स फ्रॉम फॉरसेप्स हैविंग अ नट एंड स्क्रू टाइप ऑफ लॉक ओके so now what are the indications we have already dealt with it so i am not going into the detail of it now the prerequisite a very favorite formula for everyone you must be re reading it since your final years so forceps is a common formula for seeing the all the prerequisites of the forceps so there should be a full dilatation no obstruction should be there that is why i told you head should be palpable not should not be palpable ruptured membrane head should be rotated less than 45 degree contraction should be present no cpd caput molding no more than 2 i will advise you practically you write down in your answer or tell this thing but generally whenever the caput is plus 2 even then you don't apply empty bladder engaged head so head will be engaged if it is visible by the way can you write down in your chat box when the head is engaged how much head is palpable okay a question for you now pelvis is adequate station of head plus 2 or perineum and your obstetrician should be skilled so this is the mnemonic of forceps for the prerequisites right so now once you have seen all prerequisite you did the phantom application to see that your blades are right now what you have to do okay so you have palpated you have seen your sagittal suture you have seen the uh, uh, fontanel now you are going to apply so lubricate this plate with a good amount of xylocan jelly or sopramycin whatever it is with you and then you hold this forceps in a pen holding manner so that the toe is facing towards the floor and it is parallel to inguinal ligament and then you insert now you can have a posterior sacral application and while you are going inside you can turn it round or you can have a lateral application there is no problem so you keep your finger guarding the lateral pelvic wall as you can see here and then once this blade goes inside what you have to do what this thumb is doing my favorite question in many of my examiner was very shin this thumb is uh, to over the shanks right 
the junction of the that is at the heel and this thumb is now pushing so that not excessive force is being given from the other inserting hand so this thumb is just pressing over the heel and the shanks to push this blade inside right and now once it is inside you ask your assistant to hold this ask your assistant uh, let it Yeah. Now you ask your assistant to hold this, right? Then what you do? Then again, in a similar manner, the right blade is inserted. With now, you cannot insert your forefinger inside the vaginal vagina regarding the lateral wall. So you have to put two fingers. Your toe is directed towards the floor, and then you insert the blade inside. And this thumb again is pushing from the heels the blade inside and once it is properly placed you have to lock if the blades are not being locked that means that your forceps application is not proper so there are few points which have been be asked to you what are the right application so the distance from the sagittal sutures should be proper there should be uh, this fenestration will lie over the ear. This blade should be perpendicular parallel. So you can see. And then what you do? Once it is a proper application, you put your two fingers, as you can see here, in between the blades and just pull it. Now what should be the direction of the pill? Once you are pulling, your assistant is giving a perineal pressure. If you have not given the episiotomy yet, now you can give the episiotomy, right? So once you have pull should be coinciding with the contraction of the uterus, right? And then the pull should be because you are applying a, a low or a outlet for zip. So once it is downwards, then upwards and forward this should be the direction of the pull of your forceps okay so curve of caress the uh, pelvic axis can be asked at this point of time once the face is visible now you have to remove the blades and contemplate the delivery in a similar manner once you have delivered the baby given it to pediatrician always remember that you have to check the cervix you have to check the um, uh, this vaginal walls you have to check the tone of the anal sphincter these are the three very important points which you need to check after you finish your delivery of the placenta so now what are the features of the accurate application of the uh, this uh, forceps sagittal shooter should be perpendicular should be equidistance posterior fontanel Posterior fontanel should be midway between the blades. Small part of fenestration may be felt on both sides. Blade should be locked properly parallel to the plane of pelvic floor. And generally, fenestration should be over the ears. Now, the, what the complications you can anticipate? Perineal lesion, cervical vaginal tears, traumatic PPH, urinary incontinence, sphincter dysfunction, purpural endometritis, Injury to face of the baby, facial nerve palsy, cranial hemorrhage, capal hematoma. Remember that forceps is more injurious to mother and the uh, vacuum is more for a baby. Although if uh, it is a uh, adequate application, it will be very safe. So now there are a few points which I need to re-emphasize. Is it sh still sharing? Yeah. Okay. So, cons antibiotic. I'll come to it later on. So, consent should be there. Antibiotic, prophylactic, antibiotic should be given as per a new trial. It's not coming. Ensure prerequisite. PAPV examination should be done. Left plate should be inserted first. And what is the condition when you insert a right plate first? 
remember this question. Pull should be with contraction in the direction of the pelvic curve, downwards, backwards, and upwards and forwards, good perineal support. Abandon if does not, head does not become with the three pulls. If you see there is no descent after two pulls, you abandon at that point of time. So if minimal or no descent with three, abandon the procedure. Keep pediatrician ready, give a mediolateral episiotomy, which anal cervical examination is must. So these are the very few important points and few of the important points I'm going to cover at the end of the, my lecture after finishing the vacuum part. So I hope this is clear to all of you. So uh, when ideally uh, we should be giving the episiotomy, so you can give a episiotomy. Uh, any time there is uh, no problem before or after it is said if uh, it is an outlet forceps outlet forceps you give before but if it is a low forceps you give after because if with so many a times if you give episiotomy and then insert blade blade goes inside the uh, layer of the episiotomy and there is a long vaginal laceration so you need to get that this is a question i have given ma'am when right blade is applied but so i will not tell you right now okay so okay according to which trial antibiotic given i'll tell you later on put apna dimag lagao in what condition right blade applied first you will tell i'll tell you at the end or you message me uh, ma'am any related trials or studies we should know when right okay so these are the questions which i had asked okay sam okay so now coming the you should be using your brains while yeah, this lecture okay one hour only so now coming to the vacuum a very important device all of you have seen so it is an effective safe design is for assisted vaginal delivery and an important addition to the modern obstetrical armamentarium okay so now this has the everybody you of you must have seen this uh, cups. So this is a cialistic cup. This is a metal. This is a cialistic cup. This is a metallic cup. This is again a cialistic cup, and this is a vacuum generating machine which is there. So uh, it is very important to see from which point the um, vacuum is being generated, and this is a, a bird's cup. Right, so it was initially the Malmstrom cup, and then Bob was his junior obstetrician, who when became senior, senior gave the few changes that the suction point uh, deviated from the uh, central traction point. A very good story for whole forceps and vacuum story is such an interesting story. You should be knowing this. And then how the invention occurred of forceps and the vacuum. But this should be known by all of you. So you can see this uh, bulb shape, bell shaped curve, and here the suction pull is uh, suction uh, pipe is attached here. The suction pipe is attached here, and why it is better? Well, number one the traction point of is different from the suction point that is why the filler rate of metallic cup are less than the cialistic cup you can see the suction and the traction are given at the same side of force so the pull is at the level of the suction but here this pipe is separate so it is better had an advantage that the pull is not given at the suction pipe and how much uh, is to be generated here it is a slow generation of the suction and approximately 600 to 800 uh, millimeter of suction pressure is maintained uh, regarding the cup size largest cup size is selected because the larger the cup greater the adhesion better will be the pull and more the force can be applied and there will be less failure rates so Prerequisites are always the same. The informed consent, ruptured membranes, empty bladder. Now, this is a point which you say dilatation more than six centimeters. No, please, no. It is always a fully dilated cervix where we are going to apply the vacuum. Another important point, engage fetal head. We are going to, I asked you the question. How much head will be palpable when the head is engaged? That is one question. Now, engage fetal head. If the head is visible at the level, 
of the perineum or at plus two station, it is already engaged. So I don't know why they have put this point as uh, one of the prerequisites. No cephalic pelvic disproportion should be there and uterine contraction should be present. Now, indication similar, prolonged second stage, shortening of second stage, alternative to forceps operation. Now, successive should be applied. I'm going to take it later on. Delay in the descent of head in case of second to it, and it's alternative to rotational forceps as in OTA or OP position, but uh, generally we are not using in this condition. Contraindication, very important. Any presentation other than vertex, Preterm fetuses absolutely contraindicated in less than 32 weeks. 32 to 36 weeks, you have to be careful while using this. Suspected coagulation disorder, ketopelvic disproportion, uncertainty regarding the fetal uh, position and station, prior field forceps, okay, overlapping cranial bone, heavy caput, and one contraindication is written, peak, uh, fetal scalp cell, um, sampling, which has been removed nowadays with the latest guideline no it is not a contraindication but as such fetal scalp uh, sampling is not advised nowadays in any of the conditions right so always confirm the fetal position station accuracy of the fetal cup application now, now these are the three important points which i'm going to cover so where you should be applying the fetal head uh, this vacuum where you should be applying. So flexion point, all of you must be knowing this flexion point. So always you have to see the posterior fontanelle and you have to apply the center of the cup three centimeter anterior to your posterior fontanelle. So remember then whenever the caput is more than plus two, you are not able going to feel these fontanelles. And these are the things which tell you where to apply okay so that is the point that is why these prerequisites have come so posterior fontanel you palpate you put your two fingers one finger is 1.5 centimeter and beyond that there should be a central point or four fingers six centimeter from the anterior fontanel why you want to do this because if you see this picture if you see this picture as posteriorly you apply, this will promote the flexion during the pulling. If you apply it here, it will promote the extension. That is why the position of the sutures and the fontanel position is very important whenever you applying a vacuum cup and it should be at the flexion point. Now, if you apply it here, what will happen? If you apply it here, what will happen? So, right application. Wrong application, it will promote what? Extension. What it will do? Anybody can write down what it will do. Both of these, what it will do? Let me know. Anybody writing down, counting one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Let me see. Rotation. Yeah, that is the right answer. Asyncletism. Good, good, great. Good. So waiting is a good time. Asynclitism. Now, when you will uh, tell asynclitism, this asynclitism can be asked to you. What is asynclitism? Very good. So now, what type of traction forces this vacuum is putting up? So negative suction from the vacuum itself, downward traction from the pulling, Circular force, if you are trying to rotate it, which generally we don't do. And a shearing force, if you have applied it at a wrong place. So it causes shearing force over the scalp forces. So what we want generally, we want these two forces. And if you apply obliquely, it is going to dislodge the cup. Right, the so successful application depends upon your right application of the vacuum. When to open then the procedure if it does not proceed easily and cup dislodges more than three times. Maximum time from application to delivery ideally should be less than 15 minutes. Whether it is a forceps application or a vacuum application, remember this point very important. Okay, so remember this point. And now see. 
वैक्यूम के बाद कैन यू अप्लाई फॉर सिप्स नो इट इज नॉट एज एडवाइजेबल टू अप्लाई बट सपोज देर आर अ प्रॉब्लम दैट योर वैक्यूम इज नॉट बीइंग जनरेटेड योर इंस्ट्रूमेंट डिड एंड वर्क देन यू कैन अप्लाई सो यू हैव टू इंडिविजुअलाइज योर कॉन्ट्राइंडिकेशन एंड योर गाइडलाइन सो दिस इज अ स्मॉल वीडियो जस्ट शोइंग यू दिस इज एंटीए फॉन्टेनल this is a sagittal suture now i'm rotating where is the flexion point sorry my light has gone so so i'm sharing my screen again is it visible yes ma'am yes ma'am okay thank you thank you okay so we, we were going through this we have covered so now i was showing you the flexion point okay so this is a posterior fontanel and this is a tip now we have to go two finger from this and that is the point anterior to my two finger point is a flexion point you can see here so this is a flexion point here you should be having the center of your cup the cap should be selected of the largest size so you can have all these revision points these are very nicely as shown in my course also an actual application also are uh, on patient also how you have to do it so the metallic cup if you know the right application it is a very good uh, um instrument for a successful vacuum application and then you now how to hold you have to how to assist the descent of the head so you have to with the other hand you have to hold this cup margins like this and you have to keep this index a uh, middle finger there and if there is a descent of the middle finger then that means the descent is occurring and this is called as the two finger method of for assessing the descent of head while applying the vacuum a very important part so now you have to pull this here the chain is there and now i'm putting up and this way you have to pull it right so just i'm showing you how you have to hold so as to this finger is going to assess that how much descent is occurring so this is over you can see at the junction of and it is also telling you if it is being pulled or a force direction is wrong right 
So more frequent um, complications are more frequent among primary cavitas. If you give more than three, uh, use more than three pulls, mid cavity deliveries, fetal injuries, cephalohepanatoma, subcalial hemorrhage, skull pulsing, retinal hemorrhage. Maternal injuries are low in comparison with forceps operation or cesarean. Advantages, that is very important by it. It doesn't occupy the space in the pelvis. It can be used in unrotated head incompletely. This is wrong because we are not using in an incompletely dilated cervix. Episiotomy and special anesthesia are not required. You're not necessary to give episiotomy necessarily. Because the cup is not going, covering all around, but forceps covers all around. Forceps applied is less than that of forceps. Delivery leaves no marking on the face, no compression of head, and less maternal and fetal injuries. So now coming to few of the very important guideline points, which I want to. So I told you the uh, use of... Um, this thing vacuum is not contraindicated following because you might go and see not contraindicated right another lot of things have come regarding the ultrasound assessment of the descent of head yes it is good for the research purposes but as such ultrasound assessment of fetal head position prior to assisted vaginal birth is a recommended only when there is an uncertainty regarding the clinical examination. So there is insufficient evidence to recommend the routine use of abdominal or perineal ultrasound for the assessment of the station. Another important point, discontinue vacuum assisted when, when there is no evidence of progressive descent. Very important to remember this. If there is minimal descent with the first two pulls of the vacuum, operator should consider whether application is suboptimal or position is wrong. Sequential instrument, a very important point which I have already highlighted. So, obstetrician should be aware of the increased neonatal mind following failed vacuum birth or a sequential use of instrument and should inform the neonatologist. So, it is not advisable. So, very importantly, Regarding the vacuum, careful selection of patient, application of largest cup at flexion point, and application delivery should not more than 15 minutes. Now, there is, this is a comparison of various injuries with the forceps and the vacuums. I have only five minutes. So, episiotomy, forceps may 90% may need it. Vulvovaginal tears are more common. Oasis is more common. PPH is more common with the forceps. So I told you that the maternal complications are more with the forceps. But if you talk of a cephalohematoma, scalp laceration, retinal hemorrhages, jaundice, these subgalial hemorrhages, these are more common. So fetal injuries are more common with the forceps. Now, few points regarding the analgesia, anesthesia, antibiotics. So, regarding the epidural analgesia. So, epidural analgesia, uh, first we will so, see concern regarding the epidural analgesia. So, encourage continuous support. Epidural analgesia may increase the chances of operative delivery, but less with the newer agents. Now, what should be the position while epidural anesthesia lying down lateral position in second stage if epidural anesthesia is given, otherwise you can use anything. Then delayed pushing should be advisable. There's no need to discontinue. There is no need to discontinue oxytocin and prophylactic manual rotation of fetal malposition in second stage of labor to reduce the uh, assisted vaginal birth. Now, antibiotics are very important. Somebody asked me, and now I'm here, that the ANOD trial is there, which recommended you should be using coamaxiclave before application of the this forceps, and it definitely reduces the um, infection. So good standard of hygiene and aseptic techniques are needed. What uh, very important to care for the bladder after of operative vaginal birth. So you should be writing down the timing and the volume of the first void urine and post volume void residual volume should be measured if the urinary retention is suspected. Always remember if you have put in a catheter, keep it there for some time so as to prevent the covert urinary retention in these 
patient psychological morbidities are there so we should be giving a good support to these females because they are afraid many a times with lot of pain and appearance of this instrument is really psychologically make the patient weak concern regarding the future birth yes patient go for a can go for a vaginal birth in the subsequent deliveries there is no problem with the same right so uh, this finishes with the my lecture i'll take on the question if i there and this is my latest book handbook of drugs and ops and gynae you can go to amazon write down my on my this number if you are preparing for recent advances paper you can although i think theory has been done so recent advances part 1 part 2 are already there and uh, uh, then this is my website where various modules are there which will help you practically also in your clinical practice also you can message me there are few scheme which are going on and finishing on tomorrow so you can talk to me on this number of mine and if any doubts please be uh, uh, feel free to contact me so uh, a very good uh, ifat irshad engage head is 255 palpable abdominally very nice and now you have to think how you say that head is palpable abdominally 2 by 5 1 by 5 3 by 5 4 by 5 this is a very important question of your clinical examination so i stop here sharing thank you all for your patience thank you so much ma'am for being with us best wishes thank for your exams be confident when you are appearing in this exam please be confident whenever you are answering your questions right so thank you oh so when right thank you for being with us acha one question let me answer when right side please tell it is a right occipital posterior position when you apply a right blade first okay thank you thank you so much ma'am for being with us in early morning thank you <clears throat> now uh, let's proceed uh, further hello uh, i i would like to introduce uh, our next uh, panelist uh, is dr uh, professor nilalal konna and uh, hello audible ma'am please continue dr priyanka please introduce dr punar ah oh, sorry ma'am uh, dr hiralal kunal sir uh, is a uh, Uh, he is a chairman indian college of obstetric gynecology in the government medical college and uh, jeevan hospital tirvara and our next panelist uh, is uh, dr saubhagya kumar and uh, he is professor in uh, aims bhubneswar and uh, our third panelist is uh, dr uh, reema bhat uh, ma'am is head in and uh, fetal medicine in uh, faridabad and uh, our presenter with us uh, dr uh, nikhil and dr khadija with us um, dr khadija please uh, present a case good morning dr konar Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning, sir. Nice to see you, sir. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Who are going to present the case? Doctor Khadija is going to present the case. Good, you are. Doctor Khadija, are you able to present? Yes. Okay, great. 
गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन गुड मॉर्निंग माला मैडम एम आई ऑडिबल ग्रेविडा her last uh, menstrual period was on uh, 7th of march 2023 which makes her ready to to be uh, 14 12 to 2023 her uh, she came uh, with a chief complaint of 9 months of amenorrhea with absent fetal movement since last two days ultrasound done outside was suggestive of intrauterine fetal demise there was no history of pain abdomen headache blurring of vision swelling of legs bleeding or leaking per vagina Itching over palms and soles. No history of polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, and there was no history of any chronic medical disorder. History of present pregnancy. Her uh, last uh, menses were on seventh of March, which makes her ready to to be fourteen, twelve, twenty-three. First trimester. It was a spontaneous conception. Our first ANC visit was at two months, and pregnancy was confirmed after one month of. After two months of misperiod at a hospital by UPT, she took folic acid regularly. First trimester scan was done, and found, gestational age was found to be corresponding to the, her LMP. No history of excessive vomiting, drug intake, radiation exposure, or fever with rash. There was no history of spotting per vagina. NTNB scan and dual markers were not done. she felt quickening at uh, fifth month second trimester scan was done outside but gross congenital anomalies were not ruled out she took iron and calcium regularly she was immunized with two doses of tetanus toxoid 75 grams ogtt was not done there was no history of polyphagia polydipsia polyuria there were no history of high bp recordings blurring of vision swelling of limbs no history of bleeding per vagina no history of any fever a uh, patient followed up irregularly uh sir sir uh, please show your slide in full screen mode please one minutes it's not happening one minute sir excuse me good morning dr subhag Good morning, sir. Good morning. Hope everything fine, sir. Good morning. Yeah. Thank you so much. No, is it okay, sir? उटसाइडिस and she was admitted henceforth her obstetric history she is married since past 2 years a uh, primary gravida spontaneous conception history of barrier method of contraception her menstrual history uh, her previous cycles were regular it lasted for 3 to 4 days came after an interval of 28 days uh, it was an average flow and patient is sure of her dates her past history there is no uh, history of hypertension diabetes asthma tb epilepsy or any chronic illness there is no history of any recent surgery there is no history of blood transfusion in the past family history there is no history of hypertension diabetes asthma 
TB, epilepsy. There is no history of any any uh, children born with any birth defect or twin pregnancy in the family. Personal history. Uh, she is a mix. Uh, she is on mixed diet. Appetite was normal. Uh, her sleep was adequate. Bowel and bladder habits were regular. There was no history of any substance abuse. On general physical examination, patient was conscious, alert, cooperative. Patient was afebrile. Her pulse was 90 per minute, regular in rhythm, normal volume and character. Her blood pressure was 120 by 80 mm of Hg. And right arm in supine position, her respiratory rate was 16 per minute. Clinically, she was pale, around 9 gram per deciliter. There was no icterus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy or edema. Her height was 160. Her pre-pregnancy weight, uh, as told by patient, was 60 kg and her present weight was 68 kg, which made her BMI to be 23.8. On uh, examination, bilateral thyroid and breast were normal. Uh, on, obstetric, on obstetric examination, patient was uh, laid supine with legs semi-flex and on inspection, the shape abdomen was distended and it was longitudinally oval. Uh, the all the quadrants were moving equally with respiration. Umbilicus was central and inverted. Linear nigra and stria gravidarum were present. There was no sinuses or dilated veins. Hernial orifices were intact. On palpation, there was no feet, uh, no fetal movements were present. No contractions were felt. No local rise of temperature or tenderness. Abdominal girth was 102. Abdomen was non-tense, non-tender. Fundal height was less than the period of gestation, 34 weeks. SFH was 34 centimeter. On obstetric, uh, obstetric grips, fundal grip, it was a broad, soft, irregular mass, suggestive of breach. And on the lateral grip, uh, lyco was clinically reduced. On right lateral grip, uniform curved resistance was felt, suggestive of spinal of the fetus. And on left lateral grip, multiple knob-like structures were felt, suggestive of fetal limbs. On first pelvic grip, a hard non palatable mass suggestive of head of the fetus was felt. And on the second pelvic grip, uh, fingers were converging. On auscultation, FHS was not heard. As on systemic examination, uh, cardiovascular and respiratory system were normal. So my provisional diagnosis is a 32-year-old primary gravida with POG 37 weeks, 5 days, with singleton intrauterine fetal demise in longitudinal lie and cephalic presentation, not in lip. Professor Jena. Yes, sir. It is that. So, what is the scheme actually? The other candidate will present or will go ahead with discussion of this? So, your voice is not clear, sir. Mm -hmm. Now, Nikhil, is it a is it a case that you have seen or it is a arbitrary buildup? No, sir. It was a, a case uh, which came to our uh, casualty, sir. And now, actually, from your history, it appears that she came to the institute for checkup, uh, and then uh, she lost the follow up. We could yes, not sir, follow she was, the sequence she was of not... in the case in the antenatal care in the same institute, or she was being looked after somewhere else. Coming in between irregular. So anyhow, uh, ANC visits, anyhow, ANC anyhow so and let us start our discussion. Uh, to my mind, um, Dr. Nikhil, you have made a nice presentation that of uh, 32 years old, 37 weeks and five days, and uh, um, third trimester uh, unexpected uh, fetal demise. Now then, uh, from the history, let us start from the history. Uh, you have talked about this so many no history, no history. Um, it does not sound nice. You see, if you go to this history, number of times. Yes, yes so, uh, in a PG examination, uh, all the salient features to be uh, marked, but nothing that the negative go on and on, which is a mere waste of time because discussion will be focused to many other areas. This is one and um, uh, from history, it's, it looks that uh, where things went wrong, that ultimately she became, uh, she came with that of the IUFD. You know, a realistic approach to the case, what things went wrong, that 
And then regarding the diagnosis of uh, IUFD, what, uh, how you have confirmed that of the IUFD clinical examination? Basically, you know, we see patient clinically. How will you feel the diagnosis of IUFD clinically or with the available resources in the labor ward or in the uh, maternal emergency that we see? No, given, given you the suggestion that clinically we look for the fetal heart zone. And your yes, case, sir. that of 37 weeks, 34 weeks, obviously that raises the suspicion of something going wrong. And clinically, uh, we go by the auscultation of the fetal heart sound. And if not, what should we do? There may be sometimes that is in a matter of discussion. So in case of IOD on per abdominal examination, the, um, the feel is uh, low, is, uh, not a uh, soft consistency. No, so. that's true. That you have already said. But for the confirmation of yes. diagnosis, we look for the fetal heart sound. And if it yes, is sir. upset, what we should go for the confirmation. So we should uh, order an ultrasound scan. Ultrasound. Yeah, we go by the Doppler often available. Often the liver ward, we have got the uh, ultrasound. And then what ultrasound parameters we follow in a matter of discussion. We go by the uh, ultrasonographic for the cardiac motion. Yes, sir. Then, Doppler study, talk about the Doppler study. Yeah, always we, we have to confirm that of the of these days, all the resources are available in your labor ward. So Doppler study and then uh, CTG, do you use the CTG? Yes, sir, we use the CTG, sir. CTG has got the limitations, you know that. <laughs> CTG limitations in the sense that unless you place the transducers in the optimum place, it often yes, picks, sir, it up picks up the maternal, up maternal, maternal, maternal leg, leg. Yes, and that sir. confuses you that we are missing or not. And above all, always get somebody second person. Always involve some second person to confirm the diagnosis with all these gadgets. So declare that of the intermittent fetal death. So yes, negative point, so many things. It is a mere waste of time. We don't feel that way. Now then, how do you proceed about? So we uh, then explained her the risk associated with uh, IUD, sir, uh, as uh, she was um, uh, complaining of absent fetal movement since last two days. We don't know uh, the IUD happened how many days ago or how many weeks ago. Correct. So we took uh, took a consent from her and uh, explained the risk of sepsis, DIC, coagulopathy, sir. We explained... No, uh, no, 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 don't go by this. This is a mishap for the patient, for the family. Involve the family yes, members. Sir. Patient, yes, her husband, the family members, whoever are there. This is a real uh, situation of uh, despair in the family. Yes, sir. So involve them that this has something wrong and if this is uh, the diagnosis. And then you go for the subsequent course of management. So counseling the patient, husband, and the um, family members, whoever are there. And then yes, documentation, sir. always with the documentation. Then... Then, sir, we took uh, uh, informed consent from her and explained all the risk factors associated with IOD. There could be risk of sepsis, DIC, coagulopathy. There could be a risk of uh, uh, dystocia during uh, the delivery. And uh, then we, are there, uh, uh, Dr. Nikhil. All are there, but in an institute that she has come. So probably uh, those are things are rare complications and once uh, institutional management unlikely that we are going to face. So what do you do there? Are you happy to organize some investigations uh, yes, sir. for the cause of this mishap? Yes, sir. Hmm. As she was, uh, sir, by the history taking, we have already seen so that she was, uh, she followed up very irregularly. So we will say, there's a lot noise of coming up. Little, some noise is coming up. There's a lot of disturbance, sir. Where? In the background? Yeah, uh, no, sir, not my, sir, some others. No, Cholo, carry on. Stop me. Yeah, you can go to it. It's a making. As sir, she uh, followed up very irregularly, we'll order uh, the basic, all the investigations, uh, CBC with TLC, DLC, uh, then, sir, her RBS profiling, 
uh, then LFT, so RFT, serum bile acids, uh, though she didn't complain of any itching or over palms and soles. Then uh, we'll also send the coagulation profile, uh, D dimer, fibrinogen. What do, will... what do you think? Because they started mentioned, parallel, sir. Uh, we have to regard the diagnosis. You have confirmed the diagnosis. You came with your ultrasound report. You confirmed the diagnosis. Then yes, sir. It is our aim also to find out the cause of. Yes, sir. Yes. Cause of. Yes, sir. So we'll. Uh, we and the examination. Are you getting yes. any cause? So there was a very Are irregular. Down to three fingers? So there was a very irregular visit. First of all, she, uh, she was not screened for GDM. There was no obstetric scan. Uh, most probably, uh, the, uh, uh, her weight gain was also not appropriate. So could be a case of FGR also. So how do you and know? How do you know her weight gain was not appropriate? Sir, her pre-pregnancy weight period. was uh, sixty. Uh, pre-pregnancy weight was sixty, sir. And uh, uh -huh. uh, when she came around, uh, it was sixty-eight kg. So her BMI was around uh, 23, sir. For obstetric so, weight gain, whether pre-pregnancy weight or you will take anything there? No, sir. Uh, for so, calculation of BMI, we take the pre-pregnancy weight, sir. So what was her pre-pregnancy BMI? Sir, it was 23, sir. 23. So ideally, now it's 37 weeks plus. Yes, so sir. In any case, any pregnant lady, when the pre-pregnancy BMI was 23 by 37 yes, weeks, how much should be the weight gain? So if the pre-pregnancy uh, BMI was 23, her ideal weight gain should be around uh, 11 to 16 kg, sir. Okay. So around 12 kg. All right. Then in this case, how much was the weight gain? So it was 8 kgs only, sir. 8 kg. So that's what you are Telling that the weight gain was not proper. And gestational yes, diabetes screening was not done. Or diabetes screening was not done. These two things. Yes, that sir. means when you are telling that a nutrition was not irregular antenatal checkup, nutrition was not proper, and diabetes might be at the touch. From history yes, only, sir. we are getting this weaknesses. Anything else? Yes. From history and clinical examination before going to the investigation. So from the history only, uh, these are the positive points which are uh, in favor of IUD, sir. Okay, sir. Now you are continuing with such question that uh, investigation, actually. Some mm -hmm. investigation you have mentioned. Mm -hmm. Let's yes, go ahead. <clears throat> Did no, you then... mention, because, hmm. sir, there, there was a query from some student whether we should mention this polydexia, polyuria, no history of polydexia, polythesia, and polyuria. What is your opinion, sir? Good well, sir. Hey, um, Professor Jana, what you are asking? You commented that there is no, so much of negative history in this case. Hey, no, there is no mm. uh. Apparently, uh, your case that of uh, uh, definitely it's very difficult to find out the exact cause of this fetal death. Uh, yes, but sir. polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, probably those are not clinically that important here. Those are the telltale picture of diabetes mellitus. But here, most of the, she is a relatively younger girl. So uh, unlikely that she is a case of over diabetes. So maybe GDM, uh, there could be a possibility that we need to go for the in That's the reason we need to organize several investigations to find out the metabolic areas, that of she is not hypertensive, so the other factors of antiphospholipid syndrome, these are there. So family history of any hypertension that you have mentioned. So um, the common investigations that you have already mentioned. And then there would be few more um, that uh, subsequent to this. So, also, sir, on the level two scan, sir, uh, the, which was done outside, no gross congenital anomalies were ruled out. So one point is also... Was not ruled out, no. Was not ruled out, sir. What not ruled out. So that not is a... So out. those things that... How did you, you know to... that? How did you know that? You so because there was no... Uh, the scan, sir, which was available, uh, it had no comment on the, sir, anatomy, fetal anatomy. It had no comment. Yeah, yeah. You have not gone to that, no? 
you are only taking history and clinical exemption the point i am trying to make is how did yes. you know that gross congenital anomaly was not ruled out from history and clinical examination right sir huh. that so history only so, these points are favoring sir that is a pregnant woman told you or inform you that it has not been ruled out but how did you know it really no sir we actually saw the reports then we came to know sir okay so yes, that sir. comes up to history examination yes, actually to know the cause of the yes there is no harm actually once the diagnosis is made to find out what is the cause you can go to the previous records previous investigations yes. all right yes so uh, what would be your approach now nikhil so uh, we uh, we would uh, break the news of uh, as they already know but we break the news and counsel the patient yeah. and then we will uh, will plan for the induction will uh, offer her genetic testing and fetal autopsy sir no induction of labor you see could there be any alternative talk to them that we may wait for one or two days or we should go for induction of labor what are their what is their opinion meaning that the patient herself the husband family members they are all shattered, you know, such a bad news. So they are all um, very much upset. So obviously, induction has got a place, but could there be any place of observation? No. For this one, sir, in IOD, sir, in IOD, we can wait for only, uh, two weeks as we don't know, sir, when the IOD has actually happened, sir. So probably uh, these days, uh, coming to the uh, to make our discussion short. Probably they won't be agreed, happy to go for the another yeah. disaster of waiting for uh, seven, ten days. So maybe that they will be asking you to go for the induction of labor. So how do you go yes. about? So as uh, this is a um, term, sir, uh, 37 weeks of POG is, yes. uh, so we, uh, uh, we can give her mifepristone, uh, 200 mg or 600 mg for ripening. And then we could uh, start our induction with uh, mesoprostol, sir, 25 mg. Okay. Anyhow, that uh, she you are uh, good decision, and they have agreed to that, and she has expelled the fetus. Yes, sir. Now then, what do you do? So a multidisciplinary approach should be taken. A multidisciplinary approach should be taken, sir. A genetic reference uh, should be uh, sought, uh, and then uh, no, the Nikhil, Nikhil, yes, go sir. by practical way. You are the obstetrician, you are the resident, uh, they are working in the labor ward, That's and right. you know the detail of the patient. Now she has uh, delivered. Now you see the fetus, mother, and then how do you yes, go? Sir. About? Yes, sir. So, first we'll examine the baby and then we'll see whether it was a macerated baby, what was the color of the liquor, whether it was meconium stained, or um, uh, what the then, sir, we'll uh, examine the placenta for any abnormality. We'll examine the umbilical cord for any uh, visibility of knots. We'll uh, take the placental weight. The weight of the baby, we'll see, uh, the, examine the fetus for any uh, gross congenital anomalies. We'll examine the uh, from head to toe the baby. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll take the weight, head circumference, the length of the baby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mentioned regarding the fetus, okay. you mentioned regarding the placenta, you mentioned regarding the cord, you mentioned regarding the liquor. Uh, Anything yes. else? Mm. Gross examination, then specific examination of the fetus regarding yes, the sir. placenta, cord, liquor. Fetal autopsy. Mm. Isn't the weight important, Dr. Nikhil? Mm. Yes, ma'am. Weight, weight is important, ma'am. I've told yeah. the weight is important. So, uh, why is weight extremely important in your case? Because what we gather from your case is that it is a case of FGR, FGR. that led FGR. to an mm. unexplained IUFT. Sure. So, now yes, we want to know whether it was an early onset FGR or a late onset FGR, because that will help you to find out the cause of the IUFT. So, isn't the weight is extremely important for you to decide? Because in early onset FGR, what are you looking at? And in late onset FGR, what are you looking at? And what is your cutoff limit? Because you don't know when the IUFT happened, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So what, what are the causes that can lead to early onset FGR? And what are the causes that can lead to late onset FGR? Ma'am, early onset FGR is basically uh, due to chromosomal anomalies, any infection, uh, uh, 
and late onset FGR is due uh, basically due to utroplacental if insufficiency, ma'am. Mm. Mm. Right. I think so, that will specify the in infection. So any infection will not cause infrared. No, sir. So, uh, so CMV, sir, rubella, sir. So. Mm -hmm. Varicella. Oh. Yeah. So why? So why it's important for you because this lady, you have to prognosticate her next pregnancy and counsel the parents regarding the cause. You have to mm. get to the cause. Mm. So, Probable cause, yes. Yes. So we are trying to hunt for the cause of IUFT, right? So yes, now, so you, uh, so what was the weight of the baby? Uh, in your case, what was the weight that you got when you, uh, this pregnancy was terminated? Ma'am, it was uh, uh twenty one hundred grams, ma'am, two point one kg. 2.1 kg, 37 weeks, 5 days is less. But would you, yes, so now it's very difficult for you to decide whether it was early onset FGR or late onset FGR, right? Yes, yes ma'am. Right. So what investigations would you ask for now to determine the cause? So you've ruled, as per your history, I understand that there was no history of diabetes, there was no history of hypertension, there was no history of any medical disorder, there was no history of IHCP. So the common causes you've ruled out in your negative history. So now, how will you evaluate? By the time you have received all the blood tests, no? you, what uh, you have done, you sent the lab all the blood tests on the admission and now then she has yes, been delivered. Sir. By the time you know that HbA1c, blood sugar level, that of the uh, liver enzymes, and that of the antiphospholipid antibodies, all these things that you have got, they are all normal. So now then yes, how sir. we are going to? So we would uh, take a genetic reference sir, and we'll offer them a fetal uh, for fetal biopsy. We'll uh, send the placenta now, for are you Are you happy to, are you happy to, you see that is one important area that we are looking for. Are you happy to go for the fetal autopsy? Terminology so should be if, performed. That's the first lesson. It is not fetal biopsy, actually. It is fetal autopsy. Autopsy, autopsy yeah. Autopsy, sir. I am telling autopsy only. Sir. Ah, ah, yeah. No, no, no. Ah. I think you told biopsy. So that's what I am telling. Just to tell ah. if the biopsy is not the proper terminology. And uh, Nikhil, Sorry, these sir. days we have to go for all these because you know the scenario has changed. We, as a uh, for you people that coming up, all the young generation, everything like that, the fetal autopsy. Uh, I personally do. I don't know whether you have. Uh, I have got my special interest with this, and uh, I don't know whether the slide will allow me. I did the fetal autopsy in a good number of cases, and that of uh, even the trisomy 18, um, congenital diaphragmatic hernia, uh, Edwards, you know, everything that helps yes, us a yes. lot. So, autopsy is important. And then the cytogenetic study. <clears throat> cytogenetic yes, study, sir. what are the tissues you send for the cytogenetic study? So, uh, we could send for uh, uh, costochondral junction <laughs> or patella, sir. Uh, costo, uh, we take a sample from costochondral junction or uh, we could take a from patella, sir. Mm. How do you send, you send the specimen for cytogenetic study? Isn't there yes, a simpler sir. method? Isn't there a simpler mm. method? Can mm. you not take we the can so all has been done now then yes, how you go about it is a huge topic you know still but Earlier days during our time is not that much, but nowadays we have to, and especially if you are looking forward to your another international exam, like your MRCOG or um, American system, you have to go all about, and we are doing all this. There is no yes. depth of care in our uh, scenario also in, in our country. All the care of the um, counseling, investigations, management, subsequent pregnancy care, everything has improved significantly, especially with your generation. You have to look for all. Carry on. So, how you go about? Just one question, Doctor Nikhil. The sample you've taken. What test yes, would you send it for? What test? What genetic test? <coughs> microarray analysis. Uh, we'll say uh, karyotyping and microarray, ma'am. So, microarray seven fifty k is what you would send for. Okay, good. Yes, ma'am. So proceed. Uh, proceed with how would you go about now? Ma'am, we can evaluate mother also for APLA. 
Right. No, that we have discussed. That of the antiphospholipid antibody, uh, beta two glycoprotein, everything we have discussed. Nikhil has said they have come uh, normal. To uh, save our time, go on the, the next stage of discussion. That uh, how how you uh, organize for the breaking the bad news and so, working with them, planning the uh, bereavement counseling. Talk of all this. So there are. Uh, uh, is certain... there anybody with you, or you're alone? So, um, my Dr. secondary DNB, so my senior is there with me. So, oh, anybody can Dr. share Kadeesh. with you. Sir, I'm there. No. You have to go for all this. Now, next question is that how do you uh, bereavement counseling? How do you so, break the news? That has already been done. And how models. do you how do you record things? You know, documentation is very, very important these days. You yes, must sir. document everything. And regarding the still birth, uh, the subsequent management. Like your baby uh, yes, for sir. the burial or the cremation or whatever you decide, how you discuss the couple, family members. They so, should take so, the baby home, then go for organize their own cremation or burial or the hospital. So that we often go by the hospital system that of the taking care of. But regarding the documentation, how do you how do you uh, produce the death certificate? Nikhil, this is very important. There is another threat. We are always suffering, you know. Sir, you are caring, actually, taking sir, care of the patient. At the same time, you have got the risk of doing something, missing something wrong, and then we suffer at the end of the day with some medical legal issues. So, documentation, certificate of stillbirth. How do you talk about the couple? How do you organize the next subsequent management of pregnancy, counseling, and the uh, suppression of lactation? Talk about all these things. Yes, sir. so bereavement care is very important uh, after so this. Uh, so we have to be sympathetic towards the patient and their attendants. We have to understand empathy, their religious... empathy, the terminology empathy. Is empathy, yes. Empathy, yes, sir. Empathy. We should have empathy towards them and we should understand their religious beliefs, whether they want to take the baby along with we should never yes. address it as traitors or dead uh, dead uh, your baby. We should uh, talk like that. The hospital yeah, staff. Yeah, should... your baby, <laughs> your baby. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the hospital uh, staff should be uh, empathetic towards them. So we should mm -hmm. under, uh, we should uh, uh, address them uh, whether if they want to uh, bury or uh, cremate the child. Mm -hmm. uh, we should tell about the nearest burial grounds uh, if they want to bury the child. Mm -hmm. uh, so we should uh, be compliant uh, according to their religious belief and should be empathetic. When you are going for counseling, be sure that the person that who are directly involved, knowing everything, having good skill of communication. They, yes, should, they should be there in the, our team while talking to the patient, our relatives, husband, and the family members. Yes, sir. Hmm. So the certificate, again, then all the documentation, that uh, admission, time, I, 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 diagnosis, and that of the uh, management issue, everything should be there. Documented. The, the final stillbirth certificate should be uh, sent after uh, we have a fetal autopsy report. Otherwise, uh, we normally send uh, the st um, uh, stillbirth uh, certificate and in that no case, uh, no cause is mentioned. And uh, uh, when we uh, set for uh, um, uh, our data, then we don't uh, get the actual cause of that stillbirth. So we should ideally wait for the fetal autopsy report so that... Uh, if a cause has been found out, it could be mentioned in that stillbirth certificate. Mm -hmm. and when do you, how do you organize that of the bereavement, that of the uh, different groups, you know? Counselors, they should be involved, peer review group, they, they should be involved if they like. So, regarding the next follow up and this management issue, and then the immediate that of the suppression of lactation, contraception. So, uh, for suppression of lactation, we would uh, uh, advise sir, sir cabagolin uh, zero point five mg uh, stats. Sir. That's a lot of noise. Uh, in uh, I don't know what the problem is mm. Talk about this follow up and subsequent pregnancy counseling. Sir, in, uh, we'd uh, advise her to uh, not uh, plan the next pregnancy for at least uh, six months. Sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would uh, offer her uh, various methods or basket of choices of contraception. And uh, in next pregnancy, uh, we should be very careful. Uh, if, no, uh, no, 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 Nikhil, don't, don't jump. Yes. And she has, she has come to you follow up six weeks time or four weeks yes, time. Sir. Yes, sir. So then, then how do you counsel her? 
all done all mishap done council you have done all so, the uh, we should also uh, see signs of any uh, whether there is no, no signs of postnatal depression because the mother could be very sad uh, uh, because of no, that, that counseling and that of the PR groups you have organized so yes, family sir. members are supportive so she has overcome that way but she has come to you but four weeks time uh, following this mishap in your uh, postnatal checkup the report and cytogenetic study reports with you at that mm -hmm. time yeah coming the report are with you absolutely so in that yes, condition sir. what will happen you might be able to find out one touch because of a particular case or you might not be mm. so the causes all of you know whether it might be putal placental or whatever the thing yes, is. Again, yes. i think in Avoidable. a good number of cases Mm. But we will not we will not be able to find out any cause actually. Yeah. So if you are able yes. to find out some cause, how will you counsel them? If you are not able to find out, what are the points in your counseling will? That right. is what such question is. Yeah, absolutely. You see, so this is the first session. I tell you one of my experience. How I don't know how many minutes left, Nikhil. So we have, sir, uh, uh, thirty minutes or more Le left. Yes, sir. Uh, we have, we have uh, another thirty minutes. Yes, sir. Uh, let me tell you one incident that I faced uh, because I told you now I have got a lot of interest in, in this country and working abroad also. Yes, one sir. lady that she called the, the uh, hospital. Um, I was registered. I could they, they called me that um, uh, I am having a little bit of less fetal movement. So immediately I talked to this uh, lady that you come to our hospital, we need to check you up. She didn't come, then she told that I'm too busy today, that if I can come later on, but uh, meanwhile, what to do? I said this community midwife that, you know, I'm talking of uh, uh, our uh, England. Midwife, community midwife, uh, she saw her, examined her, and she got a good trace of citizen and sent to me I could see the visibility is low. You know, there are four parameters that you often look into the city you must be knowing. So I said that it, you need to come to see us. She came to yes. next day. She was a chronic smoker, having 10 cigarettes or more. I often talk of this story. And then I examined her like I was a bit reduced. Then clinically, I did a good city ultrasonography like a reduced. And we suggested her to stay back because 36 weeks plus the pregnancy. I thought that she should be here. We will continue monitor her. Maybe that one week uh, if permits, otherwise we will go for delivery. She was so busy that she said that, no, I have to go back home for my children. And she went back home and she communicated to us next two days later. And by the time she came to us, it was an IUFD. So this is one thing that uh, we need to know that uh, counseling, communication, and that of this, there is a high risk factor. Definitely, that's the reason we requested her to stay back and we are planning for delivery. So these are the things. And the uh, you have to got this uh, follow-up clinic and then subsequent plan of pregnancy. So talk of all these things. Okay. I would say, I said the avoidable factors, non-avoidable factors, how we can go about this. There are many avoidable factors like your smoking, obesity. Yes, so there are many avoidable factors that could be um, corrected. Abnormal glycemic status. So in subsequent pregnancy, we would ask her to follow up, sir, regularly uh, and to have a detailed medical and ob uh, obstetrical checkup. Uh, we will ask her to, uh, as uh, it was a term IOD, then uh, we'll start our antepartum surveillance. Uh, uh, after 32 weeks, we'll uh, uh, do obstetric scan every year. No, Nikhil, uh, so, Nikhil, uh, Nikhil, Nikhil, go by, go by pregnancy uh, stage-wise. So uh, usually sir, we wait for the six months of one in, year. Yes, sir. Can, eh? So in first help. trimester. First uh, trimester. First trimester. Yes. First trimester, oh. sir. We would ask her to have sir uh, NDNB scan, uh, uh, dual marker, sir, PAPE and uh, beta HCG, HCG, and uh, to have uh, regular folic acid, sir. Yeah. Second trimester. Second trimester, so we would ask her to uh, for level two scan, and if the dual marker was done, we uh, don't need quadruple marker, or else we could uh, of uh, order alpha fetoprotein, sir. Mm, mm, mm. That's okay. Then then third trimester. So third trimester, sir, uh, all the routine uh, blood test, and uh, to ask her a, a count of a daily fetal movement, and uh, sir, when uh, when when. 
when she should start the counting the fetal movements. You know, your patient, Sir. the mishap, mishap probably around 32, 34 weeks of time. So if the mishap has uh, happened around 32, we should order uh, two to three weeks before uh, the previous mishap has Definitely. happened. Yeah, that's true. And then? And then, sir, uh, antepartum surveillance with routine obstetrical scans every uh, fortnightly. That's okay. Then plan of delivery. So plan of delivery, uh, we should uh, plan delivery by uh, th uh, 39 weeks. Or if the patient is very apprehensive or anxious, we could uh, uh, tell her the benefits and uh, uh, the side effects. And then we could plan her delivery by uh, 37 weeks. Sir. Well, in that case, probably she should be admitted if need be. Admitted yes, before sir. that around 37 weeks, we will monitor all these things and then the plan of delivery. So usually going beyond 39 is probably, uh, I don't think that way, that prolonging the pregnancy, we are going to get something more additionally, but there is a high risk. If need be, a monitoring parameter should be uh, strongly organized, including that of the CTG, non stress and that of the biophysical profile, all these things. So this is one yes, important. Sir. So thereafter, yes, Madam, carry on. Okay, so Nikhil, I have a question for you. Is there any role of aspirin in the next pregnancy? Would you suggest uh, yes. aspirin to the patient? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we could give aspirin 150 mg HS, ma'am. Okay. So there is very important role in the first trimester. You need to look for any high risk factors. This is extremely important. Uh, so your uterine artery, PI, etc. is important to predict whether this lady is going to land up with FGR in the coming upcoming pregnancy. So first trimester scan is extremely, extremely important. Secondly, you will also do your uh, either a GTT by the ADA. Uh, uh, ADA or by Dipsy to look for yes, any uh, sugar testing which you've not mentioned is extremely important and yes, your surveillance for the next pregnancy starts from 28 week onwards four weekly but if your patient cannot afford scans she comes from a poor background then what, what scan would you ask for 32 weeks or 36 weeks if you can ask for only one scan in the third trimester ma'am ACOG recommends scans uh, around 32 weeks ma'am so the best time is 36 weeks. So if your patient okay. can afford only one scan in the third trimester, it has to be at 36 weeks. Because there with okay. color Doppler, you'll be able to pick up utero-placental insufficiency, which will help you to increase your surveillance on the current pregnancy. And like Sir mentioned, that uh, you have to keep very strict surveillance intrapartum and yes, antepartum for this patient. Now, yes, uh, I want to ask you one question that you've decided to deliver at 39 weeks. But if there are associated medical comorbidities like chronic hypertension, hypertensive disorder, or you predicted FGR in your early, in your first trimester scan, 37 weeks could be a good time to deliver yeah. this patient. It is right? like a volume. Yeah. Right. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. and, and also that if you have to very strictly look at the what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Khadija also mentioned, that your reports have to be in hand when your patient comes to you at six after six weeks after that event, where any genetic cause you if you found out, mm -hmm. then you have to do an probably an amniocentesis at sixteen to eighteen weeks to find out if there was a deletion, duplication, or if there was a chromosomal abnormality, or if there was genetic cause found. You need to evaluate that in the next pregnancy as well, right? Yes, yes, ma'am. Good. Um, I don't know. Uh, regarding uh, Nikhil, Professor yes, Jana has got anything? Any more discussion question? There's a question in the chat. They want to yeah. know what samples we need to send for genetic testing. So when you want to send for genetic testing, fetal skin sample, 2 centimeters, can also be sent in normal saline. It's an easy to take sample and you can take it from the fetal thigh. So that is a good sample but needs to be sent in saline. You cannot add formalin to it. When no, you no, want to no, do genetic yeah. testing, Never that's ever. very extremely important. Mm -hmm. And secondly, the umbilical cord insertion at the placental site, two centimeters of that block can be tissue. sent, block mm. tissue can be sent in saline again for your genetic testing. And when you ask for a genetic testing, karyotype may not be a very good option because sometimes the cells don't grow well. But chromosomal microarray 750K, there are two kinds of chromosomal microarray, 315K and 750K. When you have a stillbirth, which is unexplained, 750K performs better because it gives you a larger resolution and small deletions and duplications may be picked up. So that uh, that is a sample that you can send for. Uh, uh, Nikhil, I have got a case that I was talking to you, uh, Professor Jana. Yes, sir. 
has a rather questionnaire for a by some participants, aging students. What is the difference between stillbirth and intrauterine fetal death? Both are same, synonymous, or what is your opinion? IUD or what you tell IUFT or stillbirth? Stillbirth is uh, delivery after 20 weeks of gestation uh, uh, without any signs of life and if the weight of the fetus is 350 grams. We call it as stillbirth. Then the intrauterine and fetal death? Try and fetal devices. Uh, so same different. Four participants because we are Dr. Khadija. The definition same. Khadija, anything you want to add? In fact, when he tells that because conventionally some people have an idea that still work is that means there were signs of life before going to labor or at the start of labor and in between during the intrapartum period if there is some issue that is known as still work. But I think this has been changed recently. Even this what previously we are telling is, is intrauterine fetal death is a terminology is being used as an antipartum skill. Mm. Then something what traditionally we are thinking is in the process or there is no science what you have mentioned also, that is known as intrapartum skill. The definition varies from country to country, place to place, in taking in consideration of uh, gestational age, yeah. age, crown, hill length, so place to place vary. But uh, both are using, to clarify that, or both are using symbols, and you can use the terminology, at, prefer terminology will be anti field. Okay. Uh, that is important in the sense, Nikhil, that of the uh, the incidents that often we talk about, that the incidents of um, IUFD or incidents of stillbirth, you will yes, see sir. that there are various uh, the data, to one in 1,000, 1 in 200. So yes, that sir. depends on this, uh, the gestational age that we, that Sarah has already said, gestational age that we consider. 22 weeks, 24 weeks. Earlier, we used to go for the 28 weeks. By a large government, of 24 weeks. That, that's a one in 200, roughly. This is where we take it, take it off. Uh, I have see. got some photographs. Um, Professor Jana, allow me. I am trying to uh, get them. Uh, give me a minute. I will I will go for that. Okay. In, I, the, in, in the meantime, have, there are a few questions in the chat box. Uh, gestosis score. So what is gestosis score, Dr. Nikhil? Ma'am, uh, it is uh, uh, a scoring system made uh, in India only for predicting the risk of uh, hypertension, uh, uh, preeclampsia and uh, gestational hypertension in pregnancy, ma'am. Yeah, so gestosis score is a lot of clinical history that you can elicit from the patient and can history be based. used to predict whether this patient will develop preeclampsia and can be used in rural setting very well. So 315K, yes, uh, next question with Divya has asked is, is 315K is sent for what, madam? So 315K mm -hmm. is the genetic testing that you send for chromosomal microarray, which picks up deletions or duplications that could have been responsible for the unexplained IUFT. Am I right, Nikhil? Is that correct? Ma'am, 315K, I have not read about that, ma'am. Okay, so there are two kinds of genetic testing, 315K and 750K. 750K is a... Uh, is a more uh, advanced version. You get more deletions and duplications that you can pick up. I think that's in, I think all the questions have been answered. History of hypothyroidism, uh, they want to know whether that history is important for stillbirth. Is Nikhil hypothyroidism important for stillbirth? No, ma'am, not as such uh, hypothyroidism. Can hypothyroidism? Hybroption is associated with hypothyroidism or. Uh... FGR can be associated nothing, not as such important, ma'am. So, if the patient is hypothyroid, you don't expect stillbirth in that patient? We can expect, ma'am. But uh, not very high associations have been associated. So, when you have hypothyroidism, you have to keep a good watch on the patient in every trimester on the uh, TSH levels to prognosticate whether it's controlled or not controlled because it can lead no, to definitely, stillbirth definitely. if yeah. there is no control, right? Is there any yes. role of thrombophilia screening in IUFT that uh, people want to yes, know? Yes, ma'am. 
Sure. Yes, ma'am. Thrombophilia, yes, thrombophilia should be screened. Inherited thrombophilia, there is no role. Acquired thrombophilia, uh, there is role, ma'am. We should screen for Apla syndrome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Correct. So inherited thrombophilia, you don't really need to test. It's expensive. It costs about ten to fifteen thousand. But APLA testing, sir, has also mentioned we must do. Sure. They want to know a little on the preconceptional counseling. So we've already mm -hmm. discussed that in detail. Uh, other than aspirin, any role of LMWH, molo molecular weight, heparin in this patient? Yes, ma'am. LMWH has also role, and uh, in certain studies, they have told that, that there is role of vitamin D also, ma'am. Okay. So LMWH. Well, the... LMWH, uh, uh, any comments from the uh, from professors regarding the role of LMWH in this case for the for the PG students, Dr. Jenna, and any any uh, anything that you want to comment on? Routine, routine in next pregnancy, routine use of LMWH. I am not for it. No, no. If no. you are finding no. any specific cause which where it will be helpful. Yeah, thrombophilia. Just routinely to use in. This is not yeah, not recommended. It should not, it should yes. not be used. So that's the take home. Yes. Yeah. So that's a take home. Aspirin definitely, yeah, definitely. Yes. Aspirin yes. has got a place, especially those with uh, association with hypertension and uh, thrombophilia also. But uh, heparin probably as a uh, without any evidence probably is not right. suspect. Point I am so, trying to make is in next pregnancy with a history of previous form till birth. Routinely, you should not use low molecular weight heparin unless right. it is otherwise indicated. Mm. That's that's yes. the take home for the PG students that you can't use uh, LMW just because a stillbirth has happened. If it's APLA positive or you found a cause, then you can offer LMW. Yeah. Yes. Now then, <clears throat> Nikhil, probably we're coming to the end. I have got some slides I will show you. Now then, yes, um, what about these uh, audits, stillbirth audits? Talk of something about the place of stillbirth audits. In our hospital, you know, we are catering huge amount of um, um, delivery. There are occasional stillbirths. So how to uh, go for this uh, stillbirth audit? What benefit we have got and how to improve upon it? So if uh, we would uh, come to know about the cause of the stillbirth, sir, but in majority of uh, stillbirths, the cause is unknown as a uh, Mm, that's true. More than 50% cause is unknown. That's true. Yes. Absolutely. But so basically, uh, audit is that of the um, we involve analysis of all the cases of stillbirth. Either we do a six monthly or monthly or annually, whatever, depending on the um, the incidents. So we involve this uh, multidisciplinary team, like the we the obstetrician. We involve the if we get this uh, genetic reports, we get the, involve the geneticist and that of these neonatologists and the physicians, you see, there are different areas of pathology that ultimately end up in, you see, there are a huge number of etiological factors or causes of the stillbirth, but again, then majority till unknown. So in this case, we involved in an audit with the different experts, multidisciplinary experts, as I have told you, to analyze each and every case so that we get some clue and then the Have we, uh, is there a problem with the first connection? Probably yes. there was connection yes. issue. Okay. So it's, uh, to continue with what Dr. Hiralal sir was telling, so to find out, to analyze each and every case, then to find out the cause, actually, where things went wrong, yes. and how to improve, the, what are the corrective steps to be taken, so that the things will not occur, because this case, actually, it is detected at 37 weeks. We know she was uh, not having proper weight gain. She yes, was sir. not coming for regular antenatal checkup, not following the advice or antenatal advice what is being given. So to find out and to improve the system equally. So that is what auditing equally, to yes. know the cause, where the issues are, and then what corrective measures will be step advised to improve the further. Right. Yes, sir. So I think, Dr. Nikhil, that was a good, uh, you presented the case quite well. And uh, the take home is that next pregnancy becomes extremely important. And what Dr. Jenna just emphasized that your counseling, counseling and counseling regarding good antenatal care, adequate number of visits, the appropriate use of ultrasound, 
has to be inculcated in the patient for the next pregnancy. Yes, ma'am. Now, Thank what you. I was talking to you the earlier that of the um, stillbirth audit, there are many areas of weakness in the care, like your antenatal care, antenatal investigations, intrapartum. There are antenatal, intrapartum, neonatal, all of these, this should be, there are areas. So if there is any weakness in our management issue, like your antenatal care or the intrapartum care, that has to be detected, that has to be improved upon. Right. Apart from that, the areas that we are organized the investigations, if anything comes there. So based on this uh, audit report involving the uh, experts of different disciplines, interdisciplinary, then we can improve upon the outcome. So that's the perinatal audit or still birth audit. Thank you, sir. So you were you were showing some sir fetal autopsy, sir. Uh, uh, fetal in autopsy. Yes. Uh, how can I? Images, uh, how, sir, you were telling. Sir. How can I do that? Share screen. Nikhil, yes, you'll sir. have to unshare. You'll have to stop. Uh, Nikhil, you have to unshare. That's... Yeah, and then sir can share. Okay, ma'am. Unshare, ma'am. Unshare. Yeah. Sir, uh, Hiral, hey, sir, now you can you... share. Now you can share your screen. Right, you are. Is it just in Kurji, though? Share screen. Then? Just to come and Just to come and take it. See, I'm going to Minimize the 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 Wait a minute. Just, just, just try, and try, and try, and try again, sir. Sir, you are allowed to now share. Now he can try, sir. Screen. He has already answered. Okay. Good answer. Uh -huh. he, can, he can try now. Right, right. I am doing. While sir is uh, preparing to share, we must understand that autopsy is extremely important when you don't yes. have, when you have to, you are evaluating a case of unexplained stillbirth. So yeah. you must insist on the family to offer, I mean, to be able to I uptake autopsy for that particular baby. This is a very important yeah. message because next time most of the time patient comes back to us with a previous stillbirth and no documents available they say that we did not get a we didn't get an autopsy done so emphasize to the family that it's extremely important to offer sir we still can't see your screen right you are then can you see this one no sir no no sir not able to put the heater and to again re-emphasize the madam has emphasized regarding the autopsy, sir has emphasized regarding the counseling. I mean, already discussed, I want to emphasize regarding the documentation. What for documentation of what happened, that what are the findings, everything should be drawn because it is not sure that next time she, when she is having pregnancy, she might come to you or you have all these things. She might go to anywhere actually. So any information which is relevant or important should not be given. It should be given because for care, the term still not in this pregnancy, proper care, plan of care, and the optimal outcome is it is most important yes. in the next pregnancy. So documentation should be done. Yes. And there's something known as limited autopsy also. If the patient does not consent to a complete autopsy, there's a limited autopsy choice that is also available. So, sir, is able to share, we'll uh, we'll go ahead now. With you you can see now? Visible. Yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, it you is, can sir. see now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It can be seen now? Huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. I am audible also? Yes, sir. Right. Uh, here, relax, is the, sir. here is the stillborn, you know, um, the neonate. Uh, to give the history... Uh, uh, the woman that she came late to us in the antenatal clinic at Nilatan Sarkar Medical College when I was working there. Um, husband is the school teacher, and ultimately when she came to us that of the with the stillbirth, uh, interrupted fetal death like your case, uh, that was the first visit referred to us, and then uh, um, as usual we uh, started the management, 
delivering the uh, mother. And you see, I did the autopsy. Autopsy revealed that of uh, this um, anomaly, you can see absence of the kidneys, multicystic kidney, hepatomegaly, and that the spinomegaly. Morphologically, there was no other abnormality. So uh, we organized this study of karyotyping. Ultimately, we got it that of the trisomy 80. I am talking of quite few years now, now that cytogenetics, all the details are available now. That time I could not use that. But till then, with all my interest, I got it that of the trisomy 18. And um, then subsequent pregnancy, all the uh, details of the investigations that we have discussed with you, that we organized and successful pregnancy. So this is another one that uh, early pregnancy in the, that uh, the intertrain fetal death and uh, uh, with the sonography that we could get that of the diaphragmatic hernia. And that see this case also, the chromosomal study, uh, the trisomy 21. So uh, these are the areas that of uh, interest that uh, I feel in a case, this is the another one that the fetal high drops. So all the cases we did that of the USG, um, we didn't need the need of the MRI, but USC, all of us could organize X-rays. Definitely, skeletal malformations that we were we have discussed that need to be organized. So this is the few photos that I thought figures that I have faced the situation. I thought I would share with you. So that's all. But um, next, then whatever we can go for this discussion. Anything oh, from your end? Is there any question answer that we can uh, help you? So um, already, so you have uh, explained so very well. So thank you. Uh, your, your colleague, anybody from the audience that they are sharing, they are, they are participating. Any questions that they have got? Uh, there were a few questions in the chat box that I think we addressed. Sir. All right. of the questions or suggestions, whatever given, we have addressed sir, during our right. discussion. Correct, correct. Good. Thank but you. Dr. Nikhil, nice presentation and nice. You yeah. have answered well also. And uh, very nice. Thank you very so, much. Madam Thank Professor, you. that uh, scenario has changed compared to our uh, time. So you need to get all these resources are available. These days we are no way lagging behind. And uh, in these cases, are, these cases are gone down. But nevertheless, occasionally such we face the problem. So uh, you need to be aware all the resources of the diagnosis, management, and the subsequent outcome of the um, good pregnancy outcome, all of are looking for. I think uh, this is all that I we know. need to do. Yes, thank you so much. You, we, just, we just had a case where we had a non-immune hydrops and this uh, when we uh, subjected the fetus to testing, we found out toxoplasma PCR positive. And this lady was exposed to cats. So you have to elicit a good history and try to find mm, out the cause. Important, which is important. Extremely, extremely mm, important. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. These are the learning resources here. Yes. Thank you so yes. much, uh, Dr. Nikhil and Dr. Thank you so much, Dr. Hiralal. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure Thank to you. learn. Thank you. Thank you. It was organizers, a organizers, that so organizers. Thank you so much. 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 Thank Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mala Mal, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, yeah. Thanks to the Guru. And she does it every thank year, you, maybe once or twice a year. And we are participating with her. Great. We have enjoyed this session. Thank you. Madam. Madam. So, Hello. Thank you so much. Mr. Black, Nikhil. Good. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mala, madam. Thank you, madam. <laughs> yes, madam. We are looking for thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, Great pleasure. Okay. Excellent, yeah, excellent sessions. Mm. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank sir. Thanks to everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Well done. Good, good discussion. Nikhil. Good discussion. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Oh, madam is there. Morning, Dr. Sheila, madam. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Thank you so Dr. much. Good morning. Yeah, Dr. Priyanka. Yes, yes, ma'am. Now, now let's proceed forward. I would like to uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, our first panelist is Dr. Geeta Madhiratha, ma'am. Uh, she is vice chairman at Gangaram Hospital and she is also vice president of ISOPAP Delhi chapter and uh, also chairperson in Eurogynecology subcommittee of AOGD. And uh, our next panelist is uh, 
डॉक्टर सीला माने मैम इज करेंटली डी एन बी फैकल्टी एट के सी जी हॉस्पिटल बेंगलुरु एंड आई सी ओ जी गवर्निंग काउंसिल मेंबर एंड अवर थर्ड पैनलिस्ट इज मैडम इज ऑल्सो वाइस चेयर ऑफ द आई सी ओ जी रिसेंटली इंस्टॉल्ड एज इन हैदराबाद आई सी ओ जी मैम इज अ वेरी ग्रेट टीचर टीचर ऑफ टीचर्स वेरी पैशनेट अबाउट टीचिंग थैंक यू थैंक यू मैम and uh, our well, third panelist is dr aparna had hagde ma'am uh, she is a consultant and uh, i would like to welcome our uh, presenters uh, dr uh, khadija and uh, dr pail uh, they will uh, present a case on uh, uv prolapse everybody is coming on do we have dr hegde and dr uh, all other uh, other two Hello. dr geeta is here yeah. yes dr, dr. sheila dr. good morning good morning good morning uh, dr aparna is busy so she will not be able to join us okay for the students yeah. Yeah. should we start now yes yeah, yes please please, please. Uh, today we will present a case for pelvic organ prolapse. Uh, file, please change this. Mrs. X, fifty-seven year old, postmenopausal, para four living force female, resident of Bihar, of Asian ethnicity, belonging to low socio-economic status, according to modified Kupusami classification, with primary level of education and pharma by occupation, came to Gyni OPD, OPD with the chief complaints of. Uh, something coming out her vagina since past one year, lower pelvic and vagina pressure along with back ache uh, since past six months and difficulty in passing urine since past three months. Uh, history of presenting illness: the vagina bulge was initially the size of P and has progressively increased to the present size. Patient also complain of lower pelvic and vagina pressure along with back ache since past six months, especially by evening. After a day long at work, and which gets relieved after a night long rest by early morning, the vaginal and pelvic pressure is of mild to moderate intensity. Uh, scored as four to five uh, uh, on visual analog scale according to the patient, and it increased on doing household work, or and it decreased on rest. Uh, history of difficulty in passing urine. The patient also gives history of hesitancy and difficulty in initiating the urinary stream. He often has to splint the vaginal bulge inwards with her index finger to start the stream of urine. She also gives history of incomplete evacuation of urine after completing the process of maturation and often has to change the position and splint in double void to feel satisfied as to have evacuated the urine completely. Uh, there is also history of post void uh, voidal dribbling of urine sometimes there is no history of increased uh, frequency of urination during the day no history of nocturia no history of burning maturation urgency or urge incontinence no history of leaking while coughing uh, laughing or climbing the stairs no history of use of pads or bed wetting or no any history of coital incontinence <laughs> Patient also gives history of constipation on and off since ten to fifteen years, for which she took uh, some home remedies. The frequency of bowel motion has decreased over the past one to two months, with the patient passing motion every two days. History of occasional splinting to pass motion present. History of three to four glasses of water intake every day. There was no any history of incontinence to solid, liquid stool or flatus. There was no any history of tennis muscles, flank pain, or any pelvic pain or diarrhea. No history of melina. There was. No history of recent increase in weight since past six months, and there was no any history of chronic illness like chronic cough, COPD, asthma, or any uh, allergy to the inhalational age allergens, and there was no any history of dyspnea, stroke, myopathy, or any neuropathy. Yeah, proceed. Slides are not moving. No. Uh, her menstrual history. She is a post menopause. She was a post menopause. Uh, she attained menopause at forty seven years of age. With uh, and there was no any history of uh, any menstrual abnormalities in the past, or she gave no history of any post menopausal bleeding. She is married since forty years. Husband is alive and well. 
she had four uh, home del- uh, she had uh, four uh, vaginal deliveries the her first three deliveries were home delivery conducted by local dai in first delivery there is a history of prolonged labor is present uh, her in second uh, delivery it was also her home delivery conducted by dai there third delivery no need to mention no instrumentation because they are all home deliveries yes ma'am yeah mm. uh, her fourth delivery was uh, institutional delivery uh the baby boy was born weight is not known uh, there was also no any history of instrumentation she resumed to farming work uh, two months after the delivery and her interpregnancy interval was just one to two years she had no any history of chronic illness like diabetes asthma tb any coagulation disorder neuropathy or myopathy there was no any significant surgical history no any significant family history her personal history was normal sleep and appetite with a normal bowel habit she was mainly vegetarian with no any drug uh, substance or substance abuse or alcohol intake and there was no any history of any drug intake or any transfusion history khadija <coughs> you said she has constipation you mentioned she has constipation yes ma'am yes so in your personal history you have to correct it you have written okay, no okay, constipation ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. On general examination, patient is conscious, oriented, average built, and nourished. Her height is one fifty eight and weight is fifty three kg, and her BMI was twenty one point two. Uh, patient was mild pallor was present. There was no ictus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymph, idiopathy, or fetal edema. Her vitals were normal. Pulse was normal in regular rate rhythm. BP was normal. There was no any glossitis, stomatitis, or no any significant. I mean, uh, there is thyroid. nothing abnormal. Okay, we have read this. Yes, ma'am. No. Next. Okay. Ma'am. On systemic examination, also there was RS, CVS, CNS. Everything was normal. Yeah, no normal. any abdomen is also no soft. Abdomen is fine. Fine. On per abdomen examination, on inspection, uh, the abdomen was void and legs abdominal wall. Proceed. Proceed. Go to next. Go to next. Uh, on local examination. Uh, Local examination will be taken by Dr. Pyle. On oh, local examination, dorsal supine position without tapping the bladder, uh, there was wide gaping of introitus and mass was protruding out of the vagina. Vulva was healthy and vagina, uh, no atrophic changes were seen. Vaginal epithelium was healthy, vaginal rugosities were absent, no decubitus ulcer was seen and there was no pigmentation also. Oh, so when uh, you are mentioning that vaginal rugosities are absent, okay. Yes, Would you like to specify that? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, any specification? Because see, first of all, there is a mass which is coming out of the vagina. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So you are commenting on the vagina which is seen outside, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, so now <laughs> vaginal rugosities you have mentioned, isn't it? Yes, Which ma'am. All of the ma'am, vagina. This tension cystocele, the uh, rugosities are usually absent. Central cystocele. So you can say Central the mass which is producing the vaginal rugosities are absent. Suppose if there is a mass, but the vaginal rugosities are present. Ma'am, it can be dis, uh, displacement cystocele. Uh, displacement cystocele, ma'am. Pardon? Displacement cystocele, ma'am. Ah, so where is the defect in that case? Ma'am, in arcus tendon. Uh, lateral defect. One person at a time. Ma'am, paravaginal defect in yeah. arcus tendinus fascia, which is connected mm-hmm. to the white line. Exactly. So you can find that, you know. So you will have to rule out if you don't, you if the rugosity is present, then you'll have to rule out the lateral vaginal wall or paravaginal defect. Okay. Defect. And how do you diagnose okay. that? Ma'am, if the lateral sulcus is present, then uh, it is central defect. It is, it is absent in displacement cystocele. Now, while in, examining, uh, how do you diagnose? Why, how during examination, how do you know it is a lateral vaginal wall defect? Then we look for the rugosity. Yeah, rugosity you have seen. Any other? Any other test you can do, Khadija, Payal, which you can demonstrate? Yeah, demonstrate. Is it a displacement cystocele or a distension cystocele? Any test? You may have to examine the patient with some instrument. Ma'am, Boni's test. Boni's test is not for this. Can you Would use you like the cosmos speculum? Yes, ma'am. We have to retract the posterior vaginal wall. Yeah. 
posterior vaginal wall retraction will not it. help you. We are asking you, is there a way which you can make out? Can you support the lateral sulcus in some way so that it is differentiating, helping you to find out whether it is a displacement? Supposing it's a displacement cystocele, can you put in an instrument, replace the paravaginal or obliterate the paravaginal defect and the cystocele will disappear? Any instrument you can use? Phone shoulder, ma'am. Yeah. How will you use it? Where will you put the sponge holder? Will you close it? Will you open it? Ma'am, uh, with... Uh... Close it. We close the sponge holder and then put it where? Ma'am, you in... close it? The lateral angle. Lateral phonics. No, where will you put it? You open the sponge holder and put it where? Not closed. Ma'am, open uh... At the paravaginal space. Little and vaginal one. And, and you lift it up. If the cystocele disappears, that means it was a displacement cystocele. Displacement cystocele. Okay. okay. Please carry on. Bulbocavinous reflex was present and anal, reflex, uh, anal wing reflex was also positive. How do you elicit bulbocavinous reflex and anal wing reflex? Ma'am, by touching the lateral portion of the clitoris, by uh, tapping on that, there would be a uh, contraction of the cavernous muscle, the cavernous muscle. An anal wink reflex, how do you elicit? Ma'am, by tapping on the anal orifice. There anal. Be... Do you tap the orifice? Do you tap the orifice? No, ma'am. The... What, what, what do you, what do, you do? Ma'am, pinch. What do you do? Where? What is done? And where is it done? Ma'am, the uh, perianal peri skin. You must have done it, no? Because you have written oh, there. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do? You just pinch it gently, perianal skin, where the cutis ni is. Yes, or a little lateral to that and you see the cutis ni contracting. You know the cutis ni is inserted, the part of the external anal sphincter which is inserted into the skin, correct? Yes, so when it contracts, the anal cutis ni contracts, you get these wrinkles around the, you get the wrinkles around the anus, okay? So that is the anal wink reflex. Yes. Okay, carry on. No uh, stress secondary uh, incontinence was demonstrated with prolapse outside and with uh, reduced. Patient is it, why is it important to check for SUI while uh, with uh, reduced uh, after you reduce the prolapse also? Ma'am, because uh, uh, there uh, can be an occult SUI. You can open your video, Khadija. Ma'am, it's open. Uh, yeah. Occult SUI to diagnose occult SUI. Because if it is not diagnosed, suppose if it is not diagnosed, what problems it can lead to? Okay. And if we do a vaginal, uh, if we do the vaginal hysterectomy, the prolapse is gone, but the patient still has a complaint of leakage of urine on exertion. Postoperatively, it will be, uh, uh, it will present. The patient will complain it after right. the surgery. Okay. Yeah. Surgery. Yeah. So we have to cut. It, uh, we have to first check with SUI and then we have to correct it when we are doing this. Yeah. Okay. Now proceed. Patient was then asked to empty the bladder and then anterior compartment examination was done. Retracting the posterior vaginal wall uh, and cervix by Sims speculum, visualization of anterior vaginal wall after maximum uh, after maximal straining was done. There was bulging of anterior wall and central uh, vaginal rugosities were absent and lateral sulci was noted. In uh, on doing apical uh, compartment examination, retracting the anterior and posterior vaginal wall with separate Sims speculum, visualization of uh, apical compartment after maximum uh, straining was done. On training, the entire cervix is visualized outside the introitus, which was suggestive of apical compartment prolapse. There was no congestion, hypertrophy, and decubitus ulcer was noted. Proceed. 
on posterior compartment examination <coughs> discussing the anterior vaginal wall and cervix by pimp speculum visualization of posterior vaginal wall while slowly withdrawing the posterior speculum pimp speculum during valsalva manual was done on the dress Think the speculum bulge noted in upper part and lower part of uh, posterior vaginal wall, which was suggestive of posterior compartment prolapse. Then rectal and recto vaginal examination was done. Posterior wall defects were examined and recto vaginal septum palpated for breaks and thickness. How do you examine the recto vaginal septum? Your uh, finger is in the rectum. How do you examine? Someone. Recto vaginal, how is it done? How is the recto vaginal examination done? Some index finger of uh, one hand is uh, is uh, kept in rectum and index finger of uh, the opposite hand will be kept in vagina. Then you have mentioned posterior wall defects. Yes, ma'am. How do you examine the defect? Ma'am, then, the then we will try to approximate the fingers. If the if we are uh, if the fingers uh, if there is defect in posterior vaginal wall and fingers are approximating, then it can, and then it will be recto sealed. And if the fingers are not approximating and there is gurgling sound in between, then it could be entero sealed. Where are your fingers placed for this kind of a differentiation between entero and recto? Ma'am. Uh, See, finger in rectum, how do you identify enterocele? By putting your finger, a finger is in the rectum only, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma so, can you feel the intestine by doing this test? Oh. No, no ma'am. No, ma yeah. So, the intestines are felt in which mass? True, vaginally what you are palpating, no? The uppermost yes, portion, the apical portion. Yes, ma'am. That mass, if you palpate, you will have that, uh, uh, if it contains intestine. Okay, in enterocele. Hmm? Hmm. Can you can you polish your examination, ma'am? Yes, the ma rectovaginal septum. What is that movement called? It's called the pill rolling movement, isn't it? You can do a pill rolling movement and feel for the external anal sphincter or any tears. She's had three home deliveries conducted by the dai, so you do expect some kind of a damage in that area. So you do the pill rolling movement, okay? You can't uh, palpate mm. for breaks and thickness that you will need an endoanal ultrasound. That is the modality yes, you will use. Your fingers will not be able to palpate or make out. You don't have ultrasound uh, eyes uh -huh. in your tips of the fingers, okay? You can but barely feel the pill rolling movement and the intactness of the external anal sphincter, if at all. And the levator ani, how do you feel? Have you palpated for that? Ma'am, at 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock position, uh, thumb, position. Uh, th uh, with uh, index finger inside the vagina and thumb outside and uh, at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock position. Uh, we... mm -hmm. Then what, patient does something or you just with your finger we palpate? Ask, we ask patient we to... Ask the patient to go. Uh, have... Sorry, we asked the patient to. Sorry, I didn't get that. Ma'am, to hold the finger, to uh, try to hold, hold the, the urine or the feces. Try to hold the urine or feces. Hello, hello. You asked hello? Her, Yeah, how will you know? How will you assess the tone unless and until you ask the patient to hold the urine? Not hold, uh, you are uh, assessing the posterior. Hold, hold the feces, ma'am. She has to just contract, you know, the lower part, the external anal sphincter, isn't it? Okay, yes, she can yes. do that. If she does that, then you can assess the tone, you know, the whole of the lower part of the vagina, she has to just squeeze or constrict like that. Hmm. Okay, carry on, please. Pelvic floor muscle assessment, levator uh, and eye tone was tested by Oxford scale. It was three out of five. Per vaginal examination was done. Uterus was of normal size. Antiverted. Bilateral fornices were free. And and Is it an antiverted uterus? Uh -huh. Exactly. Did you see an antiverted uterus? Did you? I'm sorry. Did you palpate? Is it an antiverted uterus? Can what an antiverted? What happens uterus in prolapse when the, uh, the there is a descent? 
Ma'am, this ma'am ma technical error. It was retroverted, ma'am. Sorry for that. Uh, why is it a retroverted? Can an antiverted uterus drop out of the uh, vagina? No, is it no, physically no, possible? No, no, no. exactly. No, no. So it has to retrovert no. and then descend. Secondly, you have said this uh, modified Oxford scale 355. Can you please enumerate? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, according to the, uh, uh, while doing that, uh, one finger inside at 4 o'clock and 8 o'clock and thumb outside, then we'll check at, uh, there is grading uh, of 5. At 0, there is no contraction. When we ask the patient to contract, there is there will be no contraction. and Contraction of what? What do you see? Ma'am, levator and I tone contraction. Like contraction. You see the contraction or you see lift of the perineum? Ma'am, lift of the perineum. Ma'am, yes. lift of Yes, it is lift of the perineum and the muscle tone, both. And yes, do you do yes, it with visual or is it a finger in the... Uh, chalo, ab batao, batao, puri scale, score batao, fir batao. And then grade one will be given if there will be slight flickering. Flickering of what? Flickering of the posterior vaginal wall, of course. Yes, perineal body and the posterior vaginal wall, okay. Ma'am, grade 2 will be given if there is a weak contraction, slightly better than the flickering, there will be... Uh, uh... What do you have now? It's very subjective, no? Flickering, so it is not against resistance, right? Yes, oh, yes, ma'am. Hmm. And then grade 3 will be given to the moderate. Uh, there will be proper lift in this uh, of posterior general bone and perineal body. And grade four, uh, in grade four, there'll be a uh, uh, good contraction with lift. And in grade five, there'll be strong co contraction. It is always, you say, against resistance. If she can lift up the perineum against, you are pressing the two fingers. You have your fingers at the forchette and you can press it down. And then you ask her to squeeze. And if the whole perineal body and posterior vaginal is lifted up despite your downward pressure, that mm -hmm. is a very good five by five modified Oxford scale. Okay. Okay. Next. Ma'am, then we did the uh, quantification staging. In this, uh, we uh, checked for anterior compartment, posterior compartment, and uh, also checked for the uh, apical compartment. Uh, first is, uh, we take hymen as the reference point in pop view. Uh, there are two fixed points, AA and AP. AA is on anterior wall. AA is uh, the points uh, proximal uh, to the hymen. Can you increase your volume? Ma'am, points proximal. Uh, increase points your volume. Uh, I'll come nearer. Huh. Yes, ma'am. Points proximal to the hymen, uh, proximal to hymen will be taken as uh, plus and uh, will be taken as uh, minus and uh, distal to the hymen will be taken uh, as plus. So A is the point, it is the fixed point on uh, anterior vaginal wall. It is uh, in normal uh, patients, it is my, it is taken as minus three. Uh, it is three centimeter above the uh, external, external urethral meatus. Uh, on Below the we say not the meatus, we say the hymenal ring is the reference ring. point. So it is a fixed point located 3 centimeters from, from the hymenal ring on the anterior vaginal wall. Yes, ma'am. BA, uh, BA is the most dependent portion of the prolapse. Uh, it, can, uh, it can be from... Uh, no, no, you just explain your findings and you tell, okay? Okay, ma'am. You have put the uh, uh, table there, okay? Yes, ma'am. No. Ma'am, BA point was uh, the most dependent point was uh, plus five. It was five centimeter outside of the hymenal ring. Then C, it is the most distal portion of cervix. It was plus seven. Hmm. Then GH genital hiatus. It is taken from the uh, external mid, uh, middle of the external urethral meatus to posterior portion to plus six centimeter in this patient. Anal body. It is taken from posterior fossa to middle, uh, mid anal portion, mid anal part, and it was 1.5 centimeter in this. Patient. Total vaginal length was 9.5 centimeter. In this, this is the only uh, length which is which is measured in resting position. Rest all the points are measured in straining after straining. Then AP, AP is. Uh, AP was 
the most uh, the fixed point on posterior vaginal wall uh, it was zero in this patient and bp was the most dependent portion of posterior of the of the posterior vaginal wall it was minus 1 and then d it is the uh, distal portion of posterior fornix it was minus 2 in this patient if it is minus 2 and c is plus 7 so you are having an intravaginal elongation also <laughs> Because it is 9 centimeters. If you see C and D, the difference is 9 centimeters. Yes, yes, Intravaginal elongation is also there, that means, right? Yes, yes. See if the D, what is D point? Ma'am, D, um, uh, D point is the posterior. Pardon me? D Pardon. point is what? Most distal portion of the posterior fornix, ma'am. Uh, is that how it is defined in the book? Uh, Ma'am, the point of the <coughs> attachment of uterosacrals. Yes, it is the attachment yes. of the uterosacrals. Correct. Uh, so it is minus two. You are in your case. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Right. Is this a life case or this is just an imagined case? No, ma'am. This was a life case. Life case. Okay. So what do you make of it now? Because your TVL is 9.5 centimeters. It's somehow not fitting into my mind. You know, if a TVL is 9 point, what is TVL? Ma'am, total vagina. The total vagina. How is it measured? Ma'am, it is measured from handnail ring with IR spatula. Uh, we mark 1, 1 centimeter uh, uh, markings on IR spatula. And at the resting position, this is measured. From hymenal ring, we uh, in, introduce it as special into vagina. This is in resting position? TVL yes. is measured in resting position? Yes, yes ma'am. But in the resting yes. position, yes. your cervix is lying outside. Ma'am, after the D is minus after 2. After reducing the... After reducing, isn't it? You have to After reduce. reducing the prolapse, ma'am. Ah, so TVL is the only measurement which is done in the after reducing the entire prolapse, right? So it's a very nice long vagina, that means. So what is your stage now? How will you say? This is pop Q stage. One, two, three. What is it? Ma'am, this is pop Q stage. Uh, Ma'am, this is pop Q stage uh, three. Stage three, ma'am. Okay. And leading point? Is sub cervix ma'am C point C yes point C and without occult or stress urinary incontinence or with and without any okay and modified Oxford scale is <coughs> it's three by five ma'am three by five so uh, the person who presented the history can you summarize your yes. history in five lines yes, so that we know the high risk factors um, uh, she's a 57 year old with paraphernalia for uh, leaving for previous three normal previous three home delivery and one institutional delivery with interpregnancy interval of less than two years post in the parcel with something coming out of uh, coming out mass for vagina with increased Frequency of uh, maturation and complete voiding with mild failure on examination with a UV prolapse, a cystocele, enterocele, and rectocele. Do you use these cystocele, enterocele, rectocele in uh, the current times? Do you use these words? No, ma'am. What is the current no, nomenclature which is we are using, number one? And number two, you have mentioned with increased frequency, incomplete voiding. You want to put a name to this? Ma'am, anterior compartment and posterior compartment. And yes. Compartment. Right. So someone can tell the Delancey's level of supports? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, Delancey's level one uh, in this, the uterosacral and cardinal ligaments. Uh, are the support and at the lengthy level 2 endopelvic fascia and the arcus tendinous fascia which is connecting to the lateral pelvic bone to white line 
uh, and in uh, the lengthy level three level no 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 level two is what say that again ma'am endopelvic fascia and connective tissue uh, and uh, arcus tendinous fascia arcus tendinous fascia yes what what fascia is connecting to that so that it is giving support to the anterior and posterior vaginal wall what are the fascias located in the anterior and posterior vaginal walls ma'am which are anteriorly anteriorly which organ is there posteriorly which organ is there ma'am what is there anteriorly what is there posteriorly what organ is connecting to the vagina ma'am uh, anteriorly there is uh, bladder urethra urethra mm -hmm. so what is the fascia the bladder vesico cervical fascia so pubo vesico cervical fascia and vesico vaginal fascia isn't it yes ma'am so they go and extend yes. laterally and attach to the arcus tendineus fascia pallidus yes ma'am right. yes fascia pallidus and posteriorly some recto vaginal fascia mm. and you have okay. also mentioned about uh, perineal body and all that isn't it ma'am the level, level that will be level 3 support ma'am perineal body and perineal level 3 support so in level 3 it will be what uh, perineal defects anteriorly posteriorly ma'am it causes a uh, urethrocele and uh, yeah cave introitus yeah so what do you call it as what are the weak fascias what are the facial defects where are they located anatomically the level 3 facial support is located where the level 3 fascia the lower third lower third of the vagina what is it called what is it called you have Any done the examination you have tested that isn't it what is it called mam laxed perineum it will be called hmm so, so it's so a perineum no so yes, what is it perineal body <laughs> <laughs> so much Come of on. it's a perineal body and it consists body. of what muscles ma'am then um, natural muscles um, Which what one? is the shape what is the shape of perineal body is it round square rectangle pyramid what is the shape pyramidal pyramidal so what are all attachments are there and there are nine ma'am levator and i uh, transverse perineal muscles and valvo cavernous hmm external inner so superficial and deep external inner sphincter uh, transverse perineal levator yes external and anal uh, sphincter muscle yeah and the levator and i yeah so you have these nine muscles attached like a spoke of the wheel they are attaching to the central hub hub is the perineal body mm -hmm. so perineal body is torn usually in unattended deliveries vacuum forceps big babies precipitate labors yes yes ma'am so that will result in a level 3 defect so if you have a level 3 defect will you have a anal wink reflex and a bulbo cavernous reflex no ma'am but your patient you said you have positive and all the more she had all uh, three vaginal deliveries home deliveries exactly exactly that's why i'm asking is it a real case or a imagined case na you see you can make out from your history and your examination whether you are giving the correct case scenario or uh, because it doesn't uh, add up isn't it anyway chalo doesn't matter how will you manage this case ma'am as she is post menopausal so will it with uh, as she is post menopausal 57 years so we can mm -hmm. proceed with vaginal hysterectomy with pelvic floor repair with anterior colporaphy and perineura mm -hmm. so site specific repair right okay yes, as you have diagnosed she has a central defect that is cystocele and she also has rectocele as well as enterocele right 
on your examination. Yeah? Hmm. Yes, ma'am. So now this patient, you want to do vaginal hysterectomy with uh, anterior colporaphy, posterior colporaphy. Now, yes, uh, you said she has enterocele also. So anything else you would like to add for that? My colposcopy. My What are the methods? What are the methods? We are doing vaginal hysterectomy. No, are there any different uh, methods or which one you have seen? You tell. Have you seen any? Yes, Michael scaldoplasty for repair of enterocele. Yes. Yeah. Tell me yes, which one. Which one you have seen? Or you tell which one you know you tell. But Michael's uh, caldoplasty we can do to treat the enterocele. That's what. How do you do it? How do you do it? And there are internal and external sutures. Mm -hmm. uh, delayed external suture is taken and in internal sutures the uh, Khadija, you can answer that. Yes, ma'am. Exactly what do you want to do? Where is the defect? Apical defect, isn't it? So you want to pre prevent the recurrence. Suppose if you don't treat enterocele, what can happen? What complication it can lead to? All of both of you have to don't look at the chat box. <laughs> the answers are coming there. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Khadija, you know the answer. Yes, it can lead to wall prolapse. Yeah. So what repair is done then? Suppose if you are doing external. So ma'am, we have to strengthen the uterosacral with the uh, uh, heart. Uh, where do you take the, supposing you are the surgeon, your sister is giving you the needle and thread. First of all, what needle thread you will ask for and where you will take the bites? Vitrin, ma'am, we will take. Hmm. Uh, you have the vaginal walls which are reflected, right? Ma'am, we have to approximate both the uterosacrals by in, uh, internal sutures and in, uh, in external, ma'am, we will take uh, vaginal mucosa, then peritoneum and then uh, fold also. No, vaginal mucosa, straight you go to peritoneum or will you go via some Uter ligament? Uterosacral, ma'am. And then uterocycle on the left of the patient taken, then bite of the peritoneum or you go straight to the other uterocycle? No, then bite of the peritoneum, then to the other uterocycle and then we time the between. Where will you take the bite on the peritoneum? There is an enterocyl sac. So, will you take the edges or you will have to... How, how, we, how do you prevent that? So you have to go a little higher. Okay. The peritoneal bite has to be higher so that the sac is below. Okay. And then you take the other side uterosacral and then the vaginal wall. Laterally you come out. What suture material? Okay. Polyglactan. Delayed absorbable suture. Delayed absorbable. And when will you tie this external suture? Will you tie just then and there? Or will you tie it later? Tied later and after anterior. Uh, after? In, after anterior. After and complete your answer. After anterior colporaphy is done. Okay. Yes. Any other yeah. method to prevent wall prolapse? Suppose if you are doing this surgery. Okay. Yes, and uh, prophylactically also they can do. I think. Uh, so uh, can you just uh, do something else also? And uh, what will make you decide that you have to do that? Uh, you finished the vaginal hysterectomy. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Some finding at the end of surgery will make you think, no, better I do this, better I combine this procedure also. You want to prevent uh, the vault prolapse later on. So, vault has to be anchored to something sturdy. Well, something sturdy. Uh, 
So one sturdy thing is you to give us any okay. other any other sturdy structure. Yeah, you you said know? that. Khadija, sacrospinous. Sacrospinous fixation. You can. Yeah. You. How do you do it? Uh, Ma'am, we uh, we first. Uh, what is sacrospinous ligament? Spine. What is sacrospinous ligament? What is it? Where is it attached? Ma'am, it shall spine uh, to the sacrum and it is uh, two, fin okay. medial, uh, two fingers, medial. Uh, medial where? Medial to the ischial spine. Sir. Okay. Why, why medial? Why not at the ischial spine? Ma Ma because if, uh, we can damage the pudendal vessels and nerves. Very good. So how do you identify it, and how do you uh, how do you actually locate the sacrospinous? Your vaginal hysterectomy is over. Right. So will you do it when the vault is open, or would you like to do it with the rectoseal repair? I mean, there are two approaches, na, anterior and posterior. So. Suppose you want to do anterior approach. Yes, ma'am. So can you feel it easily? No. See, uterus when you are clamping, cutting, and ligating, when you are uh, doing the circumoral incision, at yes, the cutting that, you can easily palpate the uterosacral ligaments. You can easily palpate the attenuated, so you can take a bite and leave it long. And then you this will be used your internal and external mech calls. So posterior approach is usually easier when you're doing the rectoseal repair. So how many uh, divers you will need to retract and what are the structures you retract when you are exposing the uterosacral ligament? How many divers you will use? One inch or one and a half inch. How many divers you will need? Small divers. Four divers. Sorry? You will need three small divers. So one to retract the rectum. And two, and two anteriorly to expose. And what material you would use? What suture material you will use? And where will you take the bite for a sacrospinous fixation? For caldoplasty, we use uh, delayed absorbable. What suture material is used here? Ma'am, nylon, uh, nylon or proline one. Non absorbable. Non absorbable. You use dual, di, di, bilateral or unilateral is enough? Ma'am, unilateral is enough. So, what are the disadvantages of a sacrospinous fixation? If you use unilateral, sometimes they say that the vaginal axis can be deviated to uh, one side. Deviated. Right? So uh, now you are doing the uh, vaginal procedure. You are doing the anterior repair and suddenly urine comes out. Okay. So what do you think yes, has happened? You are doing an anterior repair. You are doing a cystocele yes, repair. You, know? you said, nah, I will do a cystocele anterior colporarty. Yes, I will do. So while doing your anterior colporarty. There can be my bladder injury. Okay. So what, what can you do to prevent this? Man, uh, immediate cystoscopy. No. What can you do to prevent a rent? So in other words, what surgical principles you follow to ensure... <laughs> Some yeah. Can you tell me three, four steps which you make sure while you're starting the vaginal okay. sometimes you can do the vaginal you can do the sounding, sounding of the bladder? Yes? Mm. You yes, can sound the bladder and see its lower limit? Yes. yes uh, what is the other method? Give me two, three more methods to safeguard the bladder to prevent a bladder injury during a cystocele repair. Ma'am, we can uh, do a saline infiltration so we can separate the bladder easily and we can use an anterior vaginal wall retractor to retract the bladder. Okay. Any other method which you can use so that you are reasonably comfortable? 
you can fill the bladder what is the, what is the demarcation that where will you put a incision and uh, when you want to separate the bladder <coughs> sorry bladder surface bladder surface what is the bladder surface now tell me what are the three sulci you see? You have just started a vaginal. Name the three sulci on the anterior Some vaginal wall. We can see yeah. a transverse vaginal sulcus at the bladder neck. That is a boundary between the cystocele and urethrocele. Very good. One is a subneatal sulcus just below the, uh, mm -hmm. just above the urethral uh, meatus. Below the urethral meatus. Okay. Below the below the urethra. And the one is a uh, bladder sulcus. Where is that located? Um, it is at the site of anterior wall attached anterior vaginal wall attachment to the cervix. Right. So it's very important. That's what I'm saying. You can use a bladder sound and put the okay. sound in the bladder and then see the distal most point of the sound and pulpit and put that as madam okay. has asked where the incision will be put. That incision should be put just below that level About so that you don't cut, you don't cut into the bladder. The bladder. My right, right. So what other, what other name? One more uh, tip and trick, if I were to say tip and trick to avoid bladder injury. Should you use blunt dissection or sharp dissection? Dissection. Always a sharp dissection. Sharp dissection, yes. Sir. Yeah, because blunt dissection, you may not go to the proper plane. Okay. <clears throat> yes, Similarly, okay. for posterior rectocel repair, what are the uh, tips and tricks to open to avoid opening the rectum when you are putting the incision, the posterior uh, colpotomy incision? Some tip and trick you can share with our students and us, which you have seen your seniors doing. And again, hydro, uh, hydro dissection and uh, hydro dissection and sharp dissection and retracting the posterior vaginal, retracting the posterior vaginal wall with the speculum properly. With the same speculum, and the posterior lip of the cervix can be pulled up. Yes, sir. And what else? One more method. Ma'am, uh, one finger can be kept in uh, uh, a rectum. One finger can be kept in a, a yeah. assistant one finger can be kept in the rectum while the surgeon is dissecting the right. And sometimes they say sometimes if you are suspecting endometriosis, you can put in a laparoscope. Isn't it so? In case there are adhesions, pouch of Douglas is obliterated. That is only if you suspect endometriosis in PV, it's a fixed uterus. You can use a laparoscope to assist you. Isn't it? To open the pouch of Douglas, now when we are doing the hysterectomy, you know, where do you think uh, you can uh, put an incision on the posterior uh, vaginal wall so that you exactly. enter the pouch of Douglas? Exactly. Very good question. See, we have put a circular incision or you can make it inverted T on anterior. Inverted T incision. Yeah. Posteriorly, where will you put the incision? How do you demarcate that if you incise there, okay, <laughs> that you will enter the pouch of the glass? Because sometimes we find it difficult also. And suppose if you are not able to open the pouch of Douglas, how do you proceed? Can you proceed with uh, ligation or uh, clamping the McIndoe's and neurosacrals and then try to open? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know the answer. Just madam has given you very big hint. Yes. So you can, yeah. if you are not able to open, you can clamp the uterosacrals, okay? <coughs> and then you can. So you have to always demarcate the uterosacral ligaments and above that you have to go and you can just put your finger there and you can find that your finger is sliding between the peritoneum and the uterine wall. So exactly, you know, you have that uh, 
uh, sliding of the peritoneum there. So there you catch with alice and open. So you will enter the pouch of the glass. Otherwise you will go on digging and you can damage the rectum. So that is uh, also one of the tricks. Okay. And where do you find uh, these cases where you will find difficulty? In uh, any uh, changes happening in the cervix? Where you will find difficulty in opening the pouch of the glass? What are the changes in the cervix in prolapse? Yes, Nikita, Khadija? Then there can be decubitus ulcer. Um, yes. And uh, there could be hypertrophy, cervical hypertrophy. Yes, yes. Okay. Then? Yes, hypertrophy, pigmentation, then keratinization, anything else? Madam was mentioning about, uh, you know, looking at the total vaginal length and the it's C the point. Huh? And infra elongation. Not infra. Here in prolapse, in younger age, there could be supravaginal. It's supravaginal. Supravaginal elongation. Okay. And then you can... may find, yeah, difficulty. So cervical elongation also can happen. Okay. Technical difficulty. And as Madam has said, that pouch posteriorly you can open with palpation. Supposing you are you have opened the posterior pouch, anterior you cannot open because of the huge supravaginal elongation. You just keep clamp, 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 and you just don't reach the UV fold. So is there any trick you can use? Supposing you are a surgeon with very long fingers. Can you tell me a trick you can use to approach the anterior? Anterior pouch is not opening, posterior is open, and you are a surgeon with long fingers. Can you can you uh, help yourself find the anterior pouch? And we can, and we can reach fundus from posterior. How can you fund. reach fundus? And we can try to. You have, opened, the finger. You have opened no posteriorly. Yes, you can find your fingers. Yeah, mm -hmm. we can put the fingers and we can reach till the fundus and then. You can start clamps. Yeah, you can try to antivert the uterus. Then you have the bulge anteriorly. Then you can push against the resistors. You know now where is the peritoneum. Okay. Or if you have not cut the fascia properly, you can still take the hell sharp dissection and then you can push. Okay, because sometimes opening anterior pouch also is difficult. Yeah. So, madam had asked you that the urine has leaked out. So, what will you do now? You are doing a cystocele, the, there is an injury to the bladder. Usually it will be a small opening, no? It need not be very big. So can, uh, can be, uh, yeah, correct it. We can suture it in double, uh, two layers. Yeah, we can do that, okay. But and before you put the stitch, uh, ma'am, can you do something to make sure you have made only one nick and not two, three nicks? Ma'am, we do? can uh, do the bladder testing with uh, methylene blue to Yes, see. so you can see the leak. And leak. one more thing, one more thing, when you are doing the repair, after repair, do cystoscopy to make sure that there is sure no that, uh, ure uh, ureteric injury, yes. Ureteric injury. If, if, if you have done a ureteric, say the trigone, you have while pushing the bladder, say you were not using sharp, you have used a peanut to push the bladder and you have injured the ureteric, uh, the trigone Ureter. area, then when you put methylene blue, there will be no leak. leak it's only right. on cystoscopy, you can find out it's a urethral mm -hmm. trigonal injury. In such cases, mm -hmm. you put a DJ stent and leave it there. Right? Yes, ma'am. So now this patient you said had atrophic vulva vagina. So I think we should have addressed, asked you this question before. Before preparing for vaginal hysterectomy, what are the yes, strategies sir. you can use to appropriately prepare either. the vagina? If there is an ulcer A, if there is a very atrophic vulva and vagina, what are the strategies you can evolve? Come for atrophic. Yes, for atrophic evolve. vagina, ma'am, uh, we can uh, go for uh, primarine cream and. Uh, How many days prior to the surgery do you give primarine cream? 
I'm at least uh, one month. If you have used estrogen cream for one month, okay, what precautions you will have to take if when you are planning for a surgery? Would you like to wait or uh, immediately if you operate, what problems you can face during surgery? We can have bleeding. Uh, there could be chances of more bleeding. Yeah, there could be chances. So you will have to wait at least wait. for one week after you stop uh, the local application. And Bring that in. Uh, and in fact, sometimes and we find that one month is too long, even if hmm. you use it for three to five days, or two. that is more than okay. enough because if you use too much, also you encounter too much of bleeding. It's a very oozy, uh, you know, because of the vascularity, it comes up. So you have uh, the for uh, atrophic, you are treated. Now there's a huge decubitus ulcer. It is a neglected prolapse. Then and we can go for the acriflavin uh, uh, glycerin packing. We can do what is the action of acriflavin and what is the action of glycerin? And glycerin is a specific uh, agent, okay. And acriflavin, uh, it is an anti inflammatory antiseptic. So, how many times you antiseptic? Now, uh, we can go for twice daily. Yes, for and the, preferably the, admit the, the patient. You can, you know, preferably and do the, the patient. Do the packing yourself. The surgeon should Self, do it. Yes. And in fact, it's not a bad idea to put a fully catheter also for a couple of days so yes. that, you know... Uh, it doesn't fall out when yeah. she goes... Yeah. Uh, yes. Goes, yeah. yes. Uh, I think I would time, this time surgery, is... what post-operative complications can happen? Then there can be uh, um, uh, collection... Good. Yes. Is that there can be a, a early post op complication? Can be uh, there can be a hemorrhage post operative or there can be a urinary retention. Patient can complain of. Operatively, what hemorrhage and what do you do to prevent? Ma'am, slippage of. Uh, uh, we do a vaginal packing, uh, and there can be a slippage of ligature also. No, so we have to take. Ligature is not so common. What do you do at the end of surgery? You do the packing, no? We the pack the, We do the packing. Prevent, uh, which type of hemorrhage? Because you have separated the vagina. You have used, uh, sometimes you add, add adrenaline also to the normal saline. So postoperatively, there could be reactionary hemorrhage. Right. No? Reactionary yeah, hemorrhage. The, the can so you, that is why the reason is you pack the vagina. Slippage of ligatures, yeah, with all due precautions, you should be doing. Okay, then any other? Yes, ma'am. Some urinary retention can patient complain of. Paralytic so how, many, how many days you put catheter? How many days will you put catheter? Ma'am, for 48 to, 70 to, 48 to 72 hours. And when you remove the catheter, should you give something to the patient, some advice you give to the patient? Or you just remove and take discharge her? No, ma'am. Uh, we uh, uh, we can start urotone. Okay, one is urotone and any anything bladder drill. You have heard of bladder post, drill. Post, uh, we can explain to patient the bladder drill that every yes. two hours she can go and pass the urine, and we can also check for the post void urine. Yeah, you can tell her voiding uh, every maybe every three hourly, hour. then every four hourly. And once she is evacuated, you can even check the post void residual urine. So, what is the significant post void residual urine? How much it is when you say, oh, it is significant? 100 ml, more than 100 ml. Uh, 100 ml, but these are menopausal ladies. So, sometimes we say more than 10% of the bladder volume. In an old lady, it may okay. be just 3, 400. So, for her, even 30 ml, 40 ml. Yeah, even 30 so roughly 10%, 10 of bladder volume. Right. Can you tell once the patient is shifted to the ward, okay, and she That's has fine. severe loin pain, left side loin pain. <laughs> she has severe left side loin pain. You have just done it and maybe two hours, three hours, the sister says, I am going to shift the patient to the room, but doctor, please see, she has severe loin pain in the left side. <laughs> what do you think you have done? No, you've got an ultrasound. I will give you a hint. You've got an ultrasound in your post op model. Where will you put that ultrasound? One CVS to look for any uh, what must pelvic collection. What must have happened? It is a classic left 
flank pain. It is not a pain in the tummy. She is having left flank pain. What do you think you have done? And where will you put the probe immediately? Flank pain. Ma'am, it could be uretric injury. So, so what will the ultrasound say? There will be a pelvic collection. Yes. You take her back to OT, open all the stitches. Okay, and I think our time's up. So I think Dr. Sheila, thank you so much. <laughs> it was a wonderful, though we have to extract some information, but overall they have, I think they have read and now with this, they will read more. Only one last so, question. Now I will ask you about ureteric, uh, either you have ligated, most probably it is ligation. Okay, sometimes when they get the pain. So tell me at what okay. step of surgery this complication can happen? Um, yeah. A long-standing prolapse the patient has. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, you try cardinal ligament. Yes, even cardinal ligament. You know, because the ureters come down with the prolapse. The bladder is descending. The ureters are getting kinked. So, it can come down. Okay? And when you are clamping the macandrots also, the ureter. Usually, uterine uh, ureteric injury with vaginal surgery is rare with prolapse. Okay? Yeah. The ureter. But you see the yeah. knee, that is called the knee of the ureter. So that knee of the ureter comes bang into the macken rods when it is under the tunnel. And that gets elongated, especially as I said, with the supravaginal elongations. You see, infravaginal elongation surgery is a very easy surgery to do. Because it's just above the fold, you give the sarcomoral and your bladder fold is there. But here, because of the supravaginal elongation, you by the time you reach, you have clamped, clamped the macken rods, you have clamped part of the ureter. So the knee of the ureter is right. So thank you very much, Dr. Sheila, ma'am. Thank you so much. So much. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And thank you, Priyanka, and sorry, thank you so much for giving your valuable time. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. Sheila, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. It was nice interacting with you, Dr. Geeta. Yeah. Same, madam. Same. Same here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now let's pro proceed forward and uh, Dr. Bhavani ma'am will proceed uh, with the next session. Thank you to all the speakers and moderators of this session for a very informative uh, session. Now we shall begin with our next session and the first lecture is on table viva for endoscopic instruments. Uh, for this, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Punita Bhardwaj, ma'am, Senior Consultant and Unit Head of uh, Endoscopy and Robotic Surgery, Sagangaram Hospital. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bhavani. I think we'll go straight to the um, instruments. Mr. Alo, can you run the PowerPoint for me, please? Okay, so what is this? This is supposed to be the Floatron. Floatron is a DVT pump, basically a DVT prevention pump. It should be applied to all cases where you give a patient a lithotomy position and the, uh, the uh, surgery is going to last more than 45 minutes. Pelvic surgery lasting for more than 45 minutes. Next, please. So that is uh, how the pump is applied. The uh, cuffs are there on the, uh, the calf uh, and you connect it to the pressure pump and you uh, press it on uh, before you start the positioning of the patient. Next, please. So these are the stirrups. Stirrups are uh, elevators which position your uh, patient and you should be able to identify them. You should be able to know why they are supposed to be like this. Basic idea is to have the positioning of the patient in such a way that you don't uh, have any neuropathic injuries or any pressure injuries. Next, please. This is the NIBP monitor, which is very important in pelvic surgeries. I'm just trying to zoom out and notice the 100% uh, saturation. Below that, you have the ETCO2 monitor. The ETCO2 is a good indication of the in, uh, ventilation of the patient. And it is important to keep it in check. That's all you need to know about the monitor. Of course, it's giving you the pulse, the BP, the oxygen saturation, and the respiration. Next, please. So that's the whole cart, the, uh, the instrument cart with the monitor on the top. 
and the insufflator and the recorder and the camera uh, below, followed by the uh, histroflator and the uh, electricity power diffuser. Next. That's the monitor. It is a 2D monitor. You also have 3D and 4D these days, but by and large, we have the 2D monitor. Next, please. That is the camera, the three chip camera that we use routinely. Initially, we were having a double chip and a single chip camera, but lately, most of the ATs are, OTs are equipped with three chip camera. Next, please. So that's the recorder and the camera uh, base. Next, please. Very important. This is the Viri's needle. I have kept both the disposable and the non-disposable one. You see a red ball on the disposable and you see a green collar uh, of the disposable uh, needle. The metal needle is the non-disposable one and we autoclave that. We uh, do a ET, ETO uh, sterilization for the disposable uh, Viri's needle. You need to know the diameters, the length of the needle and that the needle has an eye at the bottom. Next, please. That's the eye. The red arrow is showing you the eye from where the gas gets into the intra-abdomen. And this has a spring-like mechanism. You need to understand that, that once you push that round area goes in and the sharp edge, which cuts through the rectus and the peritoneum, comes out. This is a safety mechanism, the spring mechanism, which should be working in all disposable and non-disposable before you start the surgery. Next, please. That's the gas insufflator and you see the monitor. You have the pressures, the absolute uh, pressure that you, intra-abdominal pressure that you set. Uh, the middle uh, portion shows you the, that is the set pressure, 14, and this is the intra-abdominal pressure. And the last uh, segment that is showing 40 is the absolute volume of the gas that has gone in. And the, on the right side is where you insert the tubing. Uh, that's the tubing that we show and you sh should see the connector the steel connector which sits on the and fits onto the Viri's needle. Next, please. Uh, that's the laparoscope with the light cord. Next, please. Uh, the red uh, arrow is showing you the wedging, the 30 degree scope. That means when you have the light cord at the 12 o'clock position, you're seeing the um, six o'clock area. So you need to understand the mechanism of a 30 degree camera. You have a zero degree and a 30 degree. A lot of people prefer a zero degree only, but 30 degree gives you an advantage of angulation where you can go and maneuver deep recesses where zero degree becomes difficult. Next, please. That's the light source. The red arrow shows where uh, the light cord fixes and the yellow arrow shows where you can change the intensity of the uh, light intra-abdominally. Next, please. That's the trocar. It's a disposable trocar. Uh, you see that, uh, which is autoclaved. Disposable trocars, nowadays, a lot of people are using non-disposable ones. This is a pyramidal shape uh, trocar. You see the red arrow, which is showing you the pyramid, uh, which cuts through the rectus and the peritoneum. And that is the valve, which opens and shuts. And this is the trumpet uh, valve. The yellow uh, arrow is showing you the trumpet valve. That is the trocar, the one lying below. And uh, the one having the trumpet and the valve is the cannula. So you should identify what is the trocar and what is the cannula. And what is the mechanism of the valve? How does it open? Next, please. These are the disposable trocars. Uh, the red arrow is showing you the self-retaining um, rings so to say, so that the trocar doesn't slip out. When you're taking out the instrument or putting in the instrument, the trocar doesn't change position. And uh, the blue arrow shows you the pyramidal non-cutting uh, base. The yellow one is showing you the cutting uh, trocar. So this is the cannula on top. The lowermost where the yellow arrow is is the um, trocar. And it has valve. The pink ones are the valves at the top. You should be able to basically identify them. And these are all 10 mm uh, trocar cannulas. The lower one is the 5 mm self-retaining, non-disposable uh, trocar. The, the blue one with the pink valves is the, doesn't have the rings, the self-retaining rings, so to say. So if your incision is too loose or too tight, it tends to slip out. Next, please. So the same thing, 
in magnification can you appreciate the uh, cutting trochar cannula which is the yellow arrow and the red arrow is the non cutting uh, trochar next please this is the uterine ele elevator which has uh, a grip which is the red arrow the yellow arrow shows you the screw which uh, moves on to the uh, base uh, the black uh, sleeve so to say so the screw is on a sleeve which can be moved up and down depending on the uterus cervical length and the blue uh, arrow shows you the bulb which is fits into the vagina over the uh, white bulb that you see this cup that is the uh, which is lying separately the green cup goes into the elevator uh, sleeve and fits into the cervix and you can change the uterus cervical length with this yellow uh, screw area next please these are the hand instruments and the blue arrow shows you the uh, tip which can be changed the inserts they are inserts which can be changed the black uh, body is the sleeve uh, which has the insulation and the red uh, arrow uh, shows you the handle which is which can be locked and there are others which need not be locked the locking ones usually are the uh, tooth forceps or whatever uh, you want to give atraumatic uh, forceps usually are not non locking next please so these are the handles i'm just trying to show you how how these handles look like and how the grip fits in you see uh, the holes are for your fingers and the anterior area is for the four fingers and these are the maryland the tooth forceps and the flat uh, forceps inserts can be variable next please so these are the uh, various inserts you have this is the first two on the top are the uh, 10 mm top one is the duals uh, atraumatic grasper 10 mm the red arrow and the yellow arrow is the tenaculum which has a pincer like grip works very well in myomectomies then the lowermost one is the myoma screw it has rings and it has a sharp pointer which screws into the myoma and helps you to <clears throat> retract the myoma next please so the same in a magnified view you see the rings which can be screwed into the myoma and when you are taking it out you have to screw it out these are on the top is the bases of the handles the uh, grip is like the other inserts only the myoma screw grip is a little different which is cylindrical and you can grasp it well next please this is the irrigation suction cannula the lower one uh, is the uh, regular one that you have with the, with the holes at the lower end uh, you can appreciate the holes there which works as a very uh, good uh, atraumatic uh, dissector and the upper one is a trumpet valve it has a the yellow one the yellow pointer is a trumpet valve uh, what you see is the suction is connected uh, to the topmost area and the irrigation is connected to the lower uh, area so uh, suction and irrigation both uh, can be done uh, with this next please this is a magnified view of the trumpet valve uh, suction irrigation and the regular suction irrigation the uh, the connection the direct connection of the uh, suction is connected to the suction and the lower uh, um, vertical uh, connection is the irrigation then you have these holes at the bottom which allows the suction to be pulled in next please so this is the needle holder this is uh, the stores needle holder which has a grip and a uh, this is a lock the yellow area is pointing to the lock and this is the grip it has a uh, wedge wedge there which fits the needle there and gri grips the needle without letting it slip so you need to fix the needle there and hold it and once you lock it the needle should not move if the grip uh, weakens that means if the uh, the grip weakens then they or needle tends to move when you take a bite so that needle holder is a goner next please these are the disposable scissors uh, 5 mm disposable scissors and the red uh, uh, area the red cap that you see on the top here is for the insertion of the uh, uh, electricity port so you can use electricity with the scissors although your scissors get spoiled by using electricity directly with the scissors uh, and that's the the lower area is showing you the 
tip of the scissors. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. Hello, Mr. Alok. That's the energy sources. Thank you. Uh, the topmost one is the, or we start with the lower one, the bipolar. That's the bipolar on the lowermost, the harmonic. These are basically uh, ultrasonic instruments and uh, uh, it converts the ultrasonic energy into uh, heat energy. Next, please. So these are the tip of the, the red arrow is showing you the bipolar. It has insulation so that the only the area between the jaws is uh, grasped and uh, is coagulated and the area around it gets only the lateral spread, which is little with advanced bipolars. The yellow is uh, the harmonic tip, which is showing you the black um, jaw and the upper jaw. The upper jaw is inactive. That means it doesn't get heated. In, in, it insulates the areas. And the lower jaw is the one which moves 55,000 cycles per second, uh, megahertz. And uh, this is the area which uh, doesn't go circular. It goes horizontal. You'll be surprised. Nobody notices it day-to-day -day working, but it goes horizontal. And that's the one that gets heated. Don't uh, be lulled into a fact that uh, harmonic doesn't have a lateral spread. It does heat up. Try touching it once you do a surgery. It is hot. So be careful. The lateral spread is minimal or minimized as compared to bipolar, but it is not zero. And as it's a disposable instrument, if you uh, repeatedly use it, then it tends to heat up further. So your insulations and your heating uh, ideal conditions don't uh, work when you're using the instrument repeatedly. And that's the advanced bipolar on the top. Uh, the lateral spread again is uh, minimal, so to say they say. Uh, and uh, the area between the, the tissue between the jaws gets heated up. So these are advanced instruments and uh, they are expensive. They are supposed to be disposable, but uh, Indians use them repeatedly. Uh, but the point is that you need to know the functioning, how they work, and uh, what is the drawback of each. And the cost is a factor. So if you know how to use your bipolar well, you don't really require other sources. But uh, harmonic and uh, advanced bipolar do give an advantage of lateral spread, uh, reduce lateral spread. Next, please. So that's your uh, base uh, of the... Uh, harmonic on top and lower one is the cautery which fits in monopolar, bipolar and the advanced bipolar. Next, please. These are the smoke filters which we use to prevent the intra-abdominal smoke to get into the OT to prevent uh, pollution, so to say, of the OT. Basically, the intra-abdominal smoke is uh, toxic. Is, uh, toxic and people who are doing this uh, these cases repeatedly uh, are exposed. So it's a good idea to use these smoke filters. Next, please. These are disposable smoke filters. Morselator was in a lot of uh, controversy very recently, uh, but you need to know what a morselator is and how to use it judiciously. These are the parts of the morselator. This is the store's morselator. And um, you see the power cord with the power motor, the cord with the motor. And these are the inserts which go in uh, to the intra abdominally. These is this is the whole set of the morselator. Next, please. Uh, this is the morselator uh, going in. Uh, what you see is this is the valve, and this is the obturator coming in. The round area, the red arrow that you see, is the um, obturator coming in when you are inserting it into the uh, intra abdominally. Next, please. Uh, that's the whole morselator, uh, which is uh, formed. This is the uh, the round area is the obturator. This is the sharp blade. That's the motor area and the cord. Next, please. You have different types of morselator. The one I'm showing is not the only one. Uh, although stores and Johnson and Johnson have stopped uh, uh, making the morselators anymore because of the controversy of uh, doing a sarcoma with a morselator which spread and caused the death of the patient. But you have to use uh, bags. Intra-abdominal uh, intra morselation can be done using endo bags. Next, please. 
These are the morselator bags. Next, please. And these are the specimen retrieval bag, or so to say, the endo bag. They come pre-contained uh, in a cylinder, and you can easily pass it through the cannula. You can roll these up and pass through our atraumatic uh, grasper into the uh, abdomen. Next, please. Uh, these are the port closer uh, instruments. And uh, the first is a port closure needle. You see it is a shoemaker's needle. The red arrow is showing you the tip. Uh, there's a sharp tip there and there is a blunt uh, rectangular uh, uh, blade which grasps the uh, suture and pushes it uh, into the abdomen. And the lower one is the uh, port closure, uh, that means the skin closure, staples, which closes the skin. Skin can be closed with a lot of uh, things and staples is one of them. Next, please. So this is the monopolar needle. We use it for polycystic ovaries or uh, other. And this has a retrievable uh, pointer, uh, which works for monopolar needle. Quiet, please. And it can, it uh, when you press the handles, that's the handle, which has a spring mechanism. When you push these uh, things together, the needle comes out and you can use it. Of course, the drilling is going out of vogue these days and you use wherever you use it, use it very judiciously. Next, please. Next, please. Yeah, so that's the blade, the 11 number blade, which is used for incision making. And I think that's about it. Next, please. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. I hope uh, it covers your basic requirement for a clearance of the DNB examination. Any questions you have? I think I still have about five minutes. Any questions? Bhavani. Dr. Bhavani. Yes, ma'am. Punita, I think they, they know everything and <laughs> that is why they are not asking any question. <laughs> yes, okay. So just identification is the idea and uh, the uh, idea... The uses, is yeah. To usage, basic usage you should know. Uh, that means the examiner doesn't want you to be an expert in it. Uh, the hysteroscopy instruments were not covered in this because our time was only half an hour and I could barely... Uh, go through the laparoscopic work and we can put the hysteroscopic instruments uh, in other modalities or Dr. Mala uh, can do the needful. Ma'am, there and, is a question on uh, uh, what is the difference between endo bag and morselator bag? See, endo bag is a regular bag that you use to retrieve uh, any um, biopsy that you've taken which you don't want to contaminate the port site. Right, so that's an endo bag. And a morselator bag is specific to fibroids or uh, uh, it's a sturdier bag. It's a bigger bag, which is um, um, which is used in a different manner uh, during morselations. So that's a morselator bag. And it has it is a, you know, like a stomach shape, which a large opening, which you push in, which is already preloaded. It comes preloaded and you put it through the 10 mm uh, uh, car, uh, and then you the trocar is taken out and it is directly put in through the incision site. And then it is unrolled in the abdomen. I don't think you are going that way in a DNB. Uh, nobody is going to ask you the functioning of a morselator bag. So long as you know why it is used and uh, what is the advantages. The advantage is that you don't expose the fibroid outside into the abdomen. So by chance, if you are morselating a sarcoma, you don't spread it out in the abdomen and you don't upstage the disease. The idea of an uh, morselator bag is to contain the disease, whatever it is. Although I have, it, there is, uh, I have my doubts about the uh, isolation of the specimen because when you are enucleating, you are already contaminating the intra-abdominal cavity uh, with it. So my reservations are with the morselator bag. But anyways, that's my personal opinion. What you should know is that uh, basic idea is to contain the uh, diseased uh, organ. Uh, in in such cases, the fibroid. So that is a morselator bag. And endo bag is any bag, any specimen that you want to retrieve out uh, in a laparoscopic uh, case without contaminating uh, around the abdominal cavity or the incision site. Another question is, uh, what is the extent of lateral spread with bipolar, ligature, and harmonic? And which is yeah. 
minimal. It depends upon what uh, instrument you're using. Bipolar. If you keep pressing the uh, pedal, it can go one centimeter. In fact, it can go two centimeter, and you can also jump the uh, arc because your your resistance. Once the tissue is uh, cauterized. Uh, if you keep on pressing the pedal, the tissue refuses to take in the current and that current jumps out and where it goes, you don't know. So in a bipolar where you continuously press the pedal, the lateral spread can be very, very much more than one centimeter. In a harmonic, they say about one to two millimeters. But again, uh, how you're using the instrument, how long you're using the instrument and how many times you've used that instrument. So the like I was mentioning even in the lecture that the ideal time is uh, ideal uh, instrument usage is when it is it is a disposable instrument that you just press it uh, gently and it is being used for only one time. So about two millimeters and uh, advanced bipolars even less than that. And uh, ligature. Somebody said ligature. There's a question again. Can you take that Bhavani? Ma'am, uh, she meant ligature. Sure. She yeah, I think about ligature. Ligature. I didn't want to name a particular instrument, but advanced bipolar is ligature. So ligature is again uh, between the bipolar and the harmonic. I, I I think it is about three millimeters, two to three millimeters. Anything else? No, ma'am. No other questions. All right then. I think uh, my time is just about one minute more. Um, anything else? Hysteroscopy, uh, we can cover sometimes else because uh, everything couldn't be covered in one lecture in half an hour. Well, all right then. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am, for this Kamala for having me. And I hope this uh, suffices for the DNB exam at least. It's not an advanced class. It's a basic class to uh, make you aware of these instrument usage and uh, and the problems associated. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now, moving on to the next lecture on OSCE, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Geeta Mendi Ratta, ma'am. She is a co chairperson and senior consultant, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Sagangaram Hospital. And uh, Dr. Mamta Dagar, ma'am, senior consultant. Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Saganga uh, Ram Hospital, and uh, Dr. Chandra Mansukhani, ma'am. She is Vice Chairperson and Senior Consultant, Department of Obst and Gynecology, Saganga Ram Hospital. So, thank you, Bhavani. Thanks for the kind introduction. So, I will start uh, sharing my screen. Can you see it? Hello? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Thank you. So, uh, good morning uh, uh, to all of you and welcome to this session. All the, all the attendees who have joined this session since morning. So, we will be taking you through the OSCE case-based discussion, which is uh, still uh, an, a very important and integral part of your DNB examination, DNB practical examination, and is very scoring if you know it. So how it goes is this will be done by me along with Dr. Geeta Mediratta and Dr. Chandra Mansukhani, and in part. So uh, what you get it in the OSCE uh, in the DNB practical exam is that you are sort of given uh, shown some images or uh, some pictures or some case based case scenario and based on which you are asked questions in parts. So it has two, three parts. So likewise, we will be taking you through this. Yeah. So I move further. So it is like that you will be basically be given some images to identify and then uh, you will be asked uh, questions based on that. So you have seen this image. And uh, now the question may be that uh, identify this and label the arrows in image. And the next part is, what is the tissue basis of acetobitness and after acetic acid application and iodine negative uptake 
after Lagol's added in application. So sometimes if you have not picked up your uh, sort of uh, the, the, what it is, maybe the second question guides you as to what has been shown to you. So if we go to the part one of the question, identify and label the arrows in the image, you very well know that these are the, uh, those who do not know, these are the colposcopic images uh, of cervix. And uh, this is, uh, you know, when we do a colposcopy, uh, we first uh, visualize it, uh, the cervix after application of uh, normal saline and naked eye, and then uh, then after application of normal saline, and then we apply acetic acid, we, we put green filter, and then we apply acetic acid, see it, this is reversed. This is basically after acetic acid with green filter, and this is after acetic acid, and then we apply Lugol's iodine, and we form an opinion. So uh, uh, before I move further, just a basic information I would like to give you uh, because this is not your final OSCE and uh, it's better uh, for the purpose of teaching that colposcope is a stereoscopic low power microscope, which is uh, used to visualize the cervix and lower genital tract of vagina and vulva and helps in detecting the abnormal lesions and uh, helps in assessing its severity, sight and guides her for taking the biopsy. So the common indications for doing the colposcopy are the abnormal uh, cervical cancer screening results, be it abnormal pap such as ESCUS, SH, LCL, HCL, or uh, positive HPV test results, or in women with positive via and bili findings, that is positive uh, visual inspector inspection of acetic acid and uh, positive villi. So these are the basic indications. So in this, we basically have asked you what this arrows and this uh, lines are indicating. So if we look at this uh, image, yeah, these are basically the normal colposcopic findings. You know that uh, uh, cervix, uh, the ecto cervix, which we are seeing here is basically, uh, is appears pinkish in appearance. So it is basically the original squamous uh, epithelium or the ectocervix, which has a smooth pink appearance because uh, it doesn't change after application of acetic acid and uh, because it's multi-layered and it has uh, it's it has a multi layers of flattened uh, epithelium, which ap in which there is an absence of uh, sort of a nuclear or chromatin material, which makes it smooth because the light is reflected back. So, so this is absolutely a normal colposcopic findings in which you can see the Nebothian cyst here and you can see some blood vessel and a squamocolumnar junction, which is marked by the blue line. What is squamocolumnar junction is the junction where the squamous epithelium, pinkish squamous epithelium is meeting the reddish or the more vascular columnar epithelium. This is squamocolumnar junction. This is Nebothian cyst and this is a normal blood vessel. So these are the absolutely normal colposcopic findings. So this is the first part of this question. And next question, which has been asked, you asked that what is the tissue basis for acetovitinous and Lugol's iodine area? We know that uh, first coming down to the acetovitinous, the tissue basis of acetovitinous is that uh, the normal, uh, as I said, the normal squamous epithelium has multi-layered of epithelium and the chromatin material is hardly any in the super uh, facial layers uh, and there is or there is a pycnotic nucleus so because the chromatin material is less so the coagulation is not there of acetic acid and hence when the light is reflected back it is reflected back in entirely in entirety but if there is due to uh, cin or due to the presence of pre malignance or malignant uh, transformation uh, because there is an increased nucleocytoplasmic ratio, there is an increased nuclear proteins and this acetic acid coagulates uh, this nuclear proteins and hence acetovite, uh, uh, the light is basically is not reflected back. There is, uh, it's, it's not correct. It is not reflected back and it appears as opalescent and hence acetovitinous is the basis for increase uh, uh, is the basis of these cells with increased NC ratio. Coming down to the iodine negative uh, part, that uh, what is the tissue basis for Lugol's iodine negative area? We know that uh, the CIN or the malignant cells, as well as the columnar epithelium, they uh, lack glycogen. 
and it is the glycogen due to which there is a mahogany brown color uh, which is imparted to the cervix. So if we go to the previous image, uh, this entire cervix is uh, different than this lesion, which is a small lesion. So basically this dark mahogany brown color is the one which is there because of the glycogen. And if there is some uh, uh, dysplasia or some uh, altered nucleocytoplasmic ratio the cells are having in this area, so the Lugol's iodine uptake doesn't occur. So this is the basis for uh, acetovitness and iodine negative uptake. I hope it is uh, clear to you. So we will be moving moving further. So this may be asked uh, to you uh, in the exam because you shall be knowing how to interpret the colposcopic images. Coming down to the next part, uh, uh, the question will be basically first a picture will be shown to you like this. What is this? And like identify and enumerate its components. And the second part is when does the active stage of labor start? So in the exam, like I have given both the parts in one question in the exam you basically will be giving the step mostly be given the second part after you have answered the first so going back again to the picture you know very well now i think most of you must be knowing uh, must be using in your labor board that this is a who labor care guide and uh, which is the next generation partograph which has been introduced by who in 2018 and it was developed to improve the every woman's experience of childbirth and help ensure the health and well-being of the woman and their babies by facilitating the effective implementation of WHO intrapartum care recommendations. And uh, so the path identification is easy. This is a WHO LCG or a labor care guide, the, the, new gen, the next generation pathograph and enumerate its components. So it has seven components and that are the seven sections. So as you can see there, section one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you may be basically be asked to individually name what is section five or enumerate all the sections uh, uh, as a question. So if we basically go to the, uh, the answer of this, and when does the active uh, stage of the labor starts? The answer of this, uh, it basically uh, has seven sections. So I will be just uh, a bit highlighting about these seven sections because it's very important. The section one is uh, identifying the information and labor characteristics at admission. And what is what information basically should be entailed in that? So besides women's name, there are certain other labor uh, characteristics such as parity, mode of labor onset, uh, date of uh, active uh, labor diagnosis, date and time of rupture of membranes and risk factors, which should be uh, basically as an information be filled in this uh, section one. Coming down to the section two, which is supportive care, what does it mean? We know that uh, respectful maternity care or RMC which we are talking a lot about nowadays is a fundamental basically human right of pregnant women which who says and it is a core component of who uh, intrapartum care and it includes what this this supportive care includes this includes besides the labor companionship the presence of a partner or any other family members uh, with the woman during labor, the other features such as other components such as pain relief, be it pharmacological or non-pharmacological pain relief, then uh, presence, I mean, the supplementation with oral fluid intake and the techniques which are used to improve women's uh, and make the woman comfortable, such as mobilization and all. So this is, this all comes uh, in the section two, which is the supportive care, the section two. Coming down to the section three, which is care of the baby. What does it mean? Uh, it means that uh, the, the, the well-being of the baby is basically measured by regular observation of uh, uh, baby's baseline heart rate, presence of any decelerations uh, uh, in the fetal heart rate, then the noting the amniotic fluid color and all, and uh, when it has appeared then the fetal position and the presence of caput and molding. So this all comes in this uh, care of the baby. Then next section four is the care of woman. And uh, this section four, the care of the woman 
It includes the parameters such as regular observations of women's pulse, blood pressure, temperature, and the urine, uh, output and color of the urine and all during labor. Uh, coming down to the section five, this is where you are basically monitoring the progress of the labor. And uh, in section five, the labor progress basically is monitored. The aim is to encourage the intermittent monitoring of, of the basically uh, labor progress uh, and uh, this is by regular observation of frequency and uh, duration of contractions and measuring the cervical dilatation and descent of the baby's head. Then the section come seven is the medications and these medications may be oxytocin or other uh, medications uh, which, which, whichever they are being used in labor or uh, IV fluids which are used in labor. Section seven, very important section, again is the shared decision making and shared decision making means uh, that uh, basically it aims to facilitate the continuous uh, communication uh, with the woman and her companion uh, and consistent basically recording of uh, all these observations and assessment and the plans agreed uh, with the woman during labor. So this is this comes under the shared decision making. And so this basically completes the whole, all the seven components or the seven sec se sections of the labor care guide. Coming down to when does active stage of the labor start, we know nowadays as per the, uh, the now 2018 WHO uh, labor care partograph and the uh, labor care recommendations that the active phase of the labor starts at five centimeters of dilatation. And this is basically now that at five centimeters of dilatation that you are actually plotting the labor care guide, but not that you will not basically be looking at uh, uh, women because you are monitoring at five centimeter or the plotting at five centimeter you are basically going to attach this lcg performer as soon as the woman enters the labor ward however you are going to basically make all the entries but this uh, part which is the section five you are going to start when the woman attains five centimeters of dilatation one more thing basically i wanted to tell you that for all observations there is a x axis and a, yeah there is a y axis so what all you are basically be plotting for all observations the horizontal axis or the x axis basically this is for documentation of the corresponding time of observation and a vertical uh, basically reference value axis which is the vertical axis this is for any deviations from the normal and for second stage also the lcg provides a second stage section to continue the observations which are made during the first stage of the labor this is this con gets continued in section five so this you we basically now advocate uh, in our labor ward also and we have attached in our labor ward and should be basically component of all the labor care uh, all the labor wards and it should be basically exercised by all the healthcare providers whosoever are caring for women in labor be it any facility so we move further uh what is this will be asked to you uh, you have to see you know that you know it is a ctg so basically you are uh, Question will be like maybe that identify the type of CTG trace and is it pathological and cause? So if you see this CTG trace very carefully, you know that this woman is in labor because uh, both the cardio and the toco probes are attached and on the toco probe, there are regular contractions which are occurring, which you can make out. And in response to to these contractions on the cardio uh, probe, you are observing certain CTG changes. You know that this is a one centimeter per minute uh, uh, CTG uh, cardio tocograph, which is being standardized in our labor board. And it is being standardized in almost all of the labor boards in India. It is a nice recommendation. However, the in like uh, American, uh, ACOG may say that for studying the minor details, you may, uh, I mean, go and I mean, keep it at three centimeter per minute. But in most of the labor wards, we have one centimeter per minute. And you can see that this woman has basically a baseline heart rate, but however, she is accelerating and decelerating and she is decelerating at regular intervals. So these are the contractions she is decelerating. But there is a pickup. Now, this is a contraction. The the nadir of the contraction 
the with the peak of the contraction there is a nether of uh, deceleration you can see they are coinciding again with peak of contraction nether is coinciding again with the peak of the contraction nether is coinciding so there is a coincidence so the, these type of decelerations are they are what kind of decelerations are they they are early deceleration so these are the early decelerations in labor and uh, the second uh, question and how, why we call it early decelerations uh, the reason i have told you because uh, they are occurring with the the peak is coinciding with the neither the neither the neither of the deceleration is coinciding with the peak of the contractions so you have to know what the deceleration is basically to pick it up uh, decelerations is any fetal heart rate which is below the baseline uh, of more than 15 beats per minute in amplitude and lasting for more than 15 seconds which is there and uh, i do not know whether you have made it uh, but able to uh, make it or not because if it is one centimeter per minute the the pickup is occurs in probably less than 60 seconds only uh, to the baseline heart rate so these are the early decelerations these are the shallow decelerations basically they are short acting and are short lasting with normal variability within the deceleration and they are coincidental with contractions and they basically they are these pathological no they are not they are uh, believed to be caused by the fetal heart compressions and they do not indicate fetal hypoxia or acidosis and if they have these features and they are the fetal heart is returning to the normal baseline they are not associated with any fetal hypoxia and acidosis and do not require any fetal interventions during labor and they are considered to be the part of normal ctg not even suspicious forget about pathological pathological is when there are late decelerations or there are variable decelerations of more than 60 uh, minutes these are pathological so you have to know your ctg is normal uh, suspicious and pathological the but basically just to tell you these are the early decelerations do not require any any intervention intervention during labor and they are not associated with fetal hypoxia or, or acidosis so you should know and be able to identify the decelerations uh, next, this is, uh, it is a spot diagnosis and uh, in fact, very easy OSCE question for you. You can easily make out, this is a vial of uh, ferry carboxymaltose injection. And if you very carefully read, this is one gram in 20 ml or 500 uh, mg in 10 ml. And this is for IV injection or infusion and it is not to be refrigerated. And this is for so the question is, what is the indication for its use in pregnancy and how it is given? And what is Genzoni formula? So you know that indication is, of course, uh, for uh, treatment of anemia in pregnancy, moderate to severe anemia in pregnancy. But to mind you, this if the woman is not compliant and uh, is not tolerating oral iron, and but it is not to be used after 36 weeks of pregnancy because of in cases of severe anemia because of rise on uh, in hemoglobin will not be optimal and as well as in cases of severe anemia with CHF. So uh, next and how it is given is that uh, this one gram or thousand milligram or one of this vial is to be mixed with 250 ml of normal saline and is to be given in single dose infusion 15 minutes. You already had a class on anemia I think day before yesterday and you must have had this discussion about indications of uh, when to start oral iron and when to stop it and uh, what are the indications of IV iron. So I will not be going into the detail of it. Coming down to the next part of it, which is the Genzoni formula. There are various formulas. You need not strictly use this formula for calculation of uh, iron, how much is to be given, but this is just formula, which one of the formula you shall be knowing basically. So this is uh, uh, like how much iron is to be given. So here the total body iron deficit uh, in milligram is calculated by body weight in kg into target hemoglobin minus actual hemoglobin into a fact in grams per liter into a multiply with a factor of 0.24. This 0.24, how it has come, I will just let you know. And plus iron depot in mg. So let's, let's, uh, talk about this factor 0.24 uh, at the end. So you know what the body weight is. 
suppose it is 70 kg 70 you know the target hemoglobin minus actual hemoglobin target hemoglobin if you want to attain say suppose 15 if it is a western country and all from where it is taken then it is 150 and if it is actual hemoglobin is 8 it is minus 80 into 0.24 is the factor and 500 is for the depot and how this depot is taken is if the body weight is more than or equal to 35 kg then the iron depot 500 mg and if it is less than 35 kg it is 15 milligram per kg now coming down to this factor of 0.24 how it is calculated so basically this 0.24 is basically uh, you have to take uh, this uh, 0 0.0034 into 0 0.07 into 1000. This is basically uh, 0.34 percent is the actual iron content in hemoglobin. This multiplied with the 7 percent of body weight, which is uh, again 0 0.07, and 1000 is for conversion from gram to milligram. So that is how the factor 0.24 comes. This you need to basically memorize as a mathematics. So this is how the Ganzoni's formula is and how the how you have to calculate your, uh, how much iron you need to get. Coming down to my last question. Uh, uh, in a pregnant woman suffering from rheumat rheumatic heart disease with mitral stenosis, when vaginal delivery should not be allowed? And when is infective endocarditis prophylaxis indicated? So, uh, uh, you know that uh, a woman... All the heart disease women who are well compensated and all are not uh, basically the candidates for elective cesarean delivery. And there are certain situations when uh, vaginal delivery uh, may be conducted. But when vaginal delivery should not be conducted are in cases with critical MS, NYHE class 3 and 4, and in women with pulmonary edema. So in cases of RHD. So what is critical MS? You should know critical MS or the severe MS when the mitral valve area is less than one uh, centimeter per square. And uh, besides that, you sh this is in context to RHD, you shall be knowing the other indications for delivering the woman straight away for cesarean delivery in cases of heart disease. This is besides the point. These are the women when uh, woman is on oral anticoagulation with preterm labor, acute on chronic aortic di dissection, uh, cardiac failure in women with uh, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension, acid mangoes syndrome and all. Uh, coming down to the infective endocardic prophylaxis uh, that uh, when it is to be given and um, when it is indicated. When indicated, it is of course indicated in women of cardiac diseases um, in pregnancy, but nowadays as per ACC and AHA guidelines, not in all cardiac diseases, only in high-risk situations this infective endocarditis prophylaxis is indicated. And when indicated, it is to be given 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. And uh, they say not in all cardiac diseases for vaginal or cesarean delivery, only in complicated. But here sort of we draw a gray zone because we tend to give in all the women. So let's not have a debate on this right now here. But this is what the ACA, ACC and AHA is saying. And, uh, but you should know that when... Uh, when this, uh, what what should be given when you are giving infective endocarditis prophylaxis, this is, uh, you should remember ampicillin and gentamicin, or if the woman is allergic to penicillin, vancomycin and gentamicin, and the doses of ampicillin is 2 gram of ampicillin uh, plus 1.5 milligram per kg of gentamicin, which is ideally to be given 30 minutes prior to the procedure. And this is followed by ampicillin 2 gram 6 hourly later. And if she's allergic to ampicillin, then vancomycin is to be given. Uh, a word about the conditions for where the infective endocarditis prophylaxis is no longer indicate, indicated by AHAs. These are the women with NBP, women with RHT and other types of acquired valvular diseases, BSD, ASD, and hypertropic obstructive cardiomyopathy. While where the infective endocarditis is strongly recommended and should be given are the women with prosthetic heart valves, women with previous infective endocarditis, uh, uh, uncomplicated, uh, basically CHT with the previous cardiac shunts and uh, conduits, or women with repaired congenital heart diseases with uh, residual defects, or in women with cardiac transplants and all. So with this, I move further and uh, I would now request Dr. Chandra to take over for other OSCE cases discussions. 
Thank you, Dr. Mamta. So now we are moving to the another part of the OSCE questionnaire. And I'm going to discuss all the case scenarios. So first case scenario is she is a patient is priming gravida with 10 weeks pregnancy, which has been recently diagnosed with HIV positive on the routine blood test. So questions are here. The, what are the important points in the counseling of this couple? Because recently they, she's diagnosed with HIV positive. She doesn't, she was not aware about her status. And enumerate the maternal risk factors, which would increase the risk of the PTCT. And how frequently would you like to do the RNA copies and CD4 count during pregnancy? So coming to the uh, next, Dr. Mamta. Next, Dr. Mamta. Yeah. So coming to the, no, the first uh, previous one, Dr. Mamta Pri, yeah. So coming to the uh, answer of first uh, question. So we have to counsel the uh, this couple that they need, this patient would need the ART because we have to reduce the infection to the baby. So most important thing, she would need the ART and she has to take and she should be explained that the what are the chances of the infection to the baby with and without ART. And there is no role of the termination of pregnancy and HIV positive status is not an indication for termination. So they should be explained that there is no need, they should not panic and they can go ahead for the continuation of this pregnancy, but they have to take ART so that we can reduce the chances of the infection to the baby even up to one to 2%, even less than 1% when she's on ART throughout the pregnancy. And uh, But she should come for the regular antenatal checkup and institutional delivery should be explained because that is very, very important in this case. And need of the exclusive breastfeeding, especially in the uh, uh, low resource countries, because we are living in the India, this is low resource countries. So she should be explained that she can feed her baby also. So next, Dr. Mamta. Uh, so next, next answer, what are the important factors which would increase the chances of the uh, infection to the baby. So high maternal viral load, that is the most important thing. If patient's viral load is high, then there are higher chances of infection to the baby. And if mother is having the advanced clinical stage of the disease and concurrent STIs is also there, maternal malnutrition, that would also increase the chances of infection. And viral, bacterial and parasitic placental infection. So we have to take care of these factors when while dealing these type of the pregnancies. So, and now coming to the this thing, how frequently we should do the RNA copies and CD4 count during these type of the pregnancy. So whenever we start the ART or we are changing the ART, we should do the CD4 count and RNA copies so that we can monitor these pregnancies. And in every trimester, ideally it should be done. And in the end, uh, especially at the 36 to 37 weeks, it should be done so that we can decide the mode of the delivery because it depends on the RNA copies. If viral load is high, RNA copies are high, then we might go for the operative delivery. And if it is negligible, then we might think of or counsel the patient for the vaginal delivery. Now, coming to the another scenario. Now, this patient, she's a second gravida with previous one a normal delivery with living issue. Now she's 37 weeks and coming with the labor pains. And she's already diagnosed HIV positive and she's on ART. In PV examination, she's in labor. The cervical uh, cervix is 2 cm dilated and 60 to 70% effaced. Vertex at minus 2 and her membranes are intact and pelvis is adequate. So uh, the questions are, the what are the narco recommended ART? And what are the important precautions we should take during pregnancy? And what are the guidelines for the breastfeeding in low resource countries? So coming to the first answer of the first question, what are the NACO recommended ART recently? So here we should ideally, as soon as the patient is diagnosed with the HIV positive, whether she's nowadays, whether she's pregnant or non-pregnant, we should start the three drug regime. So as soon as this preg patient pregnant during pregnancy come to you, we should start three drug regime. And this includes the tenofovirine, lamivudine, and ifavirnase. But recently, in the 2021 and 22, they have added the, uh, they have removed the ifavirnase and they have added the dolutegravir. So that is 50 milligram. So nowadays, we are giving the tenofovirine, lamivudine, and the dolutegravir. So these are the TLD. TLD. So previously, 
up to the 16, 17, we used to use the ifavernase. Now they have removed this. So TLD we are giving to all the pregnant women throughout the pregnancy. Okay. And now coming to the another question, the during the pregnancy, what precautions we should take? We should ideally avoid the multiple PV examinations. We should not rupture the membranes. We should rather uh, keep the membranes intact if possible, even up to the second stage of the labor. As soon as the patient is about to push the membranes, if are intact, that is very good. And we should uh, continue the ART. If she's already on the ART, the same uh, ART should be continued. If she's not on, then we should immediately start the three drug regime and uh, then uh, it should be continued throughout the labor and even after the labor in the postpartum period. Now coming to the breastfeeding, so in the low resource countries, especially the WHO, even NACO, they recommend the breastfeeding should be uh, recommended to all the pregnant, uh, to all the women who have recently delivered and exclude, this should be the exclusive breastfeeding and they should be on the ART prophylaxis, whatever they were taking pre during the pregnancy. If they were not taking, then we have to start even in the postpartum period as soon as they come to us or as soon as we come to know her status. So the exclusive breastfeeding up to six months and after that they can be even uh, stop the breastfeeding and can be on the uh, mixed feeding Rather, mixed feeding should be avoided. So exclusive breastfeeding and then, then we can advise them the, the bottle feed or whatever they want to go for the ad, advice by the pediatrician. And we have to give the prophylaxis of the nevarapine or zidovudine to the baby also. Okay, so now coming to the next scenario. This uh, scenario is primary gravida with 35 weeks pregnancy with gestational hypertension. She is well controlled on the two antihypertensive medicines and ultrasound shows the AGA fetus with AVI 10 and CPR is more than one. The questions are here. What is the incidence of the PT in primary gravida and Paris women and enumerate any four risk factors for the preeclampsia and at what gestation this patient should be delivered. So now coming to the incidences. So the incidence of PT in the primary gravida is approximately 2 to 7%, whereas in the Paris women, it's five, 1 to 5%. And it's quite high in the twin pregnancy, it's approximately 14%. And if patients already had a history of the PT in the family or in her last pregnancy, then chances are quite high, that's 18%. Now coming to the answer of the next question. So what are the risk factors? The risk factors include the nulliparity, obesity, History of the chronic hypertension, she's already on the antihypertensive medicine and history of the SLE, history of the thrombophilia and history of the diabetes mellitus, history of the kidney disease and history of the PET. So they, these are the important risk factors which increase the chances of the PT. Now coming to the uh, answer of the next uh, question, so this patient can be monitored up to 37 weeks with the close monitoring. And we have to see whether there is any uh, development of the severe hypertension or severe PT or growth restriction. Then we have to accordingly decide the time of the delivery. Otherwise, at the 37 weeks, if cervix is favorable, we can plan the induction. And if uh, BP is well controlled and baby is also okay, then we can... Uh, Continue this pregnancy up to 37, 38 weeks, but up to 37, 38 weeks, we should deliver this pa patient because she's on two antihypertensive, uh, antihypertensive medicines. So coming to the next scenario, you see uh, here we can see the two pictures. A is showing the, I think you can identify these uh, situations. A is showing the clear cyst and uh, B is showing the edematous and swollen up vulva, the labia minora and mesora. So A is we have to identify this condition and we have to talk about the etiology and the treatment of these two conditions. So A is Bartholin cyst. There is no inflammation, no edema. And B is the Bartholin abscess. Okay, so etiology, because this is a vestibular gland, Bartholin gland is a vestibular gland and lined by the transitional epithelium, Next, Dr. Mamta, and this is prone to get blocked. 
So once the duct is blocked, it develops a cyst. And if there is an infection, then there is an abscess. And the, this abscess is usually microbial and 10% of the abscess is usually caused by the angonary. So treatment is the simple bartholin cyst and there is no symptom, then we can wait uh, for the treatment. If subsides spontaneously, it's okay. Or if develops an infection, then you have to decide the treatment or you can give the antibiotic orally. And if there is a, a, a big one and if there is a pain, definitely you have to decide the management. Then you have to do the marsupialization. That is better, but resection is a bit difficult, but uh, marsupialization is very simple and usually the recurrence chances are not common with the marsupialization. So thank you very much. I think you could understand something and you could get this. And now I request Dr. Geeta for the further uh, questionnaires uh, of the OSCE. Dr. Geeta, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. And thank you, Dr. Mamta, for doing the slide end. So my first question, uh, as Dr. Mamta and Dr. Chandra have told you students that OSCE is a very important part and you can score full marks. And when we mark your OSCE papers, they are all different parts. So answer all of them. You will get one mark or one and a half marks. So listen to the question carefully and answer each one of them. So usually you are shown pictures and some questions follow. So supposing you are having uh, this perspectulum examination and you can see on a perspectulum examination, you can see the vaginal walls on the side, the pink vaginal wall, and you can see a reddish structure coming out of the cervix. So the question will be as follows. A female aged 35 years, I, I think Mamta, you can keep the uh, picture on and uh, yeah, so I'll ask you the question. So a female aged 35 years, para 2 L2, attends the gyne OPD with bleeding per vaginum since one month off and on with history of blood stain discharge and systemic and abdominal examination are fine and per speculum examination shows you this picture. So you, you will have three questions now. Next slide. So your questions are, list two differential diagnoses, list two investigations you will advise and how will you treat? So probably this will be a five mark question with two, two and one mark. So what you can write in your uh, answer is next question. Next slide. So A, this can be differential, can be a cervical polyp, endometrial polyp. It could be placental polyp. And last is inversion uterus. You have to give any two, whatever comes to your mind at that time. Now, the two investigations which you will order are an ultrasound pelvis and you will get an LBC and an HPV done. And the third question is, how will you treat this condition? So, obviously, you will do a colposcopy, a hysteroscopy, and you will do a guided procedure because you don't know where the pedicle is. It is in the endocervical canal or coming up higher up or there are additional polyps in the uterus. But you have been simply asked, how will you treat this condition? Simple or colpo, histro guided. You don't have to go into the details. Just read the question, answer to the point. Next question. So now here is a, uh, you will be shown this picture. Again, you can see the per speculum examination showing the cervix. And I think Dr. Mamta has given you a detailed uh, exp expose on colposcopy. So this is the picture will be shown to you. Have a look at it carefully. Next slide. So now the question is describe this picture. What solution is used for this test and how is it prepared? And third, what is the change in the precancerous and cancerous lesion and how is it caused? So it will probably be, uh, you know, one mark, two marks and two marks. So describe the picture. The, yet you can just describe that this is a Lugol's, the visual inspection with Lugol's iodine and what we call Billy. And it is showing scattered iodine negative areas. As you could see in the picture, it is showing scattered iodine negative areas on the anterior and posterior lip. Question number two was what solution? It is a Lugol's iodine solution. How is it prepared? It is a 5% iodine, 10%. So you should know, sometimes they do ask, so you have to dissolve potassium iodide, 10% potassium iodide into about 20 to 30 ml of distilled water and iodine and heat gently with constant mixing until the iodine is dissolved. 
and then dilute this whole thing with 100 ml and store in an amber colored stoppered bottle. This is how you prepare. The third question was, what is the change? Is there is a precancerous and all? I'll not go into the details. Dr. Mamta has already told you the answer to this question that because of the immature cancerous lesions do not take up the iodine because they lack the glycogen. It's only when you have glycogen, the iodine will be taken up. When you appear mahogany brown, if they don't have glycogen or they're immature uh, or metaplastic or dysplastic lesions, they appear as mustard or saffron yellow areas. Next slide. So question number three, patient presents with thin white discharge. She has no itching, but discharge is copious. It's a copious non-itchy discharge, thin white. So obviously you know the answer. So they will ask what are the AMSELS criteria for diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis and describe the differentiating clinical features of candida discharge and trichomonas. So usually the marks are two and a half and two and a half. So two and a half, they will see all the criteria which we have given. You will get full marks. And if you differentiate in features, you can get full marks in these questions. So the answer would be the AMSELS criteria are as follows, that it is a usually a thin, white, homogeneous discharge. There are clue cells on microscopy. The pH is more than 4.5. That is, it is not like a normal acidic. It is alkaline. And the moment you add KOH, potassium hydroxide, is a classic fishy odor which emanates. So these are the AMSELS criteria for bacterial vaginosis. And now how do you differentiate a trichomonial discharge from a candida discharge? So again, you can get full marks in this. So trichomonas, as we know, is caused due to the uh, uh, protozoan, the flagellated protozoan trichomonas vaginalis. It is a sexually transmitted disease. You can see this flagellated protozoan with an exostyle and cystostome and the nucleus is elongated. It's a typical frothy green discharge with mild itching, whereas candidiasis may be or may not be an STD. On microscopic, you so see the pseudo hyphae and the budding yeast cells. The discharge is classically cheesy, curdy discharge with coating the vagina. And if you remove the discharge, you can see the punctate hemorrhages. And the classic feature is of itching in candidiasis. Unlike in bacterial vaginosis, where there is hardly any uh, uh, itching about this. But this candida and TV, they usually candida maximum itching you will have. Next. So now the next question is, you, they will be showing you this diagram. Okay, you know this level 1, level 2, level 3. So the questions will be asked, after whom these levels of support are named? So probably it will be just one mark. And then describe the components, you can have three marks. So total four marks question, you can get full four marks. So obviously, you know, this is named after Delancey. And the components are level one, level two, level three, which we've already discussed in the previous uh, uh, case presentation. Cardinal utricycle, then vesicovaginal fascia, rectovaginal, which is attached to the ATFP, which is in turn attached to the uterocecal ligament and the perineal body attachment to the RVF. You have to be very short, very crisp. You don't have to, uh, you know, detail uh, explanation because they just asked you what are the components, right? So that is a very short answer. Next question. So usually there is one ultrasound picture showing an anomaly and then there are associated questions. So if you look carefully, you can see the um, caudal end. This is the typical tram track appearance of the cord, uh, the spinal cord, which appears on a sagittal section in an ultrasound. And as you can see, the arrow is pointing to a defect there. So this will be the picture shown and the questions asked can be as follows. Then what the above condition is most common in which part of the spine? What are the commonest cranial ultrasound signs of this condition in the second trimester ultrasound? Which serum marker in the quad test would be increased? And what abnormalities slash conditions are associated? So this may be, I'm, I have written four or five questions which may be asked, each carrying different quiet answers. So the first answer is the above condition is most commonly found in which part? It is the usually the lumbosacral spine. That is the answer to the first question. Then the second question you were asked was, what are the commonest cranial ultrasound Finding. So, mostly, as I said, 65% in the lumbosacral. No, previous one, Mamta? No. 
Lumbosacral 65% is the position. Sacral 24, thoraco and cervical are very less. And the commonest cranial ultrasound find, this is an open spina bifida. It is associated with the Arnold Chiari type 2 malformation where there is a caudal displacement of the brain stem and there is obliteration of the cisterna magna. That is typically when you find the lemon sign and the banana sign, the cerebellum is like a banana and there is a pinching of the frontal bones, that's the lemon sign. And in the second trimester, more than 95% of fetuses have this scalloping, what we call the lemon sign and obliteration of the cisterna with an absent cerebellum, abnormal anterior curvature of the cerebellar causing the banana sign. Now, the third question was, which serum marker? We all know it is maternal serum, alpha fetoprotein, more than 2.5 moms. That is classic answer for this question. And what are the abnormalities or conditions if you have an open spina fida, bifida. So it can be associated with other things. So you, whenever you find one anomaly in ultrasound, you almost look for other. So you can have abdominal wall defects, you can have nephrosis, you can have multiple gestation because raised MSAFP can be in all these conditions, IUGR, IUD abruption. So the folic acid deficiency, family history, chromosomal anomalies, mainly trisomy 18, single gene defects, or maternal diabetes and women on anti-epileptics can also have a raised maternal serum, alpha fetoprotein. And also you can have bladder bowel incontinence, weakness, paralysis of lower limbs and hydrocephalus are the other condition associated with this anomaly. Next slide, please. Now, here is another ultrasound, the sagittal section of the, this is an NTNB scan. As you can see, the nuchal translucency, the calipers are showing you, it is quite raised. So next, the questions which can be related to this picture can be, what is the optimal uh, gestational uh, questions, uh, uh, Mamta, can you project the questions? So you can ask any of these three, four questions or what is the optimal gestational age and CRL for performing the NT scan? What should be included in an NT scan? What happens to beta HCG and PEPE in trisomy 21, 18 and 13? And what are the implications and associations of increased NT? Any of these questions can be asked in association with this photograph. So you will answer that the optimal gestational age for performing NT and B is 11 to 13 plus 6 weeks. At the CRL is of 45 to 84 mm. Then what should be included in a NT scan? You must always give the ultrasonologist the following history of the maternal age, uh, blood pressure, or BMI, and you must give a NT CRL, which is component of an NT scan, nasal bone, ductus, TR, uterine artery, PI, fetal heart rate, information on the cervix, placenta, amniotic fluid. And if it is twins, then chorionicity must be mentioned. And it should actually be NT. And you should perform an early anomaly scan. If you have this kind of a picture, you must order an further tests. Now, the third question is, what happens to beta HCG and PEPE? As you can see in trisomy 21, PEPE will be roughly around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 moms, and beta would be about 2. So that is a little high. Whereas in a euploid pregnancy, average beta is one mom and pepe is also one. Just remember, one and one, normal. But 21, 2 and 0.5. And if you have trisomy 18, 13, both are low and pretty much low, below 0 0.5. So if you have, just remember this um, uh, figure. So you, will, you can read your own uh, answer. You can read your own double marker report. So what happens to them? Now, supposing what are the, this patient comes to you, you doctor says, oh, there is a raised NT and you have done the double marker, report is not there. Patient asks, what are the implications? What am I likely to have? So you will say mostly chromosomal anomalies and increasing NT, more it is, more is the prevalence, right? So if uh, NT, if 0.2% if NT is less than 295th centile, but if the NT is more than 6.5 millimeter, like in this case, it is four millimeter, then it is to the tune of 65%. Then other implications can be a fetal depth, 
you can have other implications like other genetic syndromes like achondrogenesis, achondroplasia, bijorge, akinesia, fetal akinesia, you can have Noonan and etc. Fryn syndrome, Roberts vector anomalies. So all these uh, can be written in your answers and they'll be dedicated uh, you know, numbers given when we as examiners go, we are given a certain number that you can give these marks. So I think if you write even three or four, you will get your necessary marks. Next slide, please. So here is another ultrasound picture of a patient presenting second gravida, para one, normal delivery, five weeks of amenorrhea with pain abdomen. And you can see this left sided, there is a left and next side is labeled and there is an ectopic gestational sac and ball of fire appearance. So the answer, the questions which can be asked on this question, uh, on this thing is, when should we consider methotrexate? Or in other words, mention the criteria for giving medical management. Once you are doing medical, how will you monitor follow-up? What drugs to be avoided when patient is on methotrexate? And how long to avoid pregnancy and what surgery? So any of these two, three questions out of these five can be asked to you. So you will answer that when we will consider methotrexate, the criteria, next slide, when patient is clinically stable, beta HCG is roughly between 1500 to 5000. There is no fetal heart sound. Gestational sac diameter is less than 35. And there is no intrauterine pregnancy. And most important, most important, patient is willing for follow-up and she is not allergic to methotrexate. So these are the criteria when you should consider. Now, coming to monitoring, you have given a methotrexate. How do you monitor? You do the beta HCG on day four and day seven. And if more than equal to 15% fall is noted, it is a successful treatment. So from fourth to seventh day, you consider expectant management. That is why you tell these patients they should be willing to follow up and they should be living near the hospital during this time. And if it is more than 50% fall, you do beta weekly till less than 10%. And if it doesn't fall, then you stop the medical and switch to surgical. And what do you tell the patient? What are the drugs to be avoided? You have to avoid folic acid and you have to avoid alcohol. That is very important to tell the patient. And how long to avoid? You can tell her three months after the last dose of methotrexate, she should avoid pregnancy so as to escape the uh, antimitotic um, effects of methotrexate on the growing fetus. And what surgery in case you have to do surgery, you can do salpingostomy if technically possible, if the other tube is also abnormal. However, if the other tube is normal and technically less ostomy is not possible, you can do an ectomy. Next slide, please. I think we have just five minutes. We have five minutes. Now, folic acid is to be avoided because again, methotrexate, it antagonizes the effect of methotrexate. That is why when you give multiple dose regimes, you give methotrexate, you give folinic rescue so that there is um, uh, no much antimitotic effect on the other organs like mucosa, gastric mucosa, hair follicles. So you have to avoid folic acid in such cases. Okay, so now here you will be shown this picture, carbitocin injection. You can read 100 microgram per mil, one by one ml ampule. Now, Various questions can which can be asked is, what is carbitocin? Again, you will get one mark for this. What is the difference in half-life of oxy and carbe? Can maybe half mark or one mark. Then how carbitocin works? What are the contraindications? Has WHO recommended carbitocin for prevention of PPH? Mind you, they have, it's a very specific question we have asked. What is the dose of carbitocin? Can it be diluted? And when should carbitocin be given? So any of these questions can be asked to you. So basically, you should know all about carbitocin. So carbitocin is basically a synthetic analog of human oxytocin with some structural modifications. And because of these structural modifications, which the chemistry in the chemical chemistry lab they have done, they have increased the half-life. To the 10 times of oxytocin in 4 minutes, this is 40 minutes. So half-life has been prolonged by a little tweaking of this uh, uh, synthetic analog. Next slide, please. So as I said, the half-life is 40 minutes compared to oxy, which is 4 minutes. Duration of oxytocin, carbitocin is longer than IV or IM oxytocin. 
In fact, single bolus of carbitocin was at least as effective as 16 hours of continuous oxytocin infusion. So you have to just give one dose and forget about it. It does not need repeated. And there is no dose variation or single dose in carbitocin, which was found to be effective in controlling 3PH, unlike oxytocin. You know, you are having more blood loss, you give 20 units than 40 units. Whereas in uh, carbitocin, there is no need to variate your dose. It will automatically act that single dose. So it is superior to oxytocin that way. Next slide, please. Now, half-life, we have already told you. Uh, then the other question was uh, how carbitocin works. Yes. So it acts by through the oxytocin receptors and causes the uterus to contract. So it has oxytocin, uterotonic, and antihemorrhagic effects also. And it causes thickening of the blood also. The next question we asked you, what are the contraindications? Now, these are all relative ones. Epilepsy is a relative one. And before delivery, it may cause respiratory or cardiac distress in mother or baby. And these are in that small group of women who may have an underlying cardiac disease, which you don't know. So it may cause. And it should be used in caution with the hypertensive, especially eclamptic patients who are on maybe an NTG drip, etc. In those patients, it is a carefully use. Then has the WHO recommended? Yes, it is very much recommended. As you can see, the it is very clear that carbitocin is recommended for prevention. Point number 1.2, it is recommended for prevention of PPH. So it, you should have it in your armamentarium. And now we have a heat stable preparation coming. So which is used for low resource settings, even in periphery. So it is recommended for prevention of PPH for all births in context where its cost is comparable to other effective eutrotonics. Next slide, please. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, what is the dose? As I told you, the dose is a single dose of 100 micrograms should be administered intravenously as a bolus over one minute after delivery of the infant. Once the baby is delivered, you can slowly deliver it as a, over one minute. And in case vaginal, also single dose of 100 microgram after delivery of the infant for an active management as a bolus over one minute. I think we are finished with the time, Mamta. So this last two questions we can leave because it's the next has to start. So which is basically on uh, pap smear. I think you have covered, already covered pap smear right. and polpo so beautifully, Mamta. So we can stop here. Our time is over. Thank you, Dr. Mamta. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for your time. Uh, thank you to the organizing team for giving us this opportunity. And I hope the students have found this session hopeful. Please write in the chat box if you have found it useful so that when we plan our uh, next OSCE session, we can also improve ourselves when we set between Mamta, Chandra and me. Uh, if it is useful, please write in the chat box. Yeah, uh, so that we can make uh, yeah we we yeah. can make more important questions another yeah. end yeah. of the questionnaires. Yeah. Yes, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you, thank you. Acha, show the pap smear slide, please. Somebody is asking again and again. If the organizers agree, can I just show the last slide because uh, I will again share then. Ha. Huh. Pap smear ka ito slide hai. Basically, you can ask question the what is the description of the image? How do you confirm? Set recommended screening protocol. So, so, you know, it's very important to all PG students. Please visit your pathology department, cytology department. Request the uh, cytopathologist to show you the pap smear. Mamta, don't you agree they should all visit the pathology yeah, yeah, department? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not able to share. I will just... Okay, it's all right. It's okay. I will, no, I will just try. I, I, I will okay. share now. Because they want to see, let them... They want to see the pap smear slide, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the last slide, actually. Yeah, the last slide. Question nine. Yeah, yeah. Let them just be satisfied. Yeah, have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. that's a slide. Slide. 
Yeah. So as you can see, this very clear. This is a the, the question you can be asked is identify. So these are malignant squamous cells. As you can see, there is an increased nuclear cytoplasmic ratio. Are you just project the photograph? I will tell them the answer. Increased NCR, coarse chromatin, and isocytosis. And another question you can ask is, do you need to confirm the diagnosis? Never say, yes, I will confirm on the pap smear. You need to confirm. And you need to take a biopsy and not just treat the pap smear. Then they can ask you, what are the screening protocols? that you can start at 21 years in sexually active women, do it every three years till the age of 65. However, if you are adding HPV, I think Mamta will agree, five yearly is a good enough uh, interval to protocol. And if they can ask you what name two other OPD methods, low resource settings, OPD methods, you can say, I can do via Willy, which Dr. Mamta has already shown you in the first picture. I hope that satisfied the young students who were very keen. Thank yeah. you, Mamta. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you to Geeta ma'am, Mamta ma'am and Chandra ma'am for this wonderful OSCE session. Uh, now we would uh, like to uh, invite mm -hmm. Dr. Roma Satwik ma'am, Senior Consultant, Center of IVF and Human Reproduction, Sagangaram Hospital for a lecture on table viva on HSG. Thank you, Bhavani. Uh, if you'd allow me to yeah, I can share my screen now. Many thanks. So hysterosalpingography is also a, a significant uh, a subject in table viva. And uh, there are some questions that you should be able to respond to, along with some basic films that uh, you should be able to identify correctly and uh, respond to. So, uh, hysterosalpingography by definition is a fluoroscopic examination of the uterus and fallopian tubes. And its primary purpose is to investigate infertility. But it has been used in the past in cases of recurrent spontaneous abortions. But if you have an examiner who uh, is just about 10 years younger, you could completely switch using the word recurrent spontaneous abortion. So it, the primary purpose uh, uh, remains investigating infertility. Chloroscopy, as you would know, denotes continuous X-ray imaging on a monitor, and this can be live monitored uh, on a screen while the imaging is happening continuously. Now, this is what uh, a fluoroscopic uh, HSG table would look like. The lady is lying on the table and this is the zone from where uh, you can see that the focal spot for X-ray emission is at the bottom of the table. The receptor plate is at the top and uh, the C arm goes all around the lady. And this is the images captured on the receptor plate can then be focused onto a screen. And based on that, you carry on your uh, HSG uh, uh, procedure. Now, indications for HSG remain infertility, which is to assess uh, tubal patency pathology, but also in some cases, you would be able to assess uterine morphology. Mm -hmm. And it is particularly good for uteruses which are congenitally abnormally shaped. And for that, uh, you would also use HSG. Pre-surgically, it has been used in cases of tubal recanalization to assess residual tubal length. And post-surgically also, it has been used after tubal recanalization to assess patency. As a primary method to investigate recurrent spontaneous abortions to rule out congenital anomalies, it is no longer undertaken because now you have a better modality, which is the 3D ultrasound. And if that is not clear, then of course you undertake an MRI instead. So contraindications to HSG, quickly, uh, I'm sure you can all answer this. Pregnancy, active vaginal bleeding, active pelvic infection, allergy to radio big dye. Now, that is something we see very rarely, but those three would be active contraindications. But relative contraindications can also be a uterine, recent uterine surgery, like uh, if someone has just had, uh, uh, you know, maybe three months or four months back, she's had 
a cesarean, although this would be an unusual situation, a woman post cesarean may or may not want a, a baby right away and three months is too small for her to uh, to start trying or to be even called infertile. But uh, something uh, like a myomectomy perhaps and post a myomectomy, if you wish to investigate if her tubes are still open, it's been three to five months, you could perhaps do an edge uh, uh, later, but not immediately. Adnexal masses or hydrosalpings would also be a contraindication to HSG. Uh, there are some prerequisites before an HSG can be undertaken. And these are that uh, the lady has to be in proliferative phase, days five to nine. This is one, because the endometrium is thin around this time. It improves visualization. It prevents the... Uh, 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 yes the false blockage of the cornea by thick endometrium as well. And possibility of pregnancy is negligible in this period. Uh, the other prerequisite is that she should be indication and contraindication compliant, which have been shown to you in the previous slides. You may choose to give her an antibiotic cover and you may choose to give her an antispasmodic cover. And I put stars there because there is still debate around whether this is needed or not. Uh, your HSG trolley basically should look like this. It should have a sim speculum, a tenaculum. It should have HSG cannula, which could be non-balloon catheters. Non-balloon catheters are divided into metallic and non-metallic, or it could be a, a balloon catheter, which are divided into latex and non-latex. Apart from the cannula, you need a syringe, about 20 ml. You need sponge holding forceps. You need cotton swabs, povidone iodine solution, sterile gloves and drapes. All of this to clean the vagina. The drugs that you have on your trolley, the other trolley, is a contrast material, which is the primary drug you'll need. And these have been divided into water-soluble and oil-soluble media. Uh, we will be talking about this in a bit. But apart from that, you may need to have injection buscopan. So this is a pain relieving measure based on what your institute does. You need some kind of pain relieving measure. Some institutes will choose to use injection buscopan just prior to the procedure. Other institutes may choose to use lignocaine 2% uh, uh, spray for, uh, for spraying this on uh, the cervix just prior to the procedure. They could also choose to use infiltration with lignocaine 1%. So whatever you choose for pain relief, it should be on your, uh, on your trolley. Apart from this, emergency mm -hmm. drugs like hydrocortisone able in case of an allergic reaction, a laryngoscope, uh, oxygen and other masks for as an emergency trolley should be present. Now we come to cannula quickly. Most centers would have one of these as uh, kept on the table. And uh, so a design could look, so first of all, you have to be able to identify that this is an HSG cannula. Next, you should be able to sort of describe this a little more that this is a metallic HSG cannula. So coming to the first one, this is a Rubens uh, HSG cannula. The triangular uh, bud you see in the middle of it is what is the known as the cervical stalk. Its purpose is to prevent a backflow of the pushed dye from the uterus back into the vagina. And uh, somewhere here is the tip from which the dye will uh, be instilled into the uterus. And here is the, uh, the inlet from where you push dye into the cannula and it emits from here, from this end. The other is the Leach-Wilkinson's cannula, and its uh, features are that it has these series of uh, 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 these circular uh, crenations, which help to hold the cannula at the level of the endocervix. And it is again a met metallic cannula. It is uh, non-flexible. And because both of these are metallic, not flexible, it is sometimes uh, possible to not be able to uh, cannulate the cervix well, a cervix where the utero cervical angle is acute. It might be difficult for you to use these cannula. They can also cause more pain. 
The other kind are non-metallic plastic cannula, and uh, both of them are available in the same shapes as the as the previous the metallic cannula. And uh, this, you needn't remember the name, but as long as you identify this as an HSG cannula, non-metallic, and its purpose is uh, to be able to do this more painlessly because it is a little more flexible that should be sufficient. Names could be different. Sometimes they are written on the, uh, the packing, the sheet that they come with. Now, this is a third kind of uh, cannula catheters that have been used in HSG. This is a single balloon HSG cannula, uh, single, uh, and then you have uh, a Foley's catheter that has also been used. So this balloon here is placed inside the uterine cavity just at the level of internal loss, and it provides a good seal. And you have two inlets here. One is to uh, instill the dye width from here and the other is to inflate the cannula and uh, so this is again less painless it will be more useful where the uterus cervical angle is very acutely antiverted sort of anti-flexed or it is very acutely and uh, uh, retroflexed so uh, there are enough studies to suggest that uh, metal cannula will cause a little more pain than balloon cannula. And that is what we have spoken about, that balloon cannula may be preferred to reduce the pain. Contrast media, two kinds, oil-based media, which is uh, largely, and this is what was used since HSG was introduced. Uh, this uh, cannula has been, uh, this contrast media was later given up because of fear of causing higher allergic reactions, more embolism, more, more oil granuloma in favor of water-based dye. But for the longest time, it was considered that oil-based media was leading to better visualization of the uterine cavity and anatomy of the uh, tubes. And perhaps it was also leading to better post-procedural fertility. So this, of course, oil-based media gave way to water-based media in the 70s and the 80s, which are benzoic acid derivatives. And uh, so, you know, benzoic acid is a six-carbon ringed structure, and it has got iodine substitution at positions two, four, and six. You could choose to have, I mean, if you add more chain substitutions, its osmolar osmolarity starts going down. Uh, it has a cation at position one, so you would have, uh, you know, one cation, which could be sodium or meglumine. And what is the larger thing about water-based dyes that you should know is that they can, again, be two kinds. One is hyperosmolar with an osmolarity of approximately 1500 per liter or low osmolar with an osmolarity of uh, uh, 320 to 800 milliosmolar per liter. And why is this significant is that the more the osmolarity, uh, the higher is it going to, so, so it's it's like a highly ionic compound. So sodium, which is a cation, can break very easily from its anion. And because it can break very easily, it, it increases the number of uh, ions which are available to increase the osmolarity. So highly ionic compounds increase the osmolarity. When this osmolarity goes above the physiological osmolarity of 280 milliosmoles, and the further it is away from there, it is more likely to cause pain at the site of contact. So hyperosmolar dyes are likely to be more painful. Low osmolar dyes are likely to be less painful. Examples we'll see in this picture. So lipiodol, which is basically poppy uh, seed fatty acids uh, with iodine attached to it. So iodine is the key component. Iodine is what would lead to uh, the dye glowing up uh, under x-ray x-ray uh, x-rays. So lipiodol is fatty acids from poppy seeds plus iodine. Uh, and uh, then you have the hyper or smaller water soluble dye. One example of this is urographin. And then you have the uh, low or smaller uh, 
uh, water soluble dye. One example of this is lopamiro, and 370 here indicates uh, osmolarity. So it is still not isoosmolar with the physiological fluids, but it is the least osmolar dye that is available. And uh, so this is now being preferred in most centers, lopamiro, uh, 370. Uh, the question is, which one would you use? Is there enough evidence to say all that, what was said uh, in the previous slides about oil-based media? And there are now randomized control trials available since 2014 that are saying that the oil-based group, the post-HSG fertility, uh, as measured by ongoing pregnancies, six months, uh, up to six months after the procedure, can be higher. So p-value is significant with oil-based media versus with water-based media. And also that the complications uh, that one was talking about, allergy, granuloma, and stuff like that, uh, were not reported in this wide number of patients that were enrolled, 554 versus 554 in the wide. So that's, that's significant sort of, it's not an anecdotal. It's based on a large number of women who underwent uh, underwent the procedure with oil-based media. So uh, not only that, it had equal efficacy in picking up tubular uterine disease. Pregnancy rates were significantly higher with oil-based media, and there were no significant differences in terms of other complications like ectopic or miscarriages. So uh, by 2016, there were or 18, there were enough trials to suggest that oil soluble media was actually leading to higher ongoing pregnancy rates. So if you have an examiner who who asks you the differences between oil based versus water based media, it is possible for you to uh, give uh, results from this trial and the uh, systematic review, which is now saying that ongoing pregnancies post oil-based media are higher without increasing the complication rate. So uh, you might also be asked, how do you prepare women for HSG? You have already talked about contraindications, indications. You've already spoken about uh, what are the prerequisites, which is that the woman needs to be in uh, the early follicular phase or mid follicular phase in order to avoid, uh, uh, you know, an, an, uh, uh, an undetectable undet uh, pregnancy. And uh, once she's in, you ask her to avoid you explain the procedure to her after the procedure has been explained. Consent is taken. You don't take consent first and then explain the procedure. It's the other way around. You check your trolley. You uh, The lady is laid in the thotomy position. She's draped. She's prepped. Uh, so I put drape first before preparing with, uh, with the betadine. And draping allows first, allows the woman to uh to get more calm and comfortable because you know you you she we do this procedure without anesthesia without putting her to sleep draping allows her to at least uh, think that her modesty is being preserved and preparation is then with you clean the parts with the betadine after checking with her on allergies and once that has been done appropriate size cannula is chosen you fill it with dye. This is chosen based on a woman's history of prior births. So prior births, you want a... So you'll also see that the uh, cannula, the Leach-Wilkinson's cannula comes in different shapes and sizes. The ones with wider base and, you know, more stouter ones can be used for uh, women who have had previous live births. And the ones that are narrower with very thin... Uh, uh, outlet can be used for primary uh, the first timers who've not conceived ever. So, uh, but then you fill the dye. Your syringe is filled with the dye. Air bubbles are removed, and uh, and this is then pushed through the cannula to remove the air bubbles. Once you have done all this, at this point you expose the cervix with sim speculum. Uh, you instill local anesthesia with xylocaine or you simply spray the xylocaine 4% spray that you might have. Uh, you may need to hold the cervix with balsalum after injecting with local. You screw in the dye-filled cannula into the cervix. Once an effective seal has been reached, uh, how do you establish the cannula? 
And now you uh, straighten and reposition the patient under the machine because she was in dorsal position at the edge of the table. You'll have to ask her to go up again, reposition her, push one to two ml to delineate the cavity. The next two ml will uh, pass through the tubes and subsequent one to two ml will uh, have uh, will have the spill. Uh, you know, the dye would be seen spilling from the distal ends of the tube. Uh, there is a case to be made for uh, films to uh, taken after the procedure, after removal of instruments. One delayed film after two to five minutes will allow you to determine that what was called a localized spill on the initial film is actually a localized spill or does it spread further? So uh, this is how the first film will look. This is uh, uh, about 2 ml of dye that has been pushed in and you can see that the margins of the uterine cavity are well delineated in this it has just started to go into the fallopian tubes and uh, the isthmus has been outlined and beyond this the ampulla and the infundibulum has been outlined and in the final film you can see spill from both sides it's a clear hsg uh, post-procedure instructions are given to the lady once this is done you first check on the patient, all good, talk to her, inform her of the results, prescribe her antibiotic course if that is your policy. It, uh, it is a policy in our center to give it to her for a total of three days. Pain relief may be given SOS and emergency numbers are still handed over to the lady where to contact in case of an issue. Complications are uh, any one of these, procedural pain. Uh, most women, if you are able to cull their anxiety, calm them down by following the steps given in the previous slides, the pain would be less. It's, a, it's the perception of pain which causes more anxiety is what the procedure is like and, and uh, not knowing what this is about that causes more anxiety. So it is important to cull her anxiety, inform her of what is happening, uh, cover her first before exposing her fully, uh, get your dye cannula you know, ready, get your air bubbles out of the dye cannula and uh, only hold the cervix at the last minute. Don't keep you know, holding it uh, and keep talking to her. All of this allows her to feel the pain less. So uh, vasovagal reaction could be secondary to pain, rare complication, atropine and emergency tray should be ready. We haven't experienced this in the past so many years that we have done uh, this procedure. Dye allergy, rare emergency tray, steroid, able, IV fluids, IV cannula and line, etc. needs to be ready for this. So even though it's very rare, you cannot get away with not having your emergency tray and trolley ready in your HSG room. Vaginal bleeding uh, could be, yes, because of trauma. And secondary infection reported incidence is not very high, 0.1 to 0.5%. It's more likely with the silent PIDs. Pre- and post-procedural antibiotics may reduce the incidence further. There could be inadvertent radiation to unknown pregnancy also, but this is only if you haven't chosen your case as well. Uh, the next question that you are asked is, what is the effectiveness of HSG in diagnosing tubal block? And you uh, mainly are able to talk about, you should be able to talk about the sensitivity and specificity of HSG in doing this. So uh, the when you get a block on, like let's say you get a bilateral corneal block on HSG, uh, you have to remember this, that only one third of these cases will actually have a corneal block bilaterally on laparoscopy. Mm. So when a woman with bilateral corneal block comes to you, you have to give her the benefit of doubt and tell her that it is possible that this is a procedural artifact or something which happened because of inadvertent closure of the musculature around the cornea and which is why the dye did not go in. Or perhaps the pressure in the cavity was too low, which is why, and most of it was leaking out, largely because we chose the wrong kind of speculum. And uh, so, which is why uh, there has been a block. Uh, and so it is not a reliable indicator of tubal occlusion. So what could you do in such a case? Not necessarily offer her 
uh, another uh, uh, a laparoscopy. If she's up to it and you are good at it, offer her another HSG. Or if she's not up to it, it's all right. You could simply give her the benefit of doubt, especially in women who who are, let's say, anovulatory. So, uh, so one would see that a lot of PCOS women without being given effective ovulation inductions or without being given ovulation inductions for adequate number of time, carry these reports of bilateral corneal block. And in such cases, with a very short duration of infertility, one can easily give the benefit of doubt to these women. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that when HSG suggests tubal patency, it will be confirmed by laparoscopy in 94% cases. So it's a very good modality for diagnosing tubal patency. You might be asked for differences between HSG and laparoscopy. When would you prefer an HSG as a first line? When would you prefer laparoscopy as a first line? Because that's the other gold standard for tubal patency. Although because it's invasive, because it involves anesthesia, because the costs can be 15 to 20 times more than what the HSG costs, it should not be offered as a first line. Remember this, laparoscopy is not a first line treatment or uh, uh, sort of uh, a test for tubal patency, but may be offered as a first line in history of PID, you know, recurrent PID, with known nexal masses on ultrasound, and long duration infertility with normal semen analysis and regular ovulation. And I put an asterisk there because here you then are not choosing between HSG and laparoscopy. Here you might be wanting to choose between laparoscopy and IVF, which has now become a more popular, effective, safe technique for, uh, for uh, infertility, okay? As a second line, failure of three to four IUIs with good ovarian reserve slash normal semen. Again, I put a star here because IVF is the other effective option. And in win, women with tubal disease on HSG, so you've done an HSG and you find tubal disease, you think it is correctable, then of course you offer laparoscopy. So laparoscopy indications are minimal right now. HSG versus laparoscopy, uh, both are invasive procedures, but HSG is less so. Detection of tubal pathologies is better with laparoscopy, there's no doubt. Detection and treatment of pathology missed by HSG, however, if let's say HSG is saying your tubes are patent, however, the clinician suspects that despite patency, there might be adhesions and I can do a lot better for this case. There are studies and several studies now which suggest that laparoscopy at this point is not going to increase and correction of that pathology like peritubal adhesions is not going to change the uh, the live birth rates, right? So I'll quickly come to without going into any of this because this is too much and it's just another three to five minutes left is at the films. Hmm. So here uh, an HSG has been done. You can see this is if something like this was put out and you were, you were asked how to describe this, you could say this is a contrast X-ray displaying the uh, uterus, the fallopian tubes, and it is uh, a hysterosalpingogram, which has used the Leach-Wilkinson scannula. In the first film, you, use, you see the dye uh, uh, illuminating the uterus uh, and the cavity appears to be normal. In the second film, the dye has moved into both the tubes and the tubal anatomy in this appears to be okay. And in the third film, you can see uh, the spill. In the fourth film, you can see spill, but it appears to be localized on the right side. It appears to be better on the left side. So what would you do in such a case? Would you want to do a laparoscopy uh, because there appears to be a pathology on the right? The answer is, uh, I'll base it again on the woman's age. I'll base it on duration of infertility. I'll base it on whether she has had prior surgeries like a DNC or uh, and, uh, and, and explain options of laparoscopy slash IVF to her. If she has a very long duration of infertility in this case, perhaps IVF would be my first choice. But if she does not have a very long duration of infertility and she is less than 35, perhaps 
here is a film that is showing uh, uh, you can see there is a, a, a space occupying lesion it could be uh, uh, it could be an air bubble or it could be a synechia how will you establish that this is an air bubble versus a synechia the difference is that an air bubble moves up as you keep performing the procedure but a synechia will stay where it is it will not move so in this, uh, of course, it is just to show that you have to be able to distinguish between the two. And the answer here is synechia, a central oval filling defect within the uterus, a finding that represents a synechia. Here you can see uh, that the uterus, uh, the, uh, the outline laterally is okay, but at the fundus you can see a major depression. And uh, you can see that the tubes, uh, at least the entire tubes are outlined but the spill is not clearly seen. Uh, one doesn't know if this was an early film and that they did, whether they waited for the late film or not. But you could say that for the spill thing, I'd like to see what the later films are saying. And for the fundus, for the fundus which appears to be depressed, there are two options. What are the two possibilities? One is that there is a space occupying lesion at the fundus like a central fibroid, like a type 2 fibroid, or there could be, it could simply be an arcuate uterus or a partially partial septate uterus. And uh, how will you establish this? Septate slash arcuate uterus. You would need to, of course, do an MRI to be able to establish the difference. However, it may not make a huge difference to the patient's prognosis. Small septate uterus in the absence of previous pregnancy losses, you can just let it be arcuate uteruses you don't touch. You go on with your management based on where the other pathology lies. So this may not necessarily be uh, a pathological finding. However, this has been reported. So here is uh, again uh, uh, an x-ray where you can see that uh, the cavity has been split into two halves. Both the halves appear equal in volume and uh, the distinction and you can see the tubes on both sides are outlined, spill is there. However, the question here is whether the two sides are divided by a septum or whether they are two separate cavities as would be seen in a biconuate unicolous uterus. Hmm. So uh, one, it's, it's not going to be a confirmed diagnosis, but on HSG, you look at the angulation between the two sides. And if the angulation is acute, this is more likely a septate uterus. But if it is very wide, then it could be biconuate uterus. So I would uh, sort of favor uh, a septate more in this case than a biconuate. And uh, the answer here is not given, but that is that is my diagnosis. Mm. Uh, now, this is clearly the demarcation. So here you can see how, how widely the two horns are away from each other. And the angulation between them is so obtuse, it's almost 180 degrees. And uh, these are different kinds. In the A panel, this is, uh, uh, this is a, a biconuate unicollis. In B panel is also biconuate unicollis, and in C it is biconuate bicollis, and in D it is different uh, or it's separation all the way down. You can see that uh, two separate uh, Leach Wilkinson's cannula have been used to cannulate the two uh, cavities on both sides. So, so panel D is actually didelphus. Uh, I could end here if uh, my time is over, but this is the last one. We are just going to talk about uh, this one. Here you can see that the uterus is of course outlined and what you see on both its sides is the vasculature of the uterus. And what you see going above is not the tubes. These are not the tubes. These are again the uh, iliac vessels, which so all the vessels which are draining into the iliac vessels, and then they are going up and draining into the inferior vena cava. At some point, it would be going there. So it's beautifully outlined. But the question that would be asked to you is why does this happen? Why is there extra vessation of dye in this film? And the answers could be two. One is that 
of course the tubes are blocked and uh, the uh, they are blocked at the corneal level and that there, there is a part that that is not the only condition you need to have the other condition you need to have is uh, that there has to be some level of inflammation in the endometrium causing the blood vessels to kind of dilate the endothelial cells are apart from each other so that when the pressure in the uterine cavity increases as it shall when you push in the dye and it has no other outlet it would enter the vessels right so a uh, dilated sort of inflamed uh, endometrium with uh, open sort of slightly uh, apart endothelial cells would allow something like this to do so there are two diagnoses bilateral corneal block I, and I would actively look for evidence of endometritis in this case, right? By how would I do that? There would be no other way but to do perhaps an endometrial biopsy in this case. All right. So uh, that should be the end of the stock. I think I can end it here. These are films which are self-explanatory, uniconuate. Uh, sometimes what will happen is, and this is just a good practice point, that when you have a uniconvate uterus on HSG, don't base your diagnosis entirely on you know HSG. There should at least be a, 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 a pelvic examination to see whether the cervix is divided into two parts or not. And so this uh, was one example where uh, we found that... Uh, uh, where is that? It's not available here. But there was an example where we did uh, HSG and we found that it was the uh, uniconuate. And uh, however, you know, pregnancy from the other side happened. And uh, the because uh, one of us missed, uh, you know, diagnosing that this was a biconuate, bicolous uterus. And the other side had not been cannulated. So, well, I think we end this here. Uh, there are several uh, questions, I'm sure. Uh, one last question could be hysterosalpingography and radiation exposure. So, uh, if you were doing it under fluoroscopic control with procedure lasting approximately two minutes and six radiographic stills were taken, the radiation exposure to the lady would be three to five millisieverts which is actually equivalent to background radiation that she's exposed for 1.6 years. Over that much is what you are doing in HSG. So how it, this is considered safe, but for your information, you need to know uh, this slide as well. I'll end this here. Thank you. Ma'am, there's a question from one of the students in tuberculosis. Will there be extravasation of dye or not? Yeah, so there are no rules here, really. It will depend upon uh, whether there is tubal block, whether there is uh, active endometritis, whether the vessels are showing uh, signs of acute inflammation or not. But uh, so it could happen and not always happen. You have to be wary. If there is tuberculosis, you uh, wouldn't want to do. And if there is active tuberculosis, this is not what you would want to do. You would want to treat it first with the uh, anti-tubercular treatment and uh, take it up for maybe perhaps a laparoscopy, hysteroscopy to establish that things are fine structurally and microbiologically. Uh, Another question is that uh, can a patient try for pregnancy in the same cycle of HSG? Yes. Uh, as there is radiation exposure. Yes. Yes, you can. You can do that. All the radiation exposure is in the active uh, phase for those two to three minutes. And it has not been shown to affect the follicles that are forming or the oocytes that are being released. And one can try. So a lot of the whole inference about how women were conceiving post HSG in the same month comes from, uh, you know, data where women have conceived, have given, uh, gone on to give live births as well. Ruma, can I just intervene here? Yes, ma'am. So that was a wonderful expose and really impressive. I just wanted to add one thing that sometimes, you know, we have polyps also. So that also the students should know how to differentiate a synechia versus a polyp versus an air bubble. Because many a time you are referred an infertility patient with polyps. So yes. it's a very classic uh, appearance on uh, 
ultrasound and sometimes you can also if you have a, a sonography machine or you are have an access to the ultrasound department you can do a sonosalpingography that gives you beautiful uh, you can say an added or a complementary procedure for this yes. and second thing about the antibiotic i always prefer to start doxycycline maybe on the second or third day of menses and call her with a tablet buscopan having taken in the morning breakfast yes. it's just a practical point which i found very useful yes uh, just a practical tip thank yes. you thank Very you so much thank you ma'am thank you ma'am they want you to repeat at what phases the x-ray stills need to be taken and how much dye is to be injected okay so i'll share the screen again and this is presentation So, uh, so you have. I, I've already told you that uh, we do the HSG between days five to nine of menstrual cycle, and the reason why we do this is to avoid a pregnancy. Second is that the endometrium is thin at this point; it hasn't yet thickened to the periovulatory endometrium. When the endometrium is thin, uh, the inadvertent blockage of the cornua by thick uh, endometrium is unlikely to happen. And uh, so th that is the phase, day five to day nine. Second is that when you are doing the HSG, uh, you are, I can go back to this slide where... Uh, you have asked the patient to void, you've explained her the procedure, you have taken the consent, your trolley is ready with all the instruments that were initially outlined. You have laid the lady in the dorsal position, lithotomy is incorrect, I should use the word dorsal, and uh, draped her and prepped her. An appropriate size cannula has been chosen, which has then been filled with dye using the 20 ml syringe. Once you have done this, air bubbles have been removed and now you expose the cervix using sim speculum. Local anesthesia is given with xylocaine. It could be a spray or it could be infiltration. After you have administered this, give her one to two minutes for the anesthetic to act. Now you hold the cervix with valsalum and screw in the dye-filled cannula into the cervix. Ensure that an effective seal has been reached. How do you ensure that? That a backward tug will not dislodge your speculum. And uh, now you straighten and reposition because she was at the edge of the table. Now you straighten and reposition the patient under the machine. You push in 1 to 2 ml to delineate the cavity. Look at the screen whether the cavity has been delineated. Once it has, ask the radiologist to take a spot film. Who, If they are well versed in it, they would already be at it without you uh, asking them to. Uh, once the cavity has been, the next 1 to 2 ml that you push in slowly will pass through the tubes. You take a spot film at that point. And third is you continue to push slowly till bilateral spill is seen. You may need 5 to 10 ml of the dye to do so. Now you remove the instruments. And two to three minutes later, you may or may not choose to take a delayed film. A delayed film may be needed and it's very rarely needed though. If you feel that the spill that happened was a local kind of spill, that was it was just around the end of the tubes and, and it did not spill into the uh, POD, uh, which is your uh, uh, pouch. So uh, this is the whole uh, process. It's important to push the dye slowly and not do it suddenly. Sudden push is sudden distension of the uterus, pain, and by pain, there is this muscular contraction and it causes corneal block, right? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Um, there is this one last question from somebody uh, stating what is the picture of the cavity in the AVM of the uterus on HSC? Okay. So, uh, now that would be a space-occupying lesion, I would think, an irregular one. 
uh, it is best identified on an ultrasound because that remains our first line investigation for any woman who comes to us with bleeding. HSG would not be a first line investigation. But let's say, uh, I mean, uh, th there is no reason to have a non-bleeding uh, AVN. But if there is some such thing that and they occupy some space occupying, irregular space occupying structure, maybe you could pre-look at the ultrasound films, get in experts to comment on what this is. Okay. Thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you to Dr. Ruma ma'am for this comprehensive lecture on HSG. Now uh, I would uh, like uh, to invite Dr. Ashmita to kindly introduce our speaker for the next session. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce Dr. Kanika Jain. She's senior consultant, gynae endoscopic and uh, robotic surgeon, minimal invasive gynecological unit at Sir Gangaram Hospital. And she would be taking a session on table viva specimens. Ma'am, please. Dr. Kanika, ma'am, are you there? Hello. Kanika, ma'am? No, 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 ma'am. Mm. She's not in I Zoom. I think she's not. She's not on Zoom. Let me just try and connect with her. Just give me a minute, please. I will just arrange a call to her. Mm. 